another edition of America's Day at the Races. We're out at Aqueduct for a beautiful day at Aqueduct. A lot of action at Oaklawn Park as well today. We're back on the turf. In fact, three turf races today. Turf course is listed as firm. We have a turf sprint in race number five. Happy to be joined by my friend Paul Verderosa. We've been doing a lot of work together this week. And you haven't gotten tired of me yet. That's well, impressive. Well, wait a minute. So far, we're not sure. Uh, that's You're true. assuming I haven't got. You haven't gotten tired of me, I'm assuming. Uh, no, listen. Anyway. Wait, listen, you never know. Listen, when you assume, you know what happens, right? I see Sunday is all black day. It's a special, yeah. special day. I'm, I'm, in, I'm in mourning. In I'm in mourning because we're not going to work together <laughs> until Thursday after today. So Understandable. That's I, can, yeah. I can understand that. That's pretty easy for me to see. <laughs> anyway, it's really great to be back on the turf. We had a terrific weekend so far of racing. A lot to unpack from yesterday's racing at Oaklawn Park as well. But we're on the turf for the Plenty of Grace today. Feels like we have a lot of races named for horses from the Plenty of Grace family. And unfortunately, we've scratched down to four horses. Silver Skillet's going to opt for an allowance race on Thursday's card. But uh, Marvelous Maud feels like the top horse to beat in this race. And she is going to be favored. I think the question with her, Paul, the New York bred is, and we saw New York bred win the stake yesterday as well, is she going to be compromised by the lack of pace? Will that come into play in this race? You know, it's a hard thing to tell because we're down to four horses in here. Really, doesn't the pace kind of get muddled anyway in four-horse fields? You end up sprinting home a lot of times when the field's smaller and there's not much pace that's on to begin with. Honestly, I mean, there was nothing wrong with this effort at all. Got up at the end to, to just get the job done. And, I mean, you got to say, by far, she's the most consistent horse in the field. So. She consistently runs good numbers. She has not run since May 29th. Now, Chad Brown has terrific numbers. Coming off of layoffs of over 250 days in turf routes, particularly at Naira. On the other hand, she didn't get laid up in the middle of last year with the bulk of the big turf races to come because she was working the party circuit. Obviously, there was some sort of issue, but Chad Brown does not bring them back unless they're ready to run. No, and he's gotten off to a good start so far yesterday. He's looking to keep it rolling today with this mare. With, with, with perhaps similar silks as Michael Dubb, part owner of the winner of the stake yesterday as well. Now, Spirit and Glory, she feels like one of these horses that's not the most reliable horse for trainer Rob Falcone, but the good Spirit and Glory that we saw two, two races ago is good enough to be contentious. Yeah, perfect trip or not in this race, she did run well. I know last time she was bad, but she gets a little keen too, and she gets a little headstrong too in some of her races. I think Jose Lascano is a good fit. We've seen it with Jose that he's gotten on some horses that have had some quirks, and he's done a good job just letting them be and letting them decide where they want to go. If she runs back to this race, she's going to be tough, and she will be closer than Marvelous Maud, I would think. Well, that's the thing. She is a little bit more forward. I didn't think she got keen last time. I think she just stunk the joint up. And I have some questions as to how good that race, the Albert Stahl Memorial, really was. But I do agree she has more forward speed, and there isn't a lot left to go on. I'm kind of against the other Chad Brown midnight mile down the rail. But we'll see what happens to Plenty of Grace. That's our seventh race being run a little bit later today. But, of course, a lot going on at Oaklawn today, but also a lot going on with the PDJF. Today is the day of the PDJF telethon, and all around the country there will be a lot of outlets working with that PDJF. You can see the phone number there, 1-844-884-PDJF. And that's the Permanently Disabled Jockeys Fund. For much more on that, as well as a lot of stuff going on at Oaklawn Park, let's head down to Lafitte and Rajiv in Hot Springs. As picturesque as it looks in New York, uh, equally as gorgeous an afternoon here in Hot Springs, guys. And we have a, a nine race program about to get underway, about 32 minutes out until the opener uh, on the tail end of the Oakland Handicap, which we'll revisit. But as Andy mentioned, uh, Raj, the, the permanently disabled jockeys fund and the telethon today uh, raising awareness and a fundraiser for our fallen riders. Can you lend perspective to just how significant of an event th this is? Well, it's a great cause, significant event, because these jockeys that are, were injured riding horses, some of your favorites that you've actually known, and um, it, it's something that they rely on um, to, to get through. And uh, it's a fun and creative way to interact with these jockeys and support a great cause. And for the, the, to reach out, you see the number there, 1-844-844-884-7353 to donate in that first hour uh, from 12 o'clock, just getting started moments ago. Raj, Steve Cawthon, Donna Barton Brothers, Junior Alvarado, Gary Berzer, Mike Manganello, manning the phones. 
Yeah, some great names there, some all-time greats, um, jockeys like Steve Cotton and some current jockeys, Junior Alvarado winning this year's um, Saudi Cup, the world's richest race. So it was really some good interaction for the fans and to be able to interact with these guys and, and support the cause. From 12 to 6 Eastern, anything you can donate would be greatly appreciated. Uh, as for the racing and some of the highlights over the course of the weekend in the Oaklawn Handicap, the most prestigious race for older horses every season at Oaklawn Park with a $1.25 million purse. It was the America's Best Racing's Race of the Week. Watching to see what would happen from the start and towards the outside, the eventual post-time favorite, Skippy Long Stocking, breaks sharp. Shows that tactical speed, Raj, and Jose Ortiz has him in a perfect spot from that outside draw going into the clubhouse turn. Yeah, I mean, it, you couldn't script it any better than this. It was exactly the game plan that they were hoping for, to have Skippy close to the pace without rushing him and being in a striking position to, to inherit the lead coming off the turn. And once he did, it, it was never in doubt from here. He just seemed to be um, just overpowering his rivals. Uh, Highland Falls was a horse that we were looking forward to to see him step up to this competition after you know only his fifth start and he ran a very credible second uh, but he wasn't really putting a dent into Skippy there. And the consistency watching him reel off back to back efforts of his very best for Skippy Longstocking. Yeah because he put in a scare in the Pegasus a race that he was a complete no-show and it's great to see this road warrior uh, of a horse just bounce back to uh, this this is quite possibly his best performance yet and the winner's share of a 1.25 million dollar purse now racing's newest multi-millionaire Skippy Longstocking as we welcome Paula Duca to the broadcast Paul your uh, lasting impression you've had a day to kind of digest things following yesterday's Oakland handicap and, and what's going to stick with you most following uh, Skippy Longstocking's performance in yesterday's Oakland handicap I think he's actually going to be a major player in the older division going forward. I think people are going to look at that race and go, okay, it was in maybe an average field. But I just think I like the way he handled the field. If you go back and look at his, you know, resume, you know, he won the Charlestown Classic to basically close out in August. He came back in November, and he was third in the Breeders' Cup dirt mile behind Coney's Wish and National Treasure. That's aged pretty darn well, Lafitte. And then you go to the, you know, the Pegasus. He was pulled and vanned off, okay? Then he comes back, and he won the Challenger at Tampa. It didn't look like he was coming home much. He only got a 90 pace figure or a 90 buyer. But that was kind of his start, if you look at it, of his four- or five-year-old campaign. I mean, he just didn't have any racing since the Breeders' Cup. And... Yesterday, it looked like it was the fittest he'd been in a while. I agree with Rajiv. And you know what? The thing that's made him, uh, I think, maybe in the upper echelon now is that he can place himself wherever he wants. And again, like I said yesterday, I think Jose Ortiz just fits him so well. He could just use his natural speed. And Jose's got those soft hands, and he could finish. And he produced them right at the right time. And I think he's a horse that, obviously, along with Highland Falls, Rajiv, you're completely right, a horse that's lightly raced. I think both of them kind of showed up. And I'll tell you what, Skippy's going to be a force going forward. Those two separating from the pack, Raj, and we're not saying that Skippy Longstocking is white a barrio. We're not saying he's Saudi crown or Senor Buscador, but closing the gap where you can start putting him in that conversation is among the very best older horses in the country. Yeah, and he's closing the gap. He has an upward trend, an upward trajectory. And White Abario, who is considered the leader of the division, he's coming off his worst race yet. Yep. So if, if he's trending upwards and White Abario is taking a step back, that, that gap keeps narrowing. He just, Skippy gives me, like, anxiety just watching Maggie hang out with him on the backside. Like, we should never do that again. Yeah, he, I think he likes Maggie's perfume. I told her that because he, he was definitely um, playing with her, taking some bites at her. Every uh, great athlete has a uh, mean streak, and Skippy Longstocking, no different. The uh, 78th winner of the Great Two, Oaklawn Handicap. We'll continue to revisit some of the highlights from yesterday's program and look ahead to our racing. 
coverage brought to you by Claiborne Farm. 100 years doing the usual unusually well. Aqueduct's opener just around the corner. Those eight races, fast and firm. Turf racing in New York. Plenty of grace race seven. Here at Oakland, those nine races. The cross-country pick five gets started in the six. Allowance co-feature race number eight. Offer still stands. Sign up, get involved, Naira Betts, and when you do so, use that promo code DERBY25, 13 days till the 150th Kentucky Derby. Bet any track, anywhere, anytime, sign up at NairaBets.com to earn your $25 bet and $200 deposit match. I was going to share the text Andy Serling just sent me, but I've decided against. Instead, we'll go to break. Horses in the paddock. I promise you, Andy is panicked right now. Heart just stopped. Just getting started <laughs> on America's Day at the Races on Fox Sharon. Sports 2 Game Day. Jock Game Day. Aqueduct is the only racetrack within the confines of the five boroughs of New York City and faced intense competition from several other tracks located in the vicinity. True to its nature, the racetrack not only survived, but thrived. Aqueduct underwent an extensive three-year overhaul and reopened on September 15, 1959, to much fanfare, as it was one of the most modern facilities of its kind. In 1960, Aqueduct presented its first Wood Memorial. The race is New York's premier prep race for the Triple Crown and remains one of the track's signature events, along with a Cigar Mile Handicap and Remsen Stakes. Aqueduct was the first and only track to have a triple dead heat win in a stakes race when Brownie, Bousset, and Wait a Bit hit the wire in tandem. In 1965, it was the site of the largest crowd ever to witness a thoroughbred race at that time in the Empire State when more than 73,000 packed the stands to see Gun Bow in the Metropolitan Mile. The legendary Cigar began his famous 16 race win streak at Aqueduct. He scored impressively in the 1994 Naira Mile as part of that win streak. The race was named in Cigar's honor after he retired in 1997. The last racetrack Secretariat placed his hooves upon was Aqueduct. He was retired there before commencing his stud career at Claiborne Farm. Aqueduct was the second track to host the Breeders' Cup in 1985 and was one of the first sporting venues where Pope John Paul II held mass in 1995. Ah, oh, we love the Big A. It's our home and we're going to be here for 
quite a while as Belmont is being rebuilt, but it's a terrific track, a true city racetrack right on a subway line, and also the last track that Seattle Slough ever raced, making his career bow in the Stuyvesant as they sort of parade him for the fans winning that race by 10 lengths. That's super cool. Seems like it was yesterday, and it was 45 years ago, actually. But we love Aqueduct. Yeah, first track I ever came to. Really? And grew up two blocks from here. Really? Two, three blocks from here. Yeah, you could actually see my block from here if you turn around and, and look over your shoulder. Yeah, so it's cool. First track. Came here, I think, first time in 1995. Yeah, my first trip here was the Thanksgiving Saturday in 1974 with my wow. grandmother, actually. And uh, the Big A was quite crowded back then. My yeah. grandmother and I used to take the old Aqueduct Special out quite often on wow. the A-Train track. That's cool. Uh, a great, great race track. We, we love Aqueduct. And uh, it's our track. We're going we're gonna to cry when we have to leave, but at some point you have to consolidate and run things in the new Belmont Park, and it won't be that hard to leave when we're going to a place like the new Belmont. Post parade for race number one, reduced to four horse with scratches. These are maiden claimers, $20,000. The one, Mangia, goes out for Randy Persaud. This really hasn't panned out since those first two starts. If we could ever run back to that race, we'd be a bit competitive here. Omar uh, Hernandez Moreno has the mount. Lane Luzzi on firing fast, a firster for Rick Dutrow. Some sprinting on the dam side. And, I mean, doesn't have to be that big of a horse or that great to win in this field today. The number three is scratched. The four, Nace Slayer, goes out. Louis Rivera. Comes out of two slow-figured races. Did show some speed, though, in that first race. Gary Contessa trains that one. Had quiescent, the heavy favorite, Alicio Ruiz, riding for Bobby Roboto. Drops, has speed, lowest level that this horse has ever been at, and has run the faster races out of what's left in here. Uh, listen, unless the firster can run, Kieschen's going to be a pretty likely winner, though I know that Acacia Clement has some other ideas as we head down to her for the first time today in the paddock. And Andy, I completely agree. I do think that Kiesent is far the one to beat, given the races that she's run, given the fact that she's never run this low before, despite having already been exposed a couple of times against Maiden Claiming Company. And the thing with her is we just know what she is. Now, she's incredibly fit coming in here. She's by far the most seasoned in the field. She's never been one to carry a lot of condition. Um, she's fine overall. If anything, I wish she looked a little bit better in her coat, but uh, she had a big warm up under Alicia Ruiz. She has that early speed. She's dangerous if she just is a little bit better than the company that she finds in here today. I thought the one Manja could potentially um, be one to step a little bit forward today and at maybe a bit of a better price. She's four to one right now. I thought that she showed a bit more life last time out and uh, closed coming up to finish fourth that day when off a little bit slow and hopefully with the or, or, Omar Hernandez Moreno in the saddle again. He can get her into the race a little bit more. She's one that does look better than I've seen her in the past. Good coat, good weight for her standards, and she moved fine out on the racetrack. Uh, again, just it's all about who can finish in this race. And so far, these two have not necessarily shown that they can, though both could potentially win in this spot. So that leaves us with the first time starter. I'm sticking with the picks that I made uh, on Talking Horses, but if I was just going off based off of physicality, I would pick the first time starter for Rick Dutro and Firing Fast. Sold for 15,000 at the UBS June two-year-old sale last year, and she doesn't start until now, and she does debut for 20, though I guess when you purchased her for 15, it does makes sense. Uh, the dam, for what it's worth, all four for other foals were winners, nothing special, but you don't have to be special in this spot. Just based off of a horse, she doesn't look like a $20,000 claiming type. She's dappled out from head to toe. She could be a little bit more fit and defined, but I think she'll be quick. She's been really on her toes, very energetic. I think Lane Luzzi's going to try to send her in here, and I wonder what that will do for your heavy favorite, uh, but I liked what I saw from her. A touch green with the pony, but then she did settle down once they got moving. We'll see if she finds the right spot to debut, Andy. Thanks, Acacia. As we often talk about, Paul, it's not necessarily how good you are. It's how good you are relative to the field you're running against. Yeah, and in this field and what's left, this first-time starter, even if does have some ability in here, is a win contender for sure. It'll be interesting to see because looking at her on the track, Acacia does make a good point. I mean, very nice presence for this horse out there, kind of walking around, head bopping up and down, taking everything in nice and cool and calm out there. So it'll be interesting to see what happens, too, from a pace standpoint in this race because the five is probably the fastest horse in here. The horse right inside, Nayslayer, didn't get away really that well last time out and had to be ridden hard to try to make the lead and didn't. But first time out did sit on a fast quarter. So it'll be interesting to see 
what happens here. Yeah, it's kind of, I mean, you're just, listen, you're, you're riding the best horse. You're, you're two to five. You're just supposed to go with Kiesen, unless the first-time starter is quick and firsters seem to get left more often than not. You're just supposed to go. You don't fool around with two to five shots, especially when you're an apprentice rider. You don't try to get cute. You just hope that you're riding the best horse. And the last thing you ever want to do as a rider is get in the way of your horse. And when you're an apprentice, getting an opportunity to ride a two to five shot, it would be really stupid not to be in front unless you get left. Yeah, 100%. And you want to make sure that you take advantage of it and make your competition have to run to you. Don't keep them in the race with you. If you've got the best horse with the best speed, just go, string them out a little bit, be forward, and do your best to put yourself in that opportunity not, to take this race and win. Not only do you not want your horse to have to be brave to win, you don't want anybody else to get any sort of unnecessary confidence. I understand what Acacia is saying with the Wano horse. It could be a little forward in here. We'll see what happens. And I, it's really also going to come down to the two firing fast. And at the end of the day, if firing fast were live for Rick Dutrow, you'd probably think the horse in a four-horse field would be shorter than five to two. I would think so because Rick has sent out some first-time starter winners that, that have taken money in here too. So, But we still haven't seen that horse that he broke its maiden on Cigar Mile Day. It looked so good that paid a big yes. price first time out. The horse had a minor issue coming out of it, but I... I'm forgetting his name, or his name, but he was very impressive with the bias. Yes, yes. Got like a 99 the, buyer. Yeah, right a huge number that yeah. day, as a matter of fact. First yeah. or second race winner. Could be another grade one winner in the future from the Cigar Mile card. We've certainly had a lot of those. They're heading into the gate. Acacia's pick Manja is going in. Fiery, firing fast. The first time starter heading in. Chris Griffin getting ready for a big day to close out the week here at Aqueduct. Let's get the call. Nayslayer. Quiescent. Last to load. Quiescent and Elisil Ruiz, two to five on the board. And in. All set. And they're up. Quiescent right to the front, and it's going to be the favorite on an easy lead. Quiescent quickly up by two, three widening lengths, and the two to five favorite is well clear. Three pursuers in behind as firing fast has moved to the three path, is moving closer now as Ruiz tries to slow things down up top, but here comes firing fast to apply pressure towards the outside. There in third is going to be Nayslayer and the trailer. Manja, less than four for longs to travel. Quiescent's got the lead. 23 seconds flat for that easy opening quarter. Firing fast is moving up towards the outside, is now within a head of the leader. Quiescent is only up by a head right now, is firing fast, is ready to challenge the big favorite. And now these two are head and head together, and firing fast has taken the lead. It's firing fast to the outside of Quiescent, who is now encouraged to keep up here with the new leader as they reach the top of the stretch. 46.59, the half-mile time, and firing fast starts to put away Quiescent. It's firing fast, who's now up by a length and a half. Firing fast, and Lane Luzzy opening up through the lane inside the final furlong. Quiescent is a clear second from the back. Nayslayer is trying to run on, but with the 16th left to go, firing fast will pull off. A mild upset on the two to five favorite. It's firing fast who wins the opener. Quias in second, then Nay Slayer and Manja in one minute, 11 and three. Anyone will confuse him with Dutro's maiden winner, whose name was El Capi on, on Cigar Mile Day, but he did break slowly, firing fast, as we said was a possibility before the race. It didn't really matter. Did it matter that uh, Ruiz kind of threw the ham put the hammer down when he opened up that easy lead and let him in the race? Probably not. I don't know. I just, I think Lane Leslie won this race when he went up after the five as they made their way down. They the won the race when he drew, when he actually drew his name on the entry. Yeah. <laughs> Looking at what was left in this field for sure. And this horse put in a nice run. It's considering, as we talked about earlier, the potential sometimes first time starters to break slow. He did, but he finished up okay in here and, and drew away from the five. It was still a maiden. And you can say that Kieshen's unlucky, ran to a first so they can run. I'm sorry, he's never going to find a better opportunity to win. Today was his day, and he or she, thank you very much, she was not even close to no. firing fast. No, and, and I just feel like with the break that that horse had, we should have just let the horse roll. <laughs> I think taking, slowing it down a little bit just uh, did not help this horse's best interest in here. But firing fast, got up there and got a nice three-path and two-path trip and 
Put them away. I mean, if you went too deep in the pick five, you got alive with obviously the much better one as Kiesen had every chance to get it done, was just second best. But firing fast, Lane Luzzi riding for Rick Dutrow gets the job done after breaking a little bit slowly, but gets it done quite easily to start out the card today at Aqueduct. Seven more to go here, nine more to come at Oakland Park as well. We'll head down there when we get back on America's Day of the Race. Standing at Claiborne Farm. Experience the adrenaline pumping, suspense filled action of the Sport of Kings no matter where you are with Naira Vets. It's fast, easy, and secure. Download the app today and start winning with our lucrative weekly promotions, thrilling handicapping contests, and a one of a kind VIP rewards program. Don't just watch horse racing, be a part of the action with Naira Vets. second. Nashville dropping out of it and then collusion illusion. What a spectacular return for Charlatan who will romp in the run happy Malibu stakes by four and a half emphatic lengths. Charlatan ultra impressive. It's a new day for a new king. There's a big, bold, beautiful world waiting to be explored by you and your friends, of course. But not just any friends, the best of friends. The kind of friends who let you do you. Because in this world, it's positive vibes only. And when you get in the zone here, you stay a while. These aren't just good times, they're the best of times. And your time is now. So come explore. Resorts World. As we come back to America's Day at the Races, I want to once again remind people today is the day of the PDJF Telethon. That's the Permanently Disabled Jockeys Telethon. It's Jockey Fund, excuse me. It's to raise money and raise awareness as well for the Permanently Disabled Jockeys. You can call, talk to people. A lot of people that you're familiar with will be manning the phones all throughout the day. You can contribute 1-844-884-PDJF or pdjf.org forward slash donate. We've already raised over, or they've already raised, I should say, over $36,000. Race number one, heading into the, heading into the gate is, uh, I'm sorry, into the winner's circle is the number two firing fast, getting it done for Rick Dutrow, just under $8, just under three to one. Lane Leslie gets the job done. The favorite could do no better than second. Race number two, now race number two is actually a very competitive race. It's got six horses, but four of them. The two, Quiet Wisdom, the three, Landoro, the four, Brick Ambush, and the five, Boss 302, as Rick Dutrow look for a training double. All of these are major contenders, and you can see they're going to be very similar prices. I thought this was a pretty contentious pace race, Paul. Yeah, I thought it was wide open between the four that you mentioned in here. It'll be interesting to see what happens in here with a horse like Quiet Wisdom, where you don't really know sometimes where that race came from last time, finally. Ran a big race with that effort. But a horse like Landoro is a horse that I'm really interested in in here. I think there's a lot going on. All four of them look pretty dangerous. Not quite as dangerous, though, as Lafitte and Raj. They're down at Oaklawn Park getting ready to review some of the races from yesterday's card. Dangerous, huh? We may have seen, I don't know, a colt that could be dangerous in the Preakness Stakes with all eyes on the 150th Kentucky Derby in less than two weeks. A, a place in the Preakness starting gate was earned yesterday in the Bathhouse Row Stakes, the uh, one of three stakes races yesterday afternoon for Steve Asmussen. Most would think, you know, bet on the race if you had informed patriot if you had imperial gun one or the other you're going to sweat this thing out as we said not having to sweat anything out as he runs one two and breeders cut dirt mile winner spun to runs full brother imperial informed patriot 
stamping his ticket for the Preakness Stakes for that win. Yeah, and in the post-race interview with Maggie yesterday, his jockey, Ricardo Santana, said an important thing. He said, when, when he inherited the lead at the top of the stretch, he felt like he started getting idle and waiting on his competition. And that makes me think that there's still room for improvement with this horse. And it also makes me understand that Ricardo is going to be a little more careful about when he makes his move with this horse going forward. So what does that mean, careful? What adjustment will he make in the future to prevent that from becoming an issue? The best adjustment you can make with a horse like this is keeping a target in front of you as far as long as you can. Being patient and waiting so that the horse is engaged with a rival. He's a, he's a herd animal kind of mentality where he likes to wait on his competitions to push him forward. So you want to wait as long as you can to keep him with the pack before trying to burst away from them. Thumbs up, Ricardo Santana. Steve Asmussen said he has to speak with the Robesons, uh, the, the owners, recognizable silks. Of course, they campaign the great Jackie's Warrior, uh, discuss plans in the future, still undetermined about the Preakness for now, just enjoying that win and an improving Colt in informed pa Patriot. Those were the boys. You also had the three-year-old fillies in the Valley of the Vapors and a filly who had never raced on dirt. Extreme outside post here, winnable all over the leader, turning for home and an impressive score here in the Valley of the Vapors. Yeah, and this late developing three-year-old filly just made her debut earlier this year and on synthetic. That was a victory. Came back on synthetic at Turfway, finished second. This was her third lifetime start, her first dirt try, and she was impressive. She carved out a good trip from the outside post, but she put herself in position um, to, to be in a striking range and just really made a good transition to the dirt for the first time. A filly that has the pedigree by Justify out of a curling mm -hmm. mare to handle the dirt, and she sure did. And beat a really good filly, Neon Beach, in the process. And Neon Beach is a really good filly who, who had home court advantage, had more season and more races over the distance, over the surface, and had even a better post on the inside. So the margin of victory was narrow, but it was actually a very impressive. Trained by Kenny McPeak, and this has nothing to do with the Valley of the Vapors, as we revisit the winners of the three stakes races yesterday, and congratulations to all the connections with Skippy. Skippy Longstocking in the Oaklawn Handicap, Informed Patriot, Bathhouse Row, an invitation to the Preakness, and Winnable in that Valley of the Vapors. Trained by Kenny McPeak. I don't know if you saw this, Raj. Torpedo Anna, fantasy winner, bound for the Kentucky Oak. She breezed this morning. Kenny McPeak's quote, he says, they... Uh, that better bring a bear. Because he has a grizzly. a grizzly bear. <laughs> and, and I agree with him. She is a grizzly. We saw her run here in the fantasy, and she was nothing short of impressive. She overcame so much adversity. She was nervous prior to the race, washing out. She, w she was coming off a layoff. She had a tough pose, which was against the track bias. It was, she had all a recipe to lose, Wouldn't and load. she dominated. Wouldn't load. Wouldn't load. Losing I mean, it pre-race, as you everything. mentioned, hadn't, ra hadn't raced since November. And he, I, I'm not insinuating he's going to do this because you can't any longer. It's not a graded stakes earnings thing. It's a points thing. But he said, I wouldn't hesitate for a moment to run her against the boys. Yeah, I mean, and she, she would have a good shot against the boys, in my humble opinion. But um, I think she is definitely the and horse Kenny's to beat. A, in he the is a confident guy, right? He'll, he'll, let, he'll, he'll, he'll let you know. But she was... Awesome in the fantasy. Can't wait to see what she does in the Kentucky Oaks. Meantime, the live racing here at Oaklawn. Post parade wide open. $20,000 maiden claimer. You saw Mischievous Max. You see Interrupter. And then South Fork, who just needs to break, man. Yeah, he's been breaking slow, and that has left him way behind the eight ball. 14 to 1. Mansura. Another late closer here, cutting back from a mile and a 16 to the sprint six furlongs. The first time starter, the tepid favorite, Champagne Mike and Christian Torres coming off a big afternoon. Yeah, in a race that doesn't lack conviction from the horses I run before, yeah, this first time starter might have found the right spot. Can't conquer me with a K, Miracle Mac, a Carson McCord own first time starter. Yeah, another first time starter who's is find a good spot to make his debut. It's like Betty Davis eyes, Stormcat eyes, contender at 9-2. to two. Uh, This time, Blue, Keith Asmussen takes over. Didn't show much last time, but takes a slight drop in class, hoping for a better start. A Rev 2, first-time starter by Outwork. Yeah, the third 
first time starter in this race by outwork more of a turf kind of pedigree but it's a good spot like we said for a first time starter different flame and randy morse saddled a pair of winners yesterday big afternoon then time for another the fourth of four fresh faces oh, first time starters yeah this first time starter here by collected out of a midnight loop mirror shows a 36 bullet in his last race work nice easy handicapping endeavor to kick off the program raj yeah, it's nice, nice race here to start <laughs> out the day. man. <laughs> what do you like? I took a f shot with the f number five, Champagne Mike, this first time starter. I just felt like the horses I've run before just hasn't shown much. And it does. It wouldn't take much if a first time starter could run a little bit. Kind of like what we saw in the first race at Aqueduct, where a first time starter won in a race where the, the, the horses that have made, run before didn't show too much. And Mansura, while this is just his fifth career, started 15 to one. It's, it's the Sunshine Boys, Raj. It's John Court in the saddle, still riding at the age of 63. And for Jinx Fires, we only have a couple weeks left at the meet and a, a streak on the line. He has yet to saddle a winner. He has saddled at least one winner at Oaklawn 47 consecutive years. 47 years. I mean, and that is consistency. That is something cool. And I, I am rooting for, for this to happen. 48 years. I mean, this man is a legend around here. Um, but this horse doesn't look impossible. He had, he had a fourth place finish last time going a mile and a 16 with a tough wide trip from the outside post against Arkansas Breads running against open company today but he does cut back in distance and he's never had a fair shot sprinting on the dirt so if if sprinting on the dirt is as optimal which we don't know as yet he he would have a shot here right, we've seen uh, it was an exciting way to kick off the friday program we saw nick juarez register his 1000th north american victory it'd be an exciting way to kick off the sunday program here if jinx fires could saddle the winner pull off somewhat of an upset here with uh, mansura Big number 17 to one. Uh, your thoughts on mischievous Max drawn towards the inside here in first half of the claim, Eusebio Rufino. Yeah, and it's also a first time gelding. Mm -hmm. um, you, you look for little angles. The, the, my, minor changes could make a big difference in a race like this where it, nothing stands out on paper. Um, he showed, yeah, he showed, a, showed more speed uh, last time and he's gonna need it from that post. He, yeah, he showed a lot of speed last time, which I expect that would make him the early leader here Alberto Puskas is jockey he's gonna have to gun this horse away from there because you don't want to have him stuck behind horses he's never passed a horse in his life so his best shot is is hustling him out of there and trying to go gate to wire and Andy Serling checking in likes the gelding cutting back in trip storm cat eyes number eight with uh, Luis Fuentes as a contender here as well see how it all unfolds the first of nine on a picture perfect afternoon in Hot Springs Arkansas Matt Dunneman on the mic race one Oak Lawn live on Fox Sports 2. Time for another to the outside. Time for another backed away. The first of nine races today kicks off the early pick five, a picture perfect weather day here at Oaklawn Park. And uh, as I say that, we have one horse acting up pretty badly in the starting gate. That's the seven Miracle Mac, Carlos Barboza off. couple of them stirred up in the gate there a couple of riders have hopped off but there are plenty others still in the saddles at least at this point hard to see from this vantage point exactly what's going on we're going to stand by and we're going to have a delay all right so this is how we started things yesterday with a delay with horses acting up in the starting gate in the first race yesterday we had a late defection uh raj what did you see well this first time starter number seven miracle mac he f acted up in the gate and he flipped over backwards which is something that now he's a late scratch um miracle seeming, mac is out miracle mac is out number seven and seemingly his his jockey carlos barbosa is okay he's off up and standing um but yeah miracle mac is has been 
scratched. And what happens when a horse in the middle of the gate gets scratched like that, they will, they will have to re restructure how they, they, they put the horses back in because they won't leave a gap open in the middle. So they, they would either fan the horses out one, or but, they, but they'll put them all together. Tight quarters in those individual stalls. Take us through those moments and what's going through your mind when that keg of dynamite underneath you that you're sitting on starts to go off. It's one of the scariest aspects of being a jockey um, and the most dangerous because a, the horse is, you know, heavy animal and being trapped between that and metal is one of the toughest things that can happen. Uh, if a horse thrashes a little bit or bumps you into the gate, into the metal, you can break bones. You can also get trapped inside or underneath a horse that flips over like that. So while you're ready to break out of the gate, prepared as a jockey to break, you also got to be subconsciously ready for a horse that acts up to hit the eject button at mm -hmm. some point. And for the assistant starters, the gentlemen in the red shirts who you see, again, a slight delay, a delay before this first race, riders getting off their mounts, a number seven, is out the first time starter miracle mac number seven a late scratch um the assistant starters what is their primary focus when that starts to happen their their primary focus is getting the horse under control trying to manage them which which is you know the horse is probably about five times the weight of the the handler and trying to keep the horse controlled but also trying to assist the jockey in any way possible Sometimes, and we saw it yesterday, when the, the horse flipped over and Ramsey, Ramsey Zimmerman, the jockey's leg got stuck between the horse <laughs> and the gate, and the assistant starter then let, had to let go of the horse's head and pull Ramsey by the waist up and out of the gate. Because out he, of harm's way. Out of harm's they, way. It's trite. You've heard it a million times, but yes, they are the unsung heroes of the sport the assistant starters so a delay before this first race at oaklawn acacias in the paddock at aqueduct where where hopefully the uh, runners for the second race are, are minding their manners acacia Knock on wood, Lafitte, so far so good here. And we'll talk about the two horses taking most of the money at the moment, starting off with Quiet Wisdom, who had a daylight score last time out to break his maiden. Now, the big question is, where did that race come from? And can he do it again? It was by far the most impressive race that he's ever run, pulling away to win by 10 and three quarter lengths. Now, he did drift a little bit in the stretch when he was doing that. I obviously have not seen him in this last couple of starts, but when I last saw him in the fall, he wore a ring bit. Now I see him and he's wearing a Houghton bit or a cage bit, particularly a strong bit for horses that have the tendency to drift. So connections are obviously aware of his quirks. And I just always find these types of horses a little bit difficult to trust. He has put on weight and muscle mass since I last saw him. And obviously if he can repeat that effort, he is tremendously dangerous in this spot. I just do question what he will do facing winners for the first time. And hopefully Hopefully he can keep a straight course. Now the number four brick ambush is stretching back out in distance. And I think everybody's kind of wondering what is his best distance. He is very tall and leggy, um, especially like I said, since I have uh, first first saw him towards the beginning of his career, I wrote probably wants more distance. And yet he has run well sprinting too. Arguably should have won that race last time out, but I don't mind the stretch out. I think Doc Sullivan who beat him two starts back is a nice horse. He's great in his coat today. I'll watch how he warms up Lafitte, but intrigued by Brick Ambush stretching back out in this spot. All right, uh, Keisha, we'll get right back to you and Andy and Paul before the second race at Aqueduct. We're going to try this again. Raj, does it complicate matters? Do the horses know? And most of these don't have a lot of experience. Is there a sense that things have been kind of taken out of out of rhythm, though, when they've already been starting in the gate and then they have to get back out of the gate, rider off, rider back on, and we start the whole process again. Yeah, it definitely changes things because um, when you're going for the initial first time to the gate, you have your horse prepared and queued up in the way you want him, and, and now you're telling him to, okay, relax, because there was an incident, let's calm back down, let's, let's wait again, and so, so it's hard to get, sometimes the horse gets into that mind frame of 
being relaxed now, and now you're gonna try to kill him up like a few seconds before going mm -hmm. into the gate. Turning the engine back on again. Yeah. The late scratch, Miracle Mac number seven. You went with, it's been a long time, I forgot. I went with the number five Champagne Mike, the top connections, top jockey and trainer connections for this first time starter. Favored, and there's another jockey off. Or was that the jockey who already scratched? Who is that? Yeah, white color, so that has to be Barbosa, who's already out. And Andy going with Stormcat Eyes. And we're set, I believe. Let's try it again. Take two, the opener from Oakland and Matt Dimmer. D D D D D D <laughs> Different flame goes in. One back, time for another. We're ready to go. We're off and running at Oaklawn Park. From the inside, Mischievous Max gets the first call, having a steady hard coming out of the chute was Mansora. Can't conquer me on the lead today with Mischievous Max. They stride together. Interrupter right between them. Those three across the track. This time, Blue in the fourth position. He's four deep on the course here. Stormcat Eyes joining him. South Fork is down on the rail. Champagne Mike is next. A different flame. The first eight are separated by just four lengths approaching the far turn run. A gap of four to time for another who is third last can't conquer me second to last Mansoura at the back as they round the far turn here mischievous max of the two path is a head lead on south fork on the inside tries to keep pace but begins to back out on the outside here comes a run from can't conquer me trying to get into the race now interrupters there between that pair as they come to the top of the lane it's been a mix and match rumble here on the front end as they turn for home and coming down the lane interrupter has a head lead on can't conquer me, but Champagne Mike dives forward on the inside and comes with a big burst to take the lead. Champagne Mike is opening up under a confident hand ride by Christian Torres, and Champagne Mike for the Carl Broberg barn will win in a stroll. Champagne Park by at least a half dozen. Can't Conquer Me was second, Interrupter third. This time, Blue gets fourth over Mansura. And look at them gallop out and separation on the rest champagne mike the wagering public on target two to one favorite raj on target and for the leading rider at oaklawn christian torres off and running after a big saturday here at oaklawn park clearly much the best champagne mike and a professional debut this horse was well prepared today uh, took dirt in his face sat between horses like a pro uh, Typically with first time starters, they can show tendencies of greenness or um, inexperience and be ducking and diving when that dirt hits them. This horse was well prepared and he ran like a horse that had a lot of seasoning. Crop uncocked, easy win. Let's see if the second race at Aqueduct is more competitive. Andy. Well, probably more competitive than what we just saw at Oakland, where the winner was a winner every step of the way. Horses are on the track. We missed the one, the two quiet wisdom, the favorite for Todd Pletcher and Kendrick. Yeah, I don't know where that last race came from. We'll see if this horse can replicate it against winners today. Three is Landoro, Matty Oliver riding for Christophe Clement. Very interested in this horse. Substantially improved last time, keeping up with a faster pace, and Gamely saw it through. The number four, Brick Ambush. Dylan Davis rides for Danny Gargan. So I just wonder where this horse is going to fit from a mile standpoint today, but can win in here. The number five, Boss 302, Rick Dutrow looking for a, a training double, Jose Gomez. Ran down Irish tenor who went too fast too soon and blew a big lead last time, stretches out to the mile today. And Manny Petty, a long shot, rounds out the field for Mary Alice Coffey, who's been having a good year. Been a, having a very good 2024 for the barn, and last time out did break its maiden against $25,000 state breads. This is a big step up today. The number two, Quiet Wisdom, was very impressive, breaking his maiden last time in his seventh attempt, winning by over 10 lengths and improving his buyer figure to a pretty hard to believe 83, a legitimate number. If he runs back to it, he's going to be a very likely winner here. It's just funny when you look at this horse, and it took quite a while, a big culmination for this horse to finally get a big effort and a big job done like he did here. I know this group was bad that he faced, but I just wonder if... 
A, he can replicate that number today, and B, I mean, this is a tougher spot, first time, first winners. It is. He's a horse who has failed at short prices throughout his entire career when facing somewhat competitive fields. He met an uncompetitive one and exploded. There have been a few horses, one of, I think he's one of, one of four for Todd's, that sort of ran surprisingly good numbers that have not been able to replicate it. We'll see if he can do it in this race. Yeah, I, I don't know. I'm just a little bit gun shy taking this horse at a short price. The three Landoro is one I think you've expressed interest in that I actually picked in this race as well. Broke his maiden last time over Silver Satin, who came back to win yesterday. Yeah, I mean that race, that race was just totally flattered too. Shlomo in the same race too ran a winning race yesterday too as well in there too. Just got beat by Silver Satin, who was just better. And for me, for this horse, I don't even think the debut was that bad, too, because that field was good. He just kind of got shuffled back a little bit in there, and others got the jump on him. And substantially improved last effort, obviously. That that pace was quick and, and stood in range, and Gamely saw it through in there. And I don't mind the mile for this horse at all, getting back out to it. And Kristoff has okay numbers with maiden winners going next time out. Being? Four for ten and a 542 ROI. All right, we saw, we'll see what happens in here. Well, Acacia, do you have the skinny on the Clamont runner? <laughs> <laughs> I do not. Uh, he's been here in New York uh, with Devin Doherty, Christoph's assistant, who did a terrific job uh, with the New York string throughout the winter here. Uh, but Landoro, with Matty Olver staying aboard, did get a good trip, but was able to get in and settle nicely from a far outside post last time. And he is a big, imposing individual. I think he will love every bit of getting it back out to the mile. And he's a good doer as well. He carries a lot of muscle mass and conditioning and substance. And Maddie took him right away from the pony, gave him a good warm up, got into a good stride. And um, for just such a big, solid horse, you really want them to get their feet underneath of them. If he could build off of that last race, certainly a big player in this spot. The five boss 302 stretching out in distance for the first time. And that is the question is he is by street boss who typically you think of more sprinters, but there's curlin on the bottom side and you can definitely see the curlin influence in this horse. He is a big leggy individual that looks like a horse that wants more distance than the six furlongs at which he won at. And hats off to Jose Gomez who rode him pretty much the entire race and really rode him strong out of the gate last time out and he was just totally outfooted. So you would think with stretching out, he'd be able to get into the race a little bit better versus what he did in his debut. He's been very sharp throughout though. Very energetic in the paddock, uh, a little bit green getting onto the track. And even though it is his second start, I, I didn't love seeing that, but I do expect him to appreciate the stretch out. And we'll also see if he is just a closing sprinter, but uh, I think that he will actually find the mile a little bit more to his liking. Just wanted to follow up on the four brick ambush. A um, couple things that gave me a little cause for pause. I said I was going to watch how he warmed up. He's really swishing his tail a lot as he left the paddock and then linking up with the pony started jig jogging a little bit. So I saw him getting a bit agitated. Dylan Davis was able to get him to settle nicely, uh, but that was something that made me kind of just pause a little bit that I wanted to point out and hopefully he can keep things together mentally leading into this spot stretching back out. Andy. Thanks, Acacia. And, you know, talking about Brick Ambush, I, I have a little bit of trouble with the 74 buyer he got last time as being a predictive number. And a lot of time, wet track numbers are tough to get your hand a handle on. The winner was a Todd Pletcher horse that had run a 56 and 42 buyer in his previous two starts and then ran a 78. Mad Banker, I believe, came back the other day and has run twice since then and not come close to that figure. I, I just don't know if Brick Ambush is a horse that's really going on with it for Danny Gargan. It's hard to tell. I feel like, you know, even even his maiden win, it was a perfect trip in there. And, and since then, I just feel like he's never really progressed as much as his buyer figures say. I don't trust the 74 last time out like you. And in the race before that, okay, Doc Sullivan's a good horse, but... He blew him off the race. Yeah, I, I just, I don't feel like he ran very well in there. So it's, it's hard for me to figure out what to do with him. And at a short price, I, I just, I, he can win in here. But I just don't know what kind of trip he's going to get in here either. What about the five boss 302? I wonder if this horse is going to need a stronger ride like he got early on from Jose Gomez well, last time, as Acacia pointed out, getting out of the gate, going the well, mile. Well, he was today. aggressive yeah. with him early. So I wonder if, if the same tactics are going to be here in play. I also wonder... Well, he shouldn't need to be as aggressive because... 
in a longer race, the pace will be less fast, so he should more naturally fall into rhythm forward, right? You, I would think so. You would hope so. And I also just wonder, too, he beat a horse in Irish Tenor who has the habit of going too fast too soon and gets run down late. But the third-place so. finisher was his yes. entry mate came back to win, albeit running four buyer points worse. So Irish Tenor ran much worse, but the third finisher did run reasonably well in a subsequent start where he got the win, only four buyer points worse. I don't love Street Boss stretching out to a mire. I'm a huge fan of Street boss but i feel as though his horses might be a little bit better going shorter but to be honest i think you're sort of splitting hairs here um there there's a lot to like really in some ways about or something i should say to like about any of the two three four and five and look at them on the board they're all relatively similar prices yeah i'm going with the three in here i just think that this horse is sitting on another good effort we'll see what happens we'll get the call from chris griffin manny penny manny penny last to load And in. All set. And they're off. Manny Penny was awkward at the start. Ballyamore is trying to challenge for the early lead. It's Ballyamore towards the inside with quiet wisdom as hearts and as well, but Ballyamore is going to have the front. It's Ballyamore, and right there now comes the great quiet wisdom. Landoro is going to be three wide. Far outside is going to be Boss. 302 is now tracking from fourth as quiet wisdom will take the front end out in the center of the racetrack as they hook up with the back stretch. Moving closer is Manny Penny, very tightly bunched as Brick Ambush is in that early mix too. Only about two lengths would cover them all. Well out into the middle of the racetrack. That's Quiet Wisdom and Kendrick Carmouche, who's in front. 23.46 for that opening quarter mile. Has had to be encouraged since the start, but Quiet Wisdom now holds a length advantage on Landoro, who's right there in second. In between horses, Brick Ambush, who is sitting at the back end of the field, is progressing in between rivals there, now just having to steady just a touch, waiting for room. The big long shot is Ballyamore, is down at the rail, is now challenging for the second position, and they went 46 and 3 for the half mile time as Quiet Wisdom is still there. Now Brick Ambush is in the clear. Landoro makes a move towards the outside, and Landoro is now re rallying towards the outside four wide. Ballyamore is still in it at the rail. The two trailers boss, 302 and Manny Penny, they reach the top of the stretch. All this going on, but Quiet Wisdom is still there. Quiet Wisdom is now opening up the margin once again. Landoro is in full pursuit to the outside of Brick Ambush. Ballyamore is back to fourth. It is Quiet Wisdom, who's done all the heavy lifting up front, is still going. Landoro is going to try one final time here, but running out of time as inside the final 16th. Quiet Wisdom will get the victory. Quiet Wisdom gets the score. Landoro is in a photo with Brick Ambush for place. Then came another photo that was Boss 302 with Bally Amore in 1 minute 36.37 seconds. Well, Quiet Wisdom seems to be turning into a fairly nice runner here and a very heady ride by Kendrick Hormuzh, sensing that, as often is the case, nobody seemed to be want to be aggressive, particularly Jose Gomez, who was gifted the lead with a number five. He went to the front, set an honest pace, and drew off to win. Yeah, I mean, he had to be worked on to get to the top, especially I think Kendrick saw the horse to his inside go out for the lead and figured, well, I'm not going to get involved with this and just rode Quiet Wisdom to the top. And really from there, I mean... He ran a, a remarkably good race. I mean, you know, Landoro and Brick Ambush had a little bit of a shot at the top of the stretch, but in the end, Quiet Wisdom ran back to his last race. Quiet Wisdom was best in this field. Roy's reasonable efforts by the runner-ups, but Quiet Wisdom wins by about two to two and a half lengths, getting a job done in the second race, and we'll see if he looks to move on to some New York Bread Steak races. And of course, New York Bread Showcase Day will be the day after Belmont Stakes, June 9th at Saratoga, and all these horses looking to get there. Uh, get there, the Mike Lee at seven furlongs, and the way Quiet Wisdom has run his last two races, I have to think it's reasonable for the connections to be thinking about a race like that. Though perhaps the connections of, uh, of the impressive Silver Satin that broke his maiden yesterday with an 86 buyer, thinking about that as well. But Quiet Wisdom, a popular winner at 9-5. to five. The favorite got beaten in the first race, but the favorite gets it done in race number two. A lot more to come on America's Day at the races. We'll take a quick break. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to America's Day at the Races. As you see, Quiet Wisdom heading into the winner's circle, getting it done for Todd Pletcher's racing stable and Kendra Carmouche. Mike Rapoli, who's got the favorite, Fierceness, heading over to Kentucky. I think he actually got to Kentucky today. I think they have to of be there by the 27th. Is yeah. that what I read? The day they, they draw the race. Uh, he's, he's no Fierceness, but he is improving. And he did show his last race was not an illusion. Yeah, he backed it up today, and, and we've said it a hundred times over how, you know, being aggressive gets rewarded, and Kendrick saw nobody really wanted the front end. He rode this horse aggressively to take it, and Landoro, who looked like he was beat, had a little bit of a rally in the turn again, but still was second best was and second not going best. to get to the winner. You know, and I think this is a good example of what Richie talks about with horses getting their position going forward, right? I mean, this is a horse that he could easily have been sitting third or fourth early, and I don't think Kendrick was looking necessarily to be in front. It was more a situation where nobody else really wanted to be that aggressive, so Kendrick decided to seize the bull by the horns and give him some credit. Best horse, but the best ride as well. Race number three, one to five currently on Run Devil. Now, that's a partly a reflection because the second choice Vegas weekend was a scratch in this race. Run Devil drops down and does look like way the worst to be. Looks like way the horse to beat in here, but has lost quite a few races that she was supposed to win. So we'll see if she takes any pressure in here, too, because sometimes when she takes pressure, she just doesn't run as good. As we get closer and closer to the Derby and taking a look at those PPs, and I've been looking through them quite a bit and watched some replays, one horse that I think will be on a lot of people's tickets looking for a price horse, and the price are often underlays, is Just Steel, who keeps running well for trainer Wayne Lucas. Country Pick 5 combines the best racing from New York with top races from around the country in one bet. Find it in your track menu and play every race day. Races are posted weekly at naira.com slash cross country. General admission tickets are on sale now for the Belmont Stakes Racing Festival at Saratoga, June 6th through 9th. Admission is just $10 on Thursday as well as on Sunday for this historic event. Visit belmontstakes.com slash tickets today. It's Rock Your World in Command. Medina Spirit making no progress. And it's going to be Rock Your World to take them all the way in the Santa Anita Derby. He's undefeated and wins by four. Racetrack Television Network brings you every race from every track, on every screen, every day. With monthly packages starting as low as $5, RTN gives you great value and access to more live HD streaming and race replays than anyone. Visit RTN.TV today to sign up and watch on almost any device, including Roku and Amazon Fire. RTN has packages that start at $5 per month. Welcome back to America's Day at the Races. Gorgeous day here at Aqueduct. A little chilly out, but it's nice to be back. And of course, there are those beautiful turf courses. They'll be in play races six, uh, five, seven, and eight today. Looking forward to those races. First turf sprint of the year as well. Yeah, looking forward to it. Absolutely. That's race we number five. Talking about Just Steel a little bit before we went on break for Wayne Lucas. Now, one thing about Wayne. There's no dance taking place that Wayne doesn't want to be involved with, but Just Steel has held up very well, and he's run consistently well. I, I, I never thought he'd be a horse that wants more distance, but at this point, you have to think he's a horse that's going to be able to handle the distance. Whether or not he's good enough to be a fact in the Derby is another question, but he's a pretty cool horse, a horse we saw break his maiden at Saratoga last summer. Yeah, and this effort we're seeing here, I mean, he put in a giant effort behind Muth. He never stopped running, and Keith Asperson gave him a great ride in there, too. He just got beat by a better horse today. And other than a bad trip in the Rebel, I mean, honestly, he's run good races. He's got a 90-95 buyer. You like to see some of those numbers like that going into the Derby. 
he's a viable option at a big number, and it's not like he's the type of horse who's going to be launching from way back in the pack either. He'll be within range. And keep in mind, when he came back in the Rebel, it was just three weeks after the Southwest, a race that had been postponed a week because of the weather. So he was coming back on short rest, and, and he really is a horse. And listen, Wayne is tough on a horse. He runs him, and he keeps running him. But when he's had horses, you think of Will Take Charge, a horse that danced a lot of dance for him, but he got very good in Saratoga, ultimately becoming the three-year-old champion. Just Steele, to me, looks like a potentially viable long shot in this year's Kentucky Derby. We'll see what the team at Oakland thinks as we head back to Hot Springs. It's a great story. Uh, Wayne Lucas, the four-time Kentucky Derby winning trainer. Uh, it's not like he's won with a bunch of, of favorites. Raji, he's won with the Philly and winning colors, a, a former claimer and in, in charismatic. And just what a story that he's back in the Derby mix one more time. Wayne Lucas. But as you know, here in Hot Springs, the road to the Kentucky Derby, it's been a very productive one, going back to Smarty Jones, of course, an American pharaoh and eventual Triple Crown winner. So how productive will this year's preps be we'll find out in a couple of weeks and we start with mystic dan i don't know where i am with him raj because this is what he's capable of this big fire speed figure fast fast race impressive win in the southwest stakes albeit on a very good rail that particular afternoon and obviously on a wet track well, this version of Mystic Dan will definitely make a major impact on the Derby. I mean, this was such an impressive performance. However, following this race and going into the Arkansas Derby, he didn't duplicate it. On he, a fast track. He regressed a bit coming off this race. And some people might say he bounced or, or something, but for, for me to expect the top performance of Mystic Dan, we would want to see something to indicate that that will happen. I don't buy the bounce, because that's why Kenny McPeak opted to skip the Rebel, to avoid the bounce. So we have all that time off to avoid the reaction. I don't know that the Arkansas Derby set up for him, but it was a far cry from the performance we saw in the Southwest. Yeah, and, I, and I don't know going I forward from here until the Derby, the best indicator to give what version of Miss It Now will show up is going to be the workouts. And I watched his most recent workout, and? and it was not bad, but it wasn't extraordinary. He was, it seemed like he was just being nudged to maintain the, the, the competition. And that didn't look that impressive. And, and no longer sparring, no longer breezing with Torpedo Anna, who was his workmate prior. No, Torpedo Anna is a grizzly bear. <laughs> she, she would probably <laughs> trounce miss it Dan if he were if the works were matched together based on how she worked against her rival in the four different prep races four different winners uh, two of those will not be in the Kentucky Derby Muth who would be an you know, serious contender but ineligible trained by Bob Baffert and then Timberlake who after the rebel looked like a, a significant a real player in the Derby mix after the defeat in the Arkansas Derby Raj, there's Christian Torres and the Windstar White celebrating the Rebel win. Um, what's the story now with Timberlake if the Kentucky Derby is not it, it is not the plan? Well, he's a high-strung horse who has a tendency to be keen. And uh, what the connections are thinking is they don't want to fight with him. They want to just be able to let him run. And if you do that at the longer races, he's going to fade. So his best performance yet was the one-turn mile champagne where he won the grade one. And they're going to be focusing on these shorter distances. Probably his, his cap for his optimal performance is going to be at a one-turn mile. This isn't a, a, a critique on any other jockey. It's not a this jockey rode better than that jockey. This is just, as you know, some riders just fit horses a little bit better. The only time I've really seen Timberlake relax in one of the longer distance races specifically was with Christian Torres in that Rebel. It felt like that was the only time he was really in hand and not as eager, not expending as much energy as we saw along the backstretch here in the Arkansas Derby. Yeah, in that Rebel, Christian was adamant that he wanted to get this horse relaxed early, and he used his hands, his technique of just breaking and putting the horse, almost put him to sleep. And that made him turn off early and sprint home late. And I, I actually agree with you, Lafitte. I don't necessarily buy that this horse can't run a long distance. If they get him to relax like mm -hmm. Christian did, I think he would be effective. 
going two turns. Also appreciate the fact of not not having that that derby fever, recognizing, regrouping, and we look forward to seeing Timberlake in the future. Exciting, exciting three-year-old. All right, post parade race two, ten thousand dollar claimers uh, a mile running to the first wire. You saw Ricky Bobby not first, your last, and here's the entry. Two for one, you're getting seven to five with classic king and wartime hero. Yeah, both Asmussen horses um, seem like they have a legit shot in this race. Toma Todo draws the rail. This should be horse should be the speed, um, but he's been fading in his races lately. Pace impact, and then Colosi number four, the nine-year-old in lifetime start number sixty. Yeah, polar opposite of Toma Todo. This one is going to be coming from way off the pace. Chapel Barn and uh, Bathhouse Row winning jockey Ricardo Santana. Uh, another one with a lot of speed in here. He might be dueling Tamatoda early. Royal Act, Francisco Arietta, three wins yesterday. Yeah, this is going to be my pick here. Um, got a slow start last time. Sprinting, stretches out, and drops in class. Cowboy Cabin, number eight at 17 to one. Richard Aramia. Another horse that's really quick early. This is setting up to be a hot pace. Beautiful. Gray, almost white. There's D2. Oh, a horse that I'd love to take home and put in my backyard with this beautiful <laughs> white horse. Um, coming off a win last time at the distance. It's only a $10,000 clamor. You can make that happen. Yeah. I'll, Might be too late now. He won't Next be able time. to fit on the plane with me. But. <laughs> Vissy, Vissy legs. First or second and 17 of 46. Yeah, and his trainer, Sean Stewart, has been notorious for dropping long shots on uh, hmm. this meet. This one's getting bet down. That one's, to that five one's to getting one. bet, so somebody's uh, queued in here so that's the field ten thousand dollar claimers a mile older horses and the favored entry seven to five uh classic king and wartime hero but uh, ricky bobby on name recognition alone five-year-old by gun runner and his most recent early march at the fairgrounds this is against restricted thirty thousand dollar claiming company launching from off the pack using that long stretch at fairgrounds to his advantage. Yeah, and that long stretch at fairgrounds he would use to his advantage this late runner. We have a short stretch here today at Oakland Park. It is one flat mile distance. The race cuts back um, to the first wire, which is a 16 pole, so makes the stretch only an eighth of a mile. And he needed the whole entire stretch to get up and win this race. Um, this horse was claimed for 30,000 last time in a condition claimer that he won. Um, for horses that have never won three races lifetime. Today, he drops in claiming price from 30 all the way down to 10, but it's actually not a drop in class because now he's, he's running in a race for horses that have no cap on how many races you've won. So there's horses in this race that have won upwards of five, nine races, multiple horses that won nine races. And he's owned by State and Flurry in the thick of a chase for an owner title. Here at Oaklawn Park, you see the State and Flurry colors, owner of Ricky Bobby. Currently, Flurry has three more wins than Steve Asmussen. Asmussen has already wrapped up the training title, but Asmussen's second in the owner standings as well. It would be a first ever Oaklawn owner title for State and Flurry. Yeah, and also Asmussen owns the number two and two B as well. So the, the battle for the this owner gonna, title could get continues. very interesting here. And we saw something funny about it, right? Asmussen actually trains for Flurry as well <laughs> yeah. sometimes, so th that makes it a bit interesting. And Flurry Racing has been notorious for slamming in these claimers. They they don't they'll claim horses for a high dollar and drop them in if they feel like that's what's necessary to get these horses. He's to win. owned some good ones very over aggressive the years as well as well. Top Clag, like she dares the devil, a a uh, the fantasy winner, I believe. Maybe Shh. yes, I know she won the Kentucky Yokes and some other marquee events but uh for state and flurry how important were riding titles for you these last couple of weeks when you're in the in the thick of it what are those conversations like with with your agent and and what's it like battling for for a title at a big meet well funny enough i've never won a title at any meet what i've just won a lot of races I, I, I was more focused in my career on trying to ride good horses at the highest level races, and that required shipping around the country a lot. So you would have to, you'd have to pick and choose. It's either you're going to stay and battle it out for titles, or you're going to follow good horses around. And that was one of the things that uh, impacted my chances of winning titles. I've finished second in a lot of 
um, great big meets, third in the Saratoga standings one year, many times second behind Ramon Dominguez. He would he was just never beatable. The machine. It was never beatable, um, breaking all these records, and um, I was in a shadow a lot, but um, just going around riding good horses was what I focused on. Was Ramon Dominguez a nice a guy on the track as he was, like, off the he, track? He couldn't help himself. He was just so <laughs> genuine. He's genuinely the nicest person you could, you could ever meet. Not lying. Does not have a mean bone in his body. I, I can't see him, like, just shutting somebody off. You know, no. Or getting shut off and say, I'm going to get that guy later. He doesn't know it, but I'm going to get him back later and then shutting him off. You would shut him off and he would apologize to you. <laughs> That's the kind of guy that he is. What a, a world-class talent, world-class rider. The numbers and stats he put up in New York and at Saratoga, just incredible. Here at Oaklawn, State and Flurry currently. Three wins, more than owner Steve Asmussen. Asmussen has the entry, classic king, wartime hero. Flurry has Ricky Bobby. Post time for the second. Let's see if I can get it right this time. They're off. And uh, we're off. Pretty uneventful break. Cowboy Cabin going to the front with Chapel Barn in the blue blinkers. Chapel Barn grabs the lead from Cowboy Cabin. And in the third spot is Classic King approaching the clubhouse turn. Tomatado and Colosi, they're side by side. Busy legs right off of them. The gray D2 is next. He's racing with Ricky Bobby, Royal Act to the inside. And Wartime Heroes at the back of the pack getting to the rail as they approach the backstretch run. Chapel Barn is the leader here by a touch more than a length. And Cowboy Cabin concedes the lead. He's tracking from second. Classic King two lengths away in the third position. He's a length and a half in front of Tomatado, a little bit eager on a hold here with Colosi. They run as a pair and they join Classic King inside of Classic King, who's three deep now. A gap of two to Royal Act, Ricky Bobby, then Busy Legs and D2. Wartime Hero attempts to get closer on the inside. Now he gets off the rail behind a weakening. Tamat Tado who's dropping to the back of the pack as they go into the far turn where Chapel Barn, where he likes to be on the lead. He's opened up a length and three quarters, a length and a half. Now it's just a length. Cowboy Cabin getting closer from the second position. Classic King. Wartime Hero is trying to make a move on the inside. Classic King makes his way into third in the three path at the top of the lane. Colosi struggling in fourth. Royal Act passed him. He's going to get to the outside for the stretch drive. This race will end at the 16th pole. Chapel Barn has had enough. Royal Act tries to come on the sing and tackle Cowboy Cabin and Classic King between horses. Wartime Hero grandstand side not doing enough. Royal Act has hit the front in the three path and he kicks away and Royal Act will win it. Royal act by two second home classic king cowboy cabin and then colosi second race at oakland and royal act and the beat goes on for francisco arietta in a groove three wins yesterday and a victory here at five to one royal act I'm also in a groove. I picked the first two well winners done. here. Yeah. But Royal Act is $500,000 son, gelded son of American Pharaoh. Sat a perfect trip. Arietta had him right where he wanted him early, relaxed, mid pack, started ranging up on the turn, knowing that this is a short stretch. You got to get that momentum coming off the turn. And he did just that and um, timed it perfectly. You have your momentum going. Two for two on the afternoon, Royal Act at Oaklawn. Meantime, horses on the track for the third race at Aqueduct Andy. A long day. I hope Raj doesn't hurt himself patting himself on the back over there. Um, I, I like the seven here, Paul. I want full credit if I get that one home at okay. one to four right now. <laughs> race number three, they're on the track. Joey the Fish, the closer. Uh, Taking money recently has it delivered. Black early speed does hurt him sometimes. Her sometimes. <laughs> the number two, I'm sorry, his horse will be <laughs> forward. Much different riding style, riding style for Jolly Miss Jill. Yeah, ran, ran into Cinderella's cues, who's become quite a star in the last couple of races. Ten to one on suspended campaign. Elisilio Ruiz riding for Carlos Figueroa went by. And sweet as sugar, Matty Oliver rides for Lolita Shimongol. Yeah, it gets back out to the mile. Might be a pace factor today if ridden aggressively. Longest shot on the board, the five Gringotts. It's been struggling lately against these lower level claimers and has been kind of back in the pack too early on in some of these races. And the overwhelming favorite with the claiming sign 
around her neck. She was claimed, though, for 12-5 going back. Run Devil, Rudy Rodriguez, and Manny Franco. Yeah, she was claimed for that price and drops in class here, draws outside. I mean, she's the speed here and just run against better horses. But, I mean, I don't know. She's lost races she's supposed to have won. Yeah, but she has been running against better horses. I, 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 I'm not trying to beat her, but listen, she's a short price. Have at it. The Dangers Hour, the stake yesterday, and it was uh, not surprisingly the Chad Brown show. The craziest part, the most surprised part, was the Equitize was favored, who's in last right now, whereas the winner of this race, the New York bred, who looked like the favorite, Spirit of St. Louis, ended up being the second choice, getting it done. Yeah, two to one was an absolute gift, and, and you know I was high on this horse all week, and we talked about it yesterday, how this horse could be adaptable to really any pace scenario that he would get out there, and he found a nice spot early on off that pace, had it to run into, and just powerfully strided by everyone that was in front of him. Going in, I thought he was the horse to beat. He didn't disappoint, but I will say his stable mate ran a nice second, and I think that horse will be something, too, down the line. Yeah, I'm not sure that Equitize couldn't turn the tables if he was a little more forward. Surprising to see him as far back as he was, but he didn't break quite as sharply, and Javier settled back in last. But Spirit of St. Louis, he brought in the resume, and he got it done. Nice performances by both. Manny Franco getting another, and I'm going to call it the Dangers Hour. <laughs> Oh, you're not going to say no, anything else not about not going there. Okay. We'll we leave little, it alone. A <laughs> little in, inside baseball yeah. with a mispronunciation a little earlier in the week. Uh, talking, about dust, uh, talking about Run Devil, I understand this horse hasn't gotten it done, but isn't it fair to say that she's run fairly well against better fields? Oh, I, listen, I agree, and I take nothing away from that because it is true, and I just think with the outside post and the speed, way the horse to beat the public agrees i just wonder though if anybody can put some pressure on her if she's just gonna just not finish the race i mean I, i'm not saying that she may she may just run off the screen against these horses well you say put pressure on her she breaks from the outside post so she's kind of in that situation to dictate how it's done now she may just be faster than these and go to the front and clear off and get it done but if somebody wants to go too fast early, can't Manny just sit second outside of them to him? I, do you think she's... I think she's going to be in front every single point during the running of the race. You have an alternative? Who do you like? I like suspended campaign a little bit, who's dropping here. And I'm hoping for a more patient ride than this horse got last time out. And so in campaign, she was in the back of the pack last uh, time. No, two starts back. I'm sorry, two starts back. And uh, I'm not sure why they were rushing her on that. Last time out, I just feel like you know, had no shot because speed was dominant that day. It was at the back of the pack. So it's just, uh, again, I'm just taking a shot in here. I'm hoping that the seven just does not finish off one of these races again, even on the drop. And I think suspended campaign at seven to one is a horse you can kind of gravitate to in here. All right. Well, and the next member of the team stepping up, the MIG. Hey, guys, uh, and, and, and I agree with Paul. I do think suspended campaign is going to run a big race. Uh, she just looks terrific. She's dappled out, extremely well turned out. I do think last time he was against the racetrack, and it, it was, a, I think, a much tougher field. Um, I, I do have a hard time seeing past uh, you know, your favorite, the, the, the seven-horse uh, run devil, because of that outside post, but I do think suspended campaign is going to run a big race today. The four sweetest sugar looks sharp. She's done her best running when she's allowed to kind of bowl along free running. And I wonder if they're not going to revert to these tactics stretching out to the mile where they allow her to show the speed that saw her get a win and a second four and three starts back respectively. Um, and, you know, then it, it, it does come to question, can Run Devil come from just off the pace? I think Run Devil's just too good. I think she's just better than this field. Um, if I was riding her, honestly, I would just put my hands down, let her run down the middle of the track, wouldn't be in a hurry to be crossing over down the back stretch. So if somebody did want to go great guns, I'm out there by myself, and she thinks she's in front anyway. She's two to five, obviously a short price. I'm not giving you any great info. If I was going to try to beat her, I would go with suspended campaign. But to be honest, I just don't think that Run Devil is, is something would have to go wrong, I guess, is the best way to frame it for her to lose. I got, I got to say, I couldn't agree more with, with, with what the MIG is saying. And I think, you know, MIG is talking about being down the side of the track. It reminds us of the old Ussery's Alley when Bobby Ussery used to stay on the outside fence and cut over when they got to the turn at Aqueduct. And by staying out in the middle of the track, it's letting your horse dictate how the race is run. If she's clear, she's clear. You can always cut over eventually. And if somebody wants to go sort of wild inside of you, 
I understand the argument for suspended campaign, and I see there is one. The problem is she ran much better when she got the aggressive ride. So to suggest you don't want the rider to be aggressive, how is he going to beat Run Devil if he's not looking to be forward? And if he is, he lost by five lengths to her that day. I see what you're saying here, and, and I'm just from the camp of I feel like the two starts that suspended campaign ran in, the last two, w was up against it a little bit from a track well, not perspective. Not a little bit, a, bit. a lot. Yeah. Um, so No question about and it. And we've seen horses come back and run well off those biased trips. The problem is... Where, is her, where are her races before it that make her beat the favorite? That's fine. I got no argument with that, but... When she was aggressive, and, and I, listen, I used her as a small backup in a now defunct pick five where I singled the three in the last race. Um, she's got to make up five lengths on Run Devil. Your hope is that Run Devil's the horse doesn't want to win races. Well, that's that's really where I'm coming from with, with my argument, I guess, or my, my, my take on the three and also on the seven. Because honestly, I, I just still can't get over the fact better horses or not at times she's been in good positions, Run Devil, to win races and she just hasn't finished them off. No, no, I, I, I understand, yeah. but I think if you go through and look at who she's been losing to, it's sort of a bevy of horses that are better than these. And I think with Rudy Rodriguez, the drop to 16, and she rates to be claimed, you know, unlike when we talked about winning connection, that math yesterday, where the connections were going to lose $17,000 with a win and a claim, yeah. this is a $39,000 purse so she gets over twenty one thousand dollars she's actually been making money for them by finishing second in these races they claimed for 12.5 back in august so nine months later they've kind of sort of paid her bills maybe even a little bit more than paid her bills now with a win here you're talking at a claim you're talking about thirty five thousand dollars not a bad way to move on in the claiming game i'm not trying to beat her you are paul she's a heavy favorite chris griffin has the call race number three at the big a Gringotts, Run Devil, big favorite to the outside, Manny Franco board. And in, all set. And they're off. Run Devil flew from the outside straw, and here comes Run Devil towards the front. But Sweet as Sugar is quickest, and now Sweet as Sugar will take command. It's Sweet as Sugar and Run Devil well apart here as they get set to come out of the chute. Right in behind them, that's going to be Jolly Miss Jill, who's stalking from third as the two leaders now hook up with the backstretch towards the back end of the field. Here comes Suspended Campaign in between horses in the orange cap with Gringotts and far, far back right now, Joey the Fish is already about 10, 12 lengths the trailer. To move up the back stretch, it's Swedish Sugar and Madison Over. They've got the lead. 24 seconds flat for that opening quarter mile. Run Devil, the big favorite, is just allowing this pace setter to press on, is now with in the half length of the lead as this horse moves forward. Run Devil towards the outside of Swedish Sugar. At the rail, it's Jolly Miss Jill is just tugging there, wants to go. Suspended campaign starts a rally. Gringotts and Joey the Fish with a ton of ground to make up and a 47.39 half mile to chase. And Sweet as Sugar has put two and a half lengths on an all-in run devil. Sweet as Sugar is trying to open up right now as they approach the top of the stretch. Run Devil, the big favorite, is all in, and Sweet as Sugar still has this cushion. Is going to hug the rail and kick for home. Can Sweet as Sugar pull off the upset? Sweet as Sugar, and now the margin diminishing a little bit. Run Devil is kept to task, is now moving up alongside, but Sweet as Sugar is still finding plenty inside the final furlong, and now Run Devil will assert. It's Run Devil who pushes on by. Sweet as Sugar is pumping the brakes now as Run Devil is opening up late here in the late stages. Jolly Miss Jill up in a second, but Run Devil gets it done. Jolly Miss Jill second, suspended campaign, and Sweet as Sugar in 1 minute 37 and 3. Well, you didn't, you didn't have to suffer a little bit if you singled this horse or needed this horse because Run Devil had some anxious moments when it looked like Sweet as Sugar was getting away. But Sweet as Sugar was Sweet as Sugar in the last eighth of a mile. A little bit too much for her as Run Devil does get it done at one to four. Yeah, Sweet as Sugar looked as good as gold right here hugging the rail and then realized, wait, this isn't six, six and a half, maybe seven furlongs and kind of dropped anchor. And, and you know, Run Devil 
before that looked like she wasn't going to want to finish this race off either, but the best horse in the end did find a way to get the job done. And, and Jolly Miss Jill was a little bit off the pace today and ended up running second behind a runaway winner, although he had some anxious moments. And Abdel Boca Chico, who just recently started riding here, we wish him good luck. Um, I think he did the right thing with Jolly Miss Jill. In a way, he kind of rode her for second, and I don't mean that to say he didn't want to win or wasn't trying to win, but I think he and the connections understood they were only winning this race if something happened to Run Devil. So instead of using her speed to engage and possibly compromising her chances further, he sort of said, I'm gonna put my filly in a position where, or mare, where if the favor doesn't show up, I can win the race. And she got second, which was really the best that she could have gotten. Run Devil, the heavy favorite, gets it done. Race number three, kicking off the pick six. Much more to come on America's Day at the Races as we take a quick break. America's Day at the Races is brought to you in part by Claiborne Farms. 100 years of doing the usual unusually well as we head to the winner's circle for race number three at Aqueduct. I think Manny Franco had some anxious yeah. moments on the heavy favorite <laughs> run devil as probably Rudy Rodriguez did as well. We'll see if she got claimed, but she got it done. You got Max Jingles on that one to four. 250 on the win, 270 on the win end. Combines with Jolly Miss Jill for an exact that paid 410 for a dollar. Hope you're still alive in the pick five, pick four, or pick whatever that was. Happens race number four, another heavy favorite in here, the six, Apuro. I'm going to try to beat this one with Papu's laugh, but Apuro might just be the one dropping down for Todd Pleasure. Might be the right one in here, and you know we'll see what happens. Tired against better off the layoff and. I don't know, back now to sprinting today. And I just think today might be graduation day for this horse at a short price. We'll see what happens. Of course, we got more action at Oakland Park as well. And one of the, the women riders done very well in the past at Oakland Park is Chelsea Bailey. We'll hear much more about her when America's Day at the Races continues. Connect, a grade one winning millionaire making his mark as a sire with rattle and roll a grade one winning two-year-old and multiple graded stakes winner graded stakes winning two-year-olds hidden connection and whitwater's rand graded stakes winning three-year-old implicated connect a proven sire in the making standing 
at Lane's End Farm. Experience the adrenaline pumping, suspense filled action of the Sport of Kings no matter where you are with Naira Vets. It's fast, easy, and secure. Download the app today and start winning with our lucrative weekly promotions, thrilling handicapping contests, and a one of a kind VIP rewards program. Don't just watch horse racing, be a part of the action with Naira Vets. But it's all Pinehurst. Grade one winner at two. Very impressive in the runaway Del Mar Veturity. Graded stakes winner at three. Pinehurst so gutsy. The highest earning son of twirling candy. Pinehurst lasted home to win it for the United States. Bred on the same cross as Gunrunner. Pinehurst, standing at Walmack. Breeding in New York State just got a whole lot greener. Starting in 2026 with two-year-olds and expanding in 2027 to include three-year-olds and up, New York Reds on the Naira Circuit will be offered purses matching the race's open company counterpart. That's a nearly 20% increase per race compared to 2023. Bowling season is in full swing. There's still time to take advantage of New York's better-than-ever state-bred incentives. Visit naira.com slash nybreds for more info. Welcome back. Look at that. We got postcard kind of afternoon in Hot Springs. You're watching America's Day at the Races on Fox Sports 2. Horses in the paddock. Race 3, 10 minutes out. $25,000 maiden claimer, a mile. Phillies and mares, three year olds and older. While the favorite, number eight, is Church Service. Take a look at number seven, Chuck Will's Widow, an outsider at 25 to 1. Long shot, but a long shot with the services of jockey Chelsea Bailey. Chelsea Bailey, who's just an athlete, right? A former MMA fighter, a jockey here at Oaklawn Park. A very, very driven. And where does all of that come from? Her competitive nature. I'm, I'm a very, very competitive person. It is richness in front. Real nice, patient, confident ride from Chelsea Bailey. Chelsea? Yeah. Did yeah. you bet on me? Yes. <laughs> They're both like almost like along the same parallel that you are an athlete, you have weight that's involved. You have to have upper body strength. I have a really good balance that I've taken that I've used from there. You have to have, you know, split second decision action time. It's the same thing. When that bell rings, anything could happen in the fight. And when that gate opens, anything could happen in the race. Uh, I've had three professional fights. Um, I had one fight for the Ultimate Fighter because it was for a reality TV show. Chelsea trains with USC champion Misha Tate. Are you ready? Are you ready? Let's fight. You know, I'm not going to lie. It feels really good to punch somebody in the face. You know, especially if, you know, they've been talking bad about you. You know, you train so hard, and when you can go out there and you can just really connect, it's a, it's a pretty good feeling. It's kind of a weird twist of fate and destiny that I was able to actually meet my husband and was able to get me involved with the horse racing. You have to be able to know how to go out there and ride the horse and give the horse the best ride that you can and do everything you can to try to win the race. This is Charlie. This is, this is Charlie can do. He's so laid back, he's a really nice horse to be around, and he's super kind. Charlie Can Do did. Charlie Can Do won by eight. Chelsea Bailey able to do just that. Tom Swearingen, racing stable, the winning owner, winning trainer. I liked everything about her, the way she handled the horses, uh, just uh, her dedication was extreme. And so from that point on, I, you know, I, I thought we would be able to use her, let her ride some horses. We were really happy with what she did, and. Everybody likes her, and she, her work ethic is second to none. She's a very, very dedicated person. The toughest part is keeping the momentum going, you know, not getting hurt, um, doing good. You know, it's like when you're hot, you're hot. When you're down, you're down. I love boxing. I love to hit the bag. I like combinations, but my background is wrestling. So I feel really comfortable on the ground. My ground game is uh, pretty sick. 
Don't get out with your hips out in front of the shoulders. See, Smith, way too forward. Pressure behind the shoulders. Tighten it up. Change, change sides, create angles. It's really cool to see that there are more girls that are getting interested in it and want to get involved. And I feel really special that I'm able to help out and you know kind of lend my experience and give them tips and give them give them my two cents and kind of help out with them like wrap the shoulder around there to put to use your head it's not just the girls it's also the guys and everything you know I'm a, a good body to help practice with and I can help find uh, faults and things that they're doing wrong and I can also work with them because I'm more their size it's really awesome I'm like glad to be a part of the community and that factor and not just at the racetrack but also helping out with the kids at the school and stuff and volunteering I really enjoy it And doing a great job and something she has to be so proud of as a volunteer coach, the kids, the wrestlers, this year, three mm -hmm. individual state champions here in Arkansas. Yeah, and, and I got to be asked Chelsea about it, and I actually congratulated her, and she was more excited about that <laughs> than anything else. She said, thank you so much. I mean, I put in so a ton of work with a lot of these kids. And uh, let's not forget, she was a training partner for Misha Tate. Misha Tate knocked out Ronda Rousey. Okay, let's just go there, first of all. Uh, and she'd wrap you up in a pretzel. And you know what? The thing about Chelsea, she could flat out ride. And I was so proud of her because on Arkansas Derby Day, she went in the last race on Xylophone at 19 to 1 to get up at the wire. And she was very exuberant. Uh, she brings a, a lot to the racetrack and a tremendous smile. That intensity, had, again, just has to be so proud of the, the, the kids and racking up those individual state champions uh, Chelsea Bailey and trying to shake things up here at Oaklawn Park aboard a long shot 22 to 1 Chuck Wills widow in the third five minutes out as our coverage continues from Hot Springs you're watching America's Day at the races on Fox Sports 2. From the Santa Anita studio, this is a live look. It's a fun event, important event, and the PDJF Telethon, Permanently Disabled Jockeys Fund, Paul raising awareness, fundraising for our fallen riders. Phones are open till 6 Eastern. <laughs> Give them a call, donate if you can, and you, you, who knows who might answer the phone? No, that is true. You never know. You got Mike Smith there on the left. Look at Mike with that big smile. I mean, <laughs> look, you can just see it all the way here to Hot Springs, Arkansas. So you never know. You might want to contribute a little bit more with Mikey on the phone. But yeah, 1-844-884-PDJF. It's an unbelievable organization. Over $70,000 raised, but we need that to keep on rising throughout the day. Absolutely. 
see the information. The telethon going on until 6 Eastern. Meantime here, riders up for the third and post break brewing. This was moments ago. This was a little bit earlier. Two minutes out, actually, until this third. And uh, there's Keith Asmussen aboard at Alex, currently 2-1. to one. I, I think the, the Philly to beat in here, she comes off a good race, you know, way behind Thorny, but sometimes those spread out races could be key. Number two, cry if I want to. Outsider, 29-1. to one. Cry if I want to. Cry if I, I want I was going to pretend I didn't know I will the cry reference. Too if but I, I bet did. this horse for you. <laughs> Resolution, not revolution. Uh, Domina. Uh, popular at the claim box. I, I'm going to give this filly maybe one more chance to All run right. a decent race. He's kind of been up and down a little bit. Arden R by Travers runner-up, Grasshopper. Yeah, Grasshopper here, who's been a tremendous sire here in Arkansas. 8-6 now, this mare. I'm ready for wine. Two races, two rough starts. Yeah, and a horse that, you know, at 33-1, to one, not reaching too much going a mile for the first time. There she is, Chelsea Bailey aboard Chuck Will's Widow. Yeah, filly by Midnight Loot. And uh, Bro McBride here. Church service on a Sunday, why not? Yeah, on a Sunday, but 0 for 25. But this is the lowest she's ever been in for. Two to one favorite. Then Space City, Spa City Gal, and uh, Christian Torres looking for a second. Yeah, three decent races. Christian Torres gets aboard. And uh, those races were around one turn. Now going to try a mile. Number 10, Lost Love. Uh, Arietta looking to go back to back. I thought this was the, the other horse in here. Nine to one looks Really well on the racetrack. Probably needed that race last time. Was part of a, you know, fastest pace. And this is a horse that does have some back numbers at 9-1. to one. It's just hard to trust a horse at 0 for 25 at 9-5. to five. Yeah, but Paula, uh, some cheaper races, some claiming races uh, to start the program, but competitive races we've seen thus far, at least on paper. Yeah, really competitive races. Because you do have this 8 in here church service. I get it. You see her on the screen right there. She's 0 for 25. But she's got the best numbers in this race. She's never been in for the lowest, this $25,000 tag, which means, you know, she's been in for 100 before, but she's always been protected. Mr. Klein or Robert Klein and Kelsey uh, have never put this horse up for sale, and they are today. So at, at 25, I think people are going to reach in for a claim. But again, when you're a perpetual loser, <laughs> you, you, you wonder, you know, with the drop in classes that get her a W, it doesn't really translate necessarily. It's so much to concede, right, for a mare that's had that many chances. I, I, I get it. I understand why she's 9-5, to five, but I think you have to draw the line somewhere. I don't know what each individual's magic number is, yeah, right. and you say to yourself at some point, okay, they're just going to have to win one without me, and then we'll see. Kind of. And, and especially win one without me at nine to five. Now, if church service was about eight or nine to one, you might think, OK, they're going to win sooner or later. But a, 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 at that price, um, I think the one's going to be very tough in here. Uh, I will take a little bit of a shot with the four domina again, going back in that barn. But I do think the, the 10 lost love is a horse on the outside that is getting money for Aaron Shorter, who's having a sneaky, very good meet. If you look at his numbers, he's got 19 horses hit the trifecta, so his horses are running. You can see the seven. And Chelsea Bailey with Chuck Will's widow acting up a little pre-race, hopefully coaxed forward without hesitation and is in. Asmussen's all around. And Alex, Steve as an owner. Again, three wins back of State and Flurry in the chase for an owner title here at Oak Lawn Park would be a first, in fact. Matt Dinnerman standing by with the call. Post time for the third from Oak Lawn, a mile running to the first wire. Spa City Gal going up. Domita, two back, Arden, Arkansas. Lost love. We're ready to go. And uh, Laroff, the great shirt service, caught an alert beginning and strides in front with Arden, Arkansas. These two hook up in the first furlong. Aunt Alex down on the inside right off of them in the third. Cry if I want to is next. Domina parked three deep into the clubhouse turn. Spa City Gal has lost the most ground to this point, is in midfield racing alongside of Ready for Wine, who's in a little bit of a tight spot, has to tap on the brakes here. As Cry if I want to tried to drift out and Ready for Wine had to steady hard off of heels, lost the spot to Lost Love, who's relaxed on the 
inside and mid division here coming back to the two trailers resolution and chuck wills widow those two share the back markers spot the field separated by at least a dozen legs and shirt service the six to five favorite leads the way by a length and three quarters domina picks up the running in the second position arden arkansas has lost ground is third and alex moves inside of her cry if i want to three deep spa city gal four wide on the course and she's five off the pace approaching the forward turn run ready for wine next has not had a good go of it today is lost position lost love alongside of her as a lot of ground to make up chuck wills widow is next and resolution has dropped out of it as they round the far turn shirt service approaching the top of the lane has gotten away to a three length advantage and alex sent after her from second but still well behind shirt service who hits the top of the lane with a four length lead shirt service kelsey har all alone on the lead and alex second chasing arden arkansas alongside furlong to go it's church service with a four length lead spa city gal trying to get up in a second but church service and lifetime start number 26 they kept the faith and she's going to break the maiden church service a runaway winner spa city gal second arden arkansas third and then aunt alex said she was going to have to win one without me there it was a <laughs> church service by daylight graduating in her 26 lifetime start they say the numbers don't lie right i mean like you got to give kelsey hart credit because she put the squeeze on nick juarez early early in this race with the five she can ride it's just you know robert klein's horses have been a little unlucky and like listen he's he's dropping horses you see all people dropping horses this and that he finally drops when a win. So these guys are capable trainers, and Kelsey is a very capable rider. She was on the best horse, and she sent the horse to the front end and said, come and catch me, and Big Gray was gone. If we get a chance at some point to see what happened on the on the first turn, it looked like the horse was getting stacked up pretty good there on the first turn. Well, I think what ended up happening is she was content on getting to the front end, and Nick Wars is very good at getting to the front end, so he wanted to push her a little bit, and she said, okay, I'll push you. I'm going to get to the front end, and you could see Nick had to take up a little bit and as soon as he took up she just got clear of everybody else and the race was over didn't look like a mare there that had lost 25 consecutive like races. i said my father always says son <laughs> you're gonna find a field they're gonna beat eventually <laughs> they, they call it finding your friends you're not supposed to clobber your friends that's exactly what that <laughs> mare just did graduation day church service on a sunday results when we come back and while uh, it does feel premature to discuss saratoga uh in april not this year. Belmont Stakes at Saratoga, a mile and a quarter. Belmont at Saratoga, going to be a blast. Far. It's America's original sport, and no one covers it better than America's Best Racing.net. From the sport to the lifestyle, the best races, horses, and destination venues, cocktails, gambling, fashion, and more. America's Best Racing.net is a sport for you. The sun shines bright on Caraconte. His first crops of racing age are showing brilliance on the racetrack with a high percentage of stakes winners. His versatility is evidenced by winners on all surfaces across the globe. Spanderella could not have been more impressive. The sun shines bright on this value sire. Fair down, 25, fair down, 25, fair down, thank you. Right here, 525,000. Caraconte, standing at Gainesway.
something different, something exciting, and it'll be here before you know it. The 156 Belmont Stakes at Saratoga, June 8th, live coverage on Fox. Third and final jewel of the Triple Crown, the Belmont at Saratoga, Polly is going to be awesome. Can we key up Rocky music? Because I want to start doing push-ups. <laughs> I mean, literally, like, I'm so pumped. It's just the test at that of the crown. champion. You have to arrive and, and, fit, and, man. Just look at this schedule, Lafitte. This always feels like a, a, a late spring, early summer Breeders' Cup preview type of program, grade one after grade one after grade one, and just how this town is going to embrace it. Yeah. It's going to be different. It's a mile and a quarter Belmont stakes, but if the Derby winner happens to win the Preakness stakes, perhaps a triple crown bid at Saratoga, and it takes a lot of getting used to, doesn't it? The Belmont at a mile and a quarter at Saratoga. It does, but like I said, listen, there's been change in every other sport mm -hmm. in this world. I mean, from basketball to baseball to football to everywhere, it's okay to have a little change. So chill out, people. Belmont Stakes only on Fox at Saratoga as a church service does her best American Pharaoh impersonation <laughs> and just dominates here at Oakland, graduating in her 26th lifetime start. By the way, uh, congratulations to Kelsey Hart, church service, a mayor by creative cause. Now one for 26th lifetime. Literally before I came on set, I was talking to Ch uh, Kelsey Hart's little daughter. She's 12. I said, she's been hmm. barrel racing and she breaks babies. I said, I need to be your agent a little bit. You know what she told me? You need to line up, Mr. LaDuca. I said, Take what? a number. Wow. Take a number. Yes. Andy Ryder's up post-parade time for the fourth at Aqueduct. Thanks a lot, guys. The number one. Piccolo Diablo on the track right now, four to one. Eric Cancel riding for George Weaver. Yeah, it drops down back to the level that this horse ran at at the debut. We'll see if it makes a difference today. I'm going to try this one. Mithridates, ridden by Sammy Camacho. Trained by Mir Shockley. Yeah. Do you, do you know what Mithridates was famous for? Uh, no. He's the king of Pontus. Excellent. Papu's Laugh, Carlos Martin, Romero Mirage, my pick. I think they would be aggressive here on the drop in class today, also coming off the layoff and having shown speed in the debut. She is the speed on paper, the number four crown that saint. Has had his chances. New gelding and cuts back in distance today to the six furlongs. Rui Rodriguez looking for back-to-back -back winners. Uh, on shaking the bell. Going second off of the layoff here. Was involved a little bit early last Heavily time. Heavily favored Apuro. Kendra Carmouche riding for Todd Pletcher. Was part of the pace for quite a while last time out. Just didn't see that mile out. Drops and cuts back today. And a long shot with, with oh, I'm sorry, Omar Hernandez Moreno riding this one for Ricardo Leal. Sounds, uh, it's been soundly beaten in all of the starts. We need a complete turnaround today against this group. All right, but the heavy favorite in this race is the number six, a Peru who's dropping down for trainer Todd Pletcher. And he's had his chances a few times at short prices, but this is far and away the easiest race he's ever been in. Yeah, competition-wise it is. I know he was a little flat last time out, but they do take the blinkers off today. And he was part of that pace for quite a while, just didn't see the distance out. And he tired versus better, too, if you go back to about uh, two starts back off that return of sprinting and even his debut race i mean you look at the horse who won the race i mean he came back with an 85 buyer and he was third in a turf stakes down the line this is just a much easier spot today well i think it's more than just sprinting also his first race was on synthetic going long kind of irrelevant met a much better field he was just over bet in his second start thought he was disappointing last time that's the one that worries me maybe the cutback but clearly the drop should help this one yeah i think a lot of it is just the distance seeing it through maybe he just doesn't want to go the mile i know he went the mile in 70 on synthetic but i just feel like he he was a part of that pace last time out. 23.46 was an all right pace for that race. And I just think today when you put it together, and I think taking the blinkers off may help him today. Maybe he'll see things around him and, and he'll be a little less, you know, a little calmer out there as well. Yeah, he is the horse to beat. I'm going to try to beat him, though, and hopefully wire him with the number three in this race. We are going to come up on a quick pause as we're coming upon three o'clock to welcome in our friends at Valley Sports South Cal and San Diego. Welcome back to America's Day at the Races. I want to welcome people in at Bally Sports, San Diego, and Southern California. Andy Serling and Paul Verderoso 
holding down the fort here at Aqueduct Racetrack. Richard Migliori in the winner's circle as well. We're down in the paddock. And of course, the guys are out at Oaklawn Park as well. But Paul, we're coming upon the fourth race, which will kick off our late pick five today with a very, very heavy favorite, Apuru, the number six. Yeah, and a horse that just figures in this race. This is the easiest field he has faced now, sprinting on the dirt. The cutback should help him. And just the class relief, too, I think will be a big factor for a horse like this. I'm going to try to beat him, though, Richie, with the number three, Papu's Laugh, to wire the field second time out. After being on an inside, it may not have been the best place to be. Richie, anything you want to do to encourage me here? No, I, I'm going to try to beat him, too, not with the same horse. But listen, your, your horse getting Lasix for the first time after showing high speed and dropping in class, yeah, I, I can see it. I like the one, Piccolo Diavolo, th this horse, uh, you know, chased uh, Muzara around, who came back and showed high speed against winners. Conniving, who was second that day, came back with another good second in a maiden 40. Uh, I, I'm just, I, I can't take one to two on a horse that's never found their way to the winner's circle yet, unless it was a first-time starter that you knew something about. Uh, listen, Apuro makes a lot of sense on the drop. I, I, I just, again, I can't go with that price. Uh, and I would be remiss not to mention the two uh, Mithradi, Mithra if I'm saying that right, uh, this horse just looked too good at a big price. I do think will outrun his odds. Thanks, Meg. As the field is heading into the gate for race number four, Paul, are you going to try to beat the favorite or not? Not this time. I think this horse is going to finally get his diploma. May have finally found the right field in just his fourth start as they're heading into the gate. I felt like the three Papoos laugh. Romero Mirage riding so well gets Lasix the first time, blinkers on, showed speed inside the day. Maybe you want to be a little bit farther out and kind of a tough race for a maiden 40, a big drop for him as well. But no doubt, the number six Apuro is the one to beat. Chris Griffin has the call of our fourth. Three up, shaking the bell. Shaking the bell. Goes in, backs away. Just a touch hesitant here. Try again with shaking the bell. Now in, here's Apuro. Swept, last to low, and in. All set. Got it. And they're off. Speed from shaking the bell towards the front. Apuro's in the early mix, and at the rail here comes a Piccolo Diablo. Is now trying to challenge for the lead with Mithridates, who's right there as well. Four of them across the racetrack, and at the rail, it's Piccolo Diablo. Is now a neck in front. Mithridates, the big long shot is right to the outside here, stalking from second. Three wide is going to be shaking the bell. Apuro is going to be four wide. Five wide will be Papu's laugh. Green cap is just moving up on the outside, but wide. Saving ground to the inside there is Crown That Saint, and Crown That Saint is going to take that spot, is going to hold that rail position, and that's going to be a tactical move that may work out here for Crown That Saint, who's trying to push on through, is now within a neck of the lead. The Triller is swept. 23 seconds flat was that opening quarter mile. There's still five across the racetrack. Crown That Saint with that rail skimming ride is about to challenge Piccolo Diavolo as they reach the top of the stretch. All in is shaking the bell as they're in third. apuro has got a... Pick it up from theirs on the grandstand side is still three lengths back of the battling duo as Piccolo Diavolo and Eric Kensell trying to put it away inside the final furlong. Piccolo Diavolo is now approaching the 16th pole. Apuro towards the outside is shaking the bell. Piccolo Diavolo is almost there and Piccolo Diavolo gets the victory. Piccolo Diavolo wins it, shaking the bell. Might have won that photo there with Apuro. Finishing fourth was crowned that saint. Final running time, one minute 11 and three. Pace scenario changed in here when the speed Papu's laugh was unable to get out of the gate well. And Eric Ansel, a good job, and Pico de Liavolo taking the lead here, getting it done over a horse, a favorite, who I don't know where he's going to win if he's not winning this race in Peru. Yeah, he didn't run that well today. and and But hats off to Eric Ansel for taking advantage of a situation where Papu's laugh did not break, and he was aggressive and got to the top. And 
managed to hold off a group here that was not so good at the end of the day. But I, again, heads up to Eric because that was a headsy ride, being able to secure the front and being able to just get this horse to settle down a little bit and then be able to run on late. And the number six, Apuro, didn't even save the place. It looks like the five shaking the bell got second there for Alicio Ruiz, but Eric Cancel gets the front with Pico Diablo, riding the race the right way to upset the favorite. Not a big price, but three to one, and Piccolo Diablo as a Puro. He'll be back to fight another day. Whether or not he's gonna find a softer field in New York, or at Naira at least, remains to be seen. Race number four, another bit, bit of an upset, and this is a pick five where, you know, you've seen a heavy favorite in the third leg, and shorter prices, but you beat two heavy favorites. So these pick fives should be pretty pretty good value. We'll get those will pays and more when we come back. Chad Brown, four wins yesterday, including the Preakness runner-up, a Blazing Sevens coming back. I believe a 97 buyer in there. See if he can be a player and move forward in the division. He'll be in the plenty of grace as well with two of the four. Welcome back to America's Day at the Races. Looking at those turf courses at Aqueduct, well, three of the last four races will be on the grass, including race number five, our first turf sprint of the year, but race number four, a mild upset. A little credit to Eric Cancel for being aggressive with Piccolo Diablo, getting through on the inside, winning the race for trainer George Weaver. Yeah, smart heads up ride once the speed of the three. Papu's laugh did not break, Eric Cancel. Took advantage of that and just off the rail too made things a little bit tough for the four to kind of have to wait to get through there never ended up going through and boy he took off down the lane finished off well and for the number six Boro, this was just not a good start and probably the easiest field he's going to find here at this low level yeah he's he certainly had his chances uh, he's a horse that you i don't think we'll see him at one to two at least at naira going forward whether or not he just had his chances and really was a very dull third in there. Eight dollars even on Piccolo Diablo. If you got shaking the bell, the 17 to one shot in there for second, you got an exacto that paid a little over $73 for two dollars or 36.75 for a buck. The fifth race coming up, not the fifth race, one of the more interesting races probably we've run all week actually coming back, looking at the will pays and the doubles, the four, six, and 11 appear to be similar prices in the multi-race bets, but I thought a very interesting competitive race. Where are you going, Paul? Not only interesting and competitive, but wide open. I'm on a long shot in here. I'm on the 10, Creesa, Jose Gomez aboard. 
So I want to give this horse a shot. Didn't get the greatest trip last time out against a few of these in here. And today, I think that he should get a nice little pace set up in here for the first turf sprint. And if he can get a clean trip in here, he can make a little noise at a big price. I bet him last time, Creasa, and does feel like there should be some pace in here, but it'd be fun to see the turf sprints back here. They often get the big field, especially with the New York breads. A lot of older horses running against some three-year-olds as well. More action to come here and Oakland Park. America's Day at the Races will return after a quick break. Adrenaline pumping suspense filled action of the sport of kings, no matter where you are, with Naira Vets. It's fast, easy, and secure. Download the app today and start winning with our lucrative weekly promotions, thrilling handicapping contests, and a one of a kind VIP rewards program. Don't just watch horse racing, be a part of the action with Naira Vets. Just in front, thousand words wins the Robert B. Lewis. Honoree P is full out now, second on the outside. And they're coming down to the line, and thousand words has done it. The rumbling started early and only intensified with performances that sent shockwaves across the nation. At the center of it all, Epicenter is at the top of the three-year-old class in the Run Happy Travers. Epicenter, three-year-old champion by Not This Time. Cool More America, home of champions. Welcome back to America's Day at the Races. Phones are open till 6 Eastern. Live look at Santa Anita, the PDJF Telethon. Give them a call. Talk to a Hall of Famer. Donate for a great cause. Yeah, it is a great cause. And since we went back, we've got another 120,000 to keep it going through. The PDJF is such a great fund. Goes to a lot of great things. 1-844-884-PDJF. We'll go to pdjf.org and donate. I've already donated mine self. It just takes a little bit. Even a couple dollars here and there, it all adds up. I love the way the industry has rallied around this particular event, having become so popular, the event, important and, and inspirational to, to take care of our, our fallen riders. Yeah, it is. I mean, at the end of the day, you listen, if it wasn't for the horses, we wouldn't have a job. And if it wasn't for the guys on their back, we wouldn't have a job. And we understand. I wouldn't be here. Yes. And we understand this as in you being a son of a former rider and me being around the racetrack for a long time. Injuries happen in this sport. And this is something that we need to address more and more. And the funds need to be going up more and more each year. Well said. Very well said. Here at Oaklawn on this picture-perfect Sunday afternoon, gearing up for the fourth race, fourth of nine. 55 0 dollars claimer, non-winners to lifetime post parade. There's Auto Glide. This is a tough race. Auto Glide's got a shot in here. I think the two in here, Rivetage too, as well, and they're both five to one and eight to one. Francisco Arietta having big day yesterday. One win today thus far. Funny Uncle one for 18 lifetime, but Christian Torres takes over. You know the one, two, and three all had trips in here. It's going to be really interesting how it plays out today. Carnival, Martin Schwann in the 10 strike purple. If this horse is dangerous. The seven has to stay off his back. He could be tough on the front end. Amazing. Mark one geared of late. Waldrop number six by Claiborne Stallion Mastery. Not bad. First time around two turns over the slop. So pass that test a little bit. Now has to do it um, over a 
a dry surface. We miss Arlington. We do miss Arlington. I know, right? And this is the horse that's the thorn in the side for the four. If the seven doesn't go full speed ahead with the four, uh, the four could be tough in here. Chicago Bears, that stadium downtown. <laughs> what are we doing? Rabbit Hound, 15 to one, and then own the field at three to one. And Ramon Vasquez in the flying pea hot pink. Yeah, blinkers go on. This uh, four-year-old gelding by always dreaming for Michael Maker and Ramon Vasquez. They're a potent team. This horse is getting bet a little bit. That's the field for the fourth $50,000 claimers, non-winners to lifetime. We've had several of these races of late, these mile races. I run into that first wire here at Oaklawn Park. And to help us out, Jonathan Kinchin joins us. JK, who, which of these earns that elusive second career lifetime win? You know, look, I, I think it's Funny Uncle. Uh, if you look at Funny Uncle's last three races, the three horse here, you'll notice that there's kind of been an excuse in every single one of those races. You look at the race three back, was wide all the way around there, off of a little bit of a layoff, uh, breaking slowly away from the gate. And that second back, that two races back on March 8th, another one broke a little bit slow. March 23rd, the last race, had some trouble throughout the race. Now, you start to ask yourself, is this horse's style and is Funny Uncle actually the problem? Is Funny Uncle creating these bad trips for himself? But he still runs so well considering how much adversity he's had in those races. He gives me a sense of comfort where his talent actually is and hopeful that there's a rider change here. And that also could help this horse find his way into a much easier, less uh, adverse trip. He's definitely the best horse, in my opinion, based on what we've seen from his last three. But he's going to need to get out of his own way. If you take my, uh, my, my push here on the three funny uncle, our race will be won or lost in the first two to three seconds of the race. If he breaks cleanly and breaks forward and doesn't get into trouble, I think he'll be the winner. I hate using the word if when it comes to eight to five favorites. Uh, of course, I feel like we're having the conversation that we did in the, the last race. Paulie with church service. I don't want this 25 race maiden at a short price in here. A three to two shot and funny uncle and a one for 18 lifetime record. Yeah, but I, I see where JK's going. This horse did probably run the, the best last race. There was so much going on in that last race. There's traffic everywhere, you know, going to in that same race. Rivetage had traffic. The two didn't break well. So I don't think there's much separating between the two and the three in here. And then you got to go to another race, right? Auto Glide and Rabbit Hound and those horses are coming out of in Waldrip to six. They're coming out of the race. So a different race. So which one do you want to distinguish distinguish is the better of the races? And you know, the public's looking at funny uncle. I actually think that if you look at Auto Glide, he's a horse that in the past has shown that he can be right there, kinda up on the pace. And you know, Last time out, he got way behind the eight ball on March 15th over a sloppy racetrack, and he had some traffic. He, he couldn't really go anywhere. He didn't really know what to do with anyone. He swung outside. And you can see it's a bog that day. The rain had just come down. I don't know if he really loved it. He's kind of a big sort by P uh, Tiz now, and I think he's going to fire a big race. And listen, you get nothing against Joey Belmer, but you're getting Julian Le Peru aboard, and I think this horse will be in a better spot. All chasing a very green rail. Scraping Southern Sunset. That was a mile and a 16th in the slop. Uh, how different do you feel about those exiting that heat? And here we are. It's a fast track here naturally, but the change in distance cut back to a mile. I think it benefits the, the four of all horses in here. Now, that comes also with a little denotation that the seven we miss Arlington and Joey Belmere doesn't go crazy on the front end. If you look mm. at the four and the seven, these horses have both gone sub 21 mm. going six furlongs. They are, are by far the two fastest horses in this race. But if they butt heads, what's going to give in? And if they do that again, you see what happened when we miss Arlington last time. It, it caused a pace meltdown. Cannavale. Martin Schwann's a very sharp rider. If Joey Belmere commits, I think he'll take back. I think the four's got a big, big look in here to sit a good trip. I think Martin Schwann breaks out of the gate and then sees what the seven does and then lays off. He cannot get into a speed duel with the seven in here. Currently five to one, Cannaval, as they approach the starting gate for this fourth race, day after the Oaklawn Handicap. Just off camera moments ago, we were discussing yesterday's Oaklawn Handicap and Skippy Longstocking and registering a 1-0 oh 
seven yesterday afternoon. Yeah, lifetime top. Higher speed figure. Yeah, unbelievable. And he he did it. It looked like he ran 107 by her. And you know what? That's even better news for Highland Falls. A, a young you know, horse has only got four races. Probably ran a, a darn good number, too, I would, I would think. Maybe in the hundred, right around there. You know, it was only a couple lengths behind. I mean, Skippy, Skippy Longstocking had the race wrapped up, but Highland Falls was a nice little second. We were discussing the discrepancy between the very best older horses in the country and White Abario and Saudi Crown and Senor Buscador and those horses. And okay, Skippy Longstocking, that race, you know, how can he, can he, we're not, com can he compete at that level? And then you look at the number that comes yeah. back. It's like, uh, yeah, maybe he can. And with a lot of these other horses, nothing against Senior Buscador. Obviously, he's, they might be more talented, but they've been traveling all over the world. You know, they're, and Skippy now just ran his lifetime top. Maybe they back off. He's a little bit fresher, maybe. Uh, White Barrio met mile, bound. The others, get them all in the gate in the Whitney at Saratoga. <laughs> Post time for the fourth live from Oakland. Here's Matt Dinnerman. Cannaval will be second to last. Into the outside on the field. We're ready to go. And uh, we're off. Good dispatch. Far outside on the field on the lead with Funny Uncle. Now it's going to be Funny Uncle to take the lead with Cannaval. We miss Arlington deeper on the course, but he's advancing position, going a little wide into that turn, and that carries out Rabbit Hound around the turn. Cannaval has cleared off on the lead and has opened up that lead to about two and a half or three likes. So Cannaval's loose up top. We miss Arlington, keen to go on second. Rabbit Hound to the outside of him. Funny Uncle takes back to fourth, so it is own the field alongside of that rival. They're three better than Auto Glide. Wall drip and a three deep amazing mark. Rivetage is the trailer down the back stretch is a decent tempo to chase. 23 seconds flat the first quarter set by Cannaval who gets a breather down the back side and the leading margin has decreased to just a length and a half. Now it's only about a length. Rabbit Hound happy to get after that leader now. Second own the field three deep following him. Then comes We Miss Arlington is plummeting in the wrong direction. Funny Uncle on the two path joins him passes and claims fourth with wall drip into the turn. Amazing Mark, deep on the course, attempted to advance position, three wide, he's four off the lead, two clear of Autoglide sent along from that position. He's making up ground, though, on the rail, and Rivetage is at the back, coming to the top of the lane. This race went at the 16th pole. Cannaval drops anchor, he's done. Own the field in the pink jacket, kicks on. Rabbit Hound couldn't keep up second. In the third spot is Funny Uncle, and then comes Autoglide, he's rolling home down the outside. Own the field, and Autoglide, two horses. Horse race between these two. Own the field got the jump. Auto Glide trying to tag him. It's going to be real tight. Here it is. Photo finish. Auto Glide on the outside with all the momentum. Maybe if I had to guess, I would say he got it by a narrow margin, but it was very close. Own the field was right there in that photo. Funny Uncle was third. Rabbit Hound fourth. You don't miss, Paul. Eagle Eye. The bookends coming together here. Auto Glide. And the nine trying to hold on, own the field. Who got it? Well, the camera guy's got it on the nine. I am, I'm looking on the other one screen, but Julian Le 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 Peru produced this horse at the right time, and boom goes the dynamite out of the wires. The one looks like he held, got up in the shadow of the wire. You know, this horse got steady down the backside, and it was a heck of a ride on the nine here on the field with Ramon Vasquez. The money was down, and he said, listen, let's go for broke here. And when Otto Glide got out and Julian hit him left-handed, Wow, he responded in a big way, and looks like he got up in the shadow of the wire. I, you right there, that pop. It's close because mm. you know what? That inside always gets that advantage, but the angle's funky. It always first. is funky, yeah. And while it looked like Auto Glide got there, it also appears that he may have got the worst of the bob. Like yeah. his head was up while Owen the field was down, but he may have already been in ahead enough where it didn't make a difference and it doesn't make a difference it is the one auto glide one nine three eight making up all that real estate in the stretch running to the first wire yeah it, that's tough to do this horse i was thinking man he's really running and you know the four or the other horse i liked in here just cut out the fracks you could tell right out of the beginning was trying to go to the front end and it was just not happening but wow great compton's having a really good mm -hmm. meet polter yesterday auto glide today Solid, solid couple days. Co-owner, winning trainer, Greg Compton, Julian Leperu on the money. Auto glide back to Aqueduct. Andy, turf racing on tap. It's a good one. A full field of 12 lining up to go six furlongs. 
big prankster, maybe a little over bet at even money. The long shot Isaac Castillo on fan financial district to start off. Yeah, lack of speed is a problem behind this horse, but did run a second behind Shards in the debut. Allied Attack tries the turf for the first time from, for Mike Maker. Yeah, loose lead and a good rail equal to maiden score two back. The number three, Image Equality, goes out for Chris Englehart. So do we give him the benefit of the doubt for the November race? He didn't factor behind several of these, though. He was bad that day. Big prankster over bet for the Clement Barn with Dylan Davis. Yeah, never uh, really. I, I Listen, got ran down by a... Well, I'm just all over the place. Now you got me flustered on that one. The five is Lil Lang, first time in the turf for... Jorge Abreu, the six, Rusi for Jimmy Bond, taking a lot of money. Got the job done, too, back when finally getting on the grass with a nice finishing run. We'll see what happens. The number the seven, today. big turf pedigree for Slam and Gold, first time in the grass with Kendrick aboard. Yeah, people forget, Bar Gold won that Yato back in 2017. It's, it's a turf family, even though she was a dirt horse. The number eight, Please Be Nice, Bill Mott tries to turf for the first time. Uh, looking at the pedigree, you think this horse is really a dirt horse, though, right? When you look at him. So we'll see what he does on the grass. The number nine, Sandrone, goes out. I think maybe Kevin Bond's first starter. Good luck to Kevin on his own. Has figures that fit in here. It's hard to trust, but maybe this horse can pop up and run well at a big price. Long shot, Creesa, that you're a little interested in. The horse should get a little bit of pace to run in it and had trouble in that November race. My top choice, the number 12, Sinful Dancer on the turf, David Figaro and Trevor McCarthy. That race, three starts back, was just fine. And in here, is getting overlooked right now at 21 to 1. The speedy, icy flavor, John Kimmel and Jose Liscano. Won the first two sprint uh, turf races way back when in California. We'll see what happens today getting back on the green. The number four big prankster debuted in the turf, ran a respectable race. My concern with this horse, Paul, is that she may be better on the front. He may be better, excuse me, on the front end. I think he's talented, but he might have trouble. He's going to have trouble making the lead here. Yeah, I think that would be the biggest concern here for this horse as well. And took advantage, too, of that muddy track back in December to getting the maiden win there. When you go back to this horse's turf debut, Chris couldn't get past, woke up quick. And when you look at this field as a whole, only one horse besides the winner has come back to win, and that horse won on dirt. Well, it's because this race was run at the end of turf season. No, but <laughs> they just haven't had a chance to yeah, get back on the turf. That's a little unfair. These are They were two-year-old maidens, so <sighs> let's give them a chance to try to get back on the turf. Ball. Uh, I just feel like a horse like this, I don't know. I think two to one's short. I think it's too short a price as well. We'll see what the MIG thinks as we head over to the MIG, MIG Leary. Yeah, guys, uh, listen, the four full prank, uh, big pranks, are, excuse me, looks terrific. I mean, he's coached great. He's been training at Pace and Park all winter. It's a track that lends itself to putting a lot of foundation into horses. I prefer others. I can see why he, you know, is taking money. He did run big in the turf on debut. Um, I'm more interested in the seven, Slam and Gold, that full to uh, coinage, uh, who's a stakes winner on turf. Got a very deep pedigree going back to the Broman's Foundation, Mayor Anti Spend. And I did watch this horse work on the turf last summer in Saratoga before he ever started. I was out in the morning with John Kimmel, and his work on the turf was nothing short of sensational. He finished his last eighth of a mile uh, as fast as you're going to see a horse finish in a workout. Uh, you know, I think he'll probably be better for a race, but I had been waiting for John to put this horse on the turf for a long time, so Slam and Gold will be my top selection. The other John Kimmel runner, uh, Icy Flavor, his turf record is strong. I mean, he won an open company in California sprinting on the turf. You know, obviously last time he lost a rider uh, after stumbling as bad as you're ever going to see or stumble leaving the gate and he has speed he should be forward and get a good trip the 12 sinful dancer he looks terrific this is a horse that have been training in aiken south carolina all winter full disclosure david figaro and i are best friends since we're 10 years old and he is a tremendous horseman and i do think this horse is going to outrun his odds he's got to work out some kind of a trip from that outside and hopefully not get caught too wide but sinful dancer i think is a live long shot jk Richie, I, I'm on the seven slam in gold as well. Yeah. No, I, I'm glad you told me that other story about watching him work on the turf. That makes me feel good. Andy also mentioned the turf pedigree. The one thing about this turf pedigree is, yes, this horse is a, a full to coinage. It was a good turf horse. But this horse is also in the same family of who, a horse we saw yesterday that was very impressive, Spirit of St. Louis, right? Spirit of St. Louis, a half to bar of gold. So while bar of gold was really good on the dirt, she does have some turf pedigree running through her veins. I think Slam and Gold's going to appreciate the switch. And if you look back, this horse ran a 70 on the dirt as a two-year-old. Um, if this horse can make any improvements 
on the turf as a turf horse and with that age from two to three, I think she could be right there. Uh, he could be right there, excuse me, on the grass. I, I like the seven slam and gold, and you're getting six to one. Yeah, it, even though Bar of Gold is known as a dirt horse, she was very effective on the turf, and it's a turf family through and through. She was more of a, an anomaly. It's kind of like that Zenyatta, not to compare the talents, and that Zenyatta's family was really a turf family and not. Interesting, I like the 12 here. And one thing I think of a sinful dancer, I don't love the outside post, but there's enough speed in here that this field could get stretched out a little bit, which should allow the 12 to not get caught super wide in here. So that's the one I went to, the long shot. You had mentioned Creesa as your long shot play here. Yeah, when you look back at Kreese's last race, I just feel like that he didn't get the best of trips last time out either. He kind of got bounced around in the turn, then he had to stop before the 16th pole. He's got a number of races here that make him playable here, and like you said, there should be some pace in here for him to run at, and if they can get a little uh, strung out and he can find a spot in here, he can run, so I think... The concern with him is the switch from the Dave Donk barn to a lower percentage barn, but you're getting paid. I think the key to Crease's last race was that there was an enormous speed, a lot of speed signed on in paper, and as usual, it was an incredibly slow pace, and he just had no chance to close as they were coming home. They went basically 23 quarters around the track. Closers can't win under those circumstances. It's a tough road to hoe when, when you see that happen, and you know you have to take that into consideration a little bit, but I think today he'll, he'll find himself a good spot in here behind some of those that want to go out early on. Another problem with Big Prankster is that besides the fact that he might be a horse that needs the lead to win, and he's just not getting it in all likelihood, there are just considerably faster horses in here. Um, they're betting him, even though he ran well on the turf, and he could win. I, I, listen, I picked him third. I'm not going to be shocked if he wins, but they're betting him off a of dirt form as well as turf form, so you're getting bad value in here, and I just think there's too much going on in this race to take two to one on him. Yeah, it's tough to take, and you know, you usually see that often sometimes the opposite way, where they're betting turf form on the dirt, and in this case, they're doing it with the dirt to the turf, and when you look at his maiden race, he took full advantage of that track last time out, too, so you take that into consideration as well, and it's just two to one is just not a good value. Value on him. Rusi is currently the second choice for Jimmy Bond. I mentioned Kevin Bond. This is actually Kevin's second starter, number nine. Sandrone, both Kevin and his brother Ryan, who have been working with their dad for many, many years. They're going off on their own, and we wish the two of them a lot of luck. They obviously have learned from a very good trainer and their father, Jimmy, but also they have been instrumental in any successes the Bond Barn has had for years. So uh, they're not neophytes in the game, and I wish both of them a lot of success. They're good guys. They work hard, and we hope to see them doing well. Whether or not Sandro can win here remains to be seen, but I think Kevin will have his day in the sun. Yeah, and, and to be honest, I mean, they did such a great job day in and day out, you know, with the operation, and it's, you know, a good thing to see them getting some horses and being able to be on their own. Yeah, we'll see how things go for them as they load in a full field of 12, and nothing more the bet betters like than an opportunity to get some prices in here. You and I interested in some prices towards the outside, a lot of interest in the seven, slam and gold, trying the turf for the first time, a whole lot going on in these races. There will be some trips. There will be some traps. There will be some fun. Chris Griffin has the call of race number five here at the Big A. Simple dancer to the outside. Rusi. Sinful dancer. Come in, girl. Is in. All set. And they're off. Speed towards the outside from Sandrones. Right out front. Also, there is icy flavor in the early mix in between horses. Here comes a little Lang to join these early leaders. Sandrone and now a little Lang. They're going to be one, two with three wide. That's icy flavor tightly at the rail. That's going to be allied attack. Up on the far outside, it's a snug hold on Sinful Dancer. Nowhere to go, but it's four wide as they move up the back stretch in between horses. Rusi's trying to muscle on through is now taking a challenging fifth. Also in a tight spot is Creesa. Nowhere to go, bottled up in between rivals at the rail. Big Prankster, they're followed by Slam and Gold as they are tightly bunched their mid-pack. Second to last, image of quality and the trailer. 
Please Be Nice, a two-way battle for the front, and they went 21-4 and four for the opening quarter mile. Little Lang and Sandrone, they throw it on as Icy Flavor is going to tip out three wide. Allied Attack is looking for a way through. Little Lang has kicked towards the inside. Sandrone is right there. Here comes the run from Icy Flavor. Rusi is running on. Big Prankster, a lot of horse nowhere to go, is down towards the inside looking for a seam. It is now Icy Flavor who gets the jump. Icy Flavor, Rusi looks like the main danger. They're the top two. Icy Flavor and oncoming Rusi is getting closer. Icy Flavor almost there. Rusi can Continues to chase. Icy Flavor gets the victory over Rusi. Then came Allied Attack is in a photo with Little Lang and Big Prankster in one minute seven and four. Well, turf sprint season's upon us, and it looks like the number 11 getting it done. Icy Flavor needed a lot of work up front. You know, 107 and four. You see that time, and think people think about dirt racing and how quick it is. It's, you know, it's a firm turf course. It's not that fast a time, but a nice performance by this one for John Kimmel getting it done. Yeah, it was interesting in here, too, because, you know, if you look at the first two turf sprints of this horse's career, and even the third start back in November, this horse wanted to be on the lead. And, and he raided here. a bit here. Yeah. yeah, he ended up raiding nicely, comfortably, got a nice three-wide trip. And when Jose tipped him out, you know, he had some nice finishes. He drifts nice a bit here. Yeah. Um, I feel like he's well clear of the six, but watch him sort of come across. And you are, I think, going to see the rider hesitate a bit on the six. Yeah. Won't be surprised to see him claim... Um, so we'll probably have a too long inquiry if they do. I think he was clear though, Paul. Yeah, I think he was clear too at this point when it happened. And you can see here Javier, uh, Javier Castellano come into the picture with the six, but right now you've got Jose Lascano in the front. The overbet favorite, the number four in this race, big prankster, getting stopped a little bit on the inside. Um, had a little bit of trouble in the stretch. A little bit unlucky not to be able to get through down inside as well. And it was a race where, you know, the pace seemingly fast, though we see these kind of paces on the turf, but a lot of the speeds kind of hung around at the end. We didn't see any big runs. Your horse, Creesa, made a little bit of a run at the end, and there is not surprisingly an objection. Creesa got left in here, made a little bit of a run towards the end in there, and there is an objection. Uh, I, I imagine the inquiry will take uh, way longer than it should, but probably not one where you're going to see a change. Yeah, I don't believe so either, but we've been here before, and we've seen well, it does take time. We're seeing these inquiries yeah. taking a lot of time lately. We'll take a look at the head-on. The head-on's a little unclear because you are going to see him cross over. Yeah. And, you know, uh, Javier Castellano, he's a little more experienced. Uh, so he's been around. He knows how to act. He went to the Migliori School of Acting on jockeys. <laughs> and it's fair. This horse came over, but I just think he was clear, Paul. If we can show the pan again, I just feel like this horse was clear when this happened. Yeah, I feel like he didn't bump into him at all, and I feel like he was clear by a length when he, he definitely didn't move. make contact. Yeah, so I don't know how this is going to look, but when you look at it from the pan view, you can see right now Jose Lascano in those white and red silks with the red cap. He's going to the front. Javier Castellano's coming up on the outside in the blue silks. He's about two lengths clear at this point. He's, hit, he's hitting him righty. Um, now he might go a little bit to the left hand. He does come out. I feel like he was clear. Uh, Stewards will look at it. I'm glad they're looking at it. Yeah. The fans should know they're looking at it. There is an objection. Richie, you see it differently than I do? No, uh, Andy, I, I think it's undeniable that the horse drifted and, and drifted fairly considerably, but it felt to me as though he was always just clear and you're allowed to take any path on the racetrack as long as you're clear. Javier did uh, alter course a bit towards the, was it? No, it wasn't Javier, was it? Um, yeah, Javier did alter course down towards the inside. and But he, he, he might have sold it, but he didn't sell it well enough. You got to let your... Uh, butt hit the saddle, <laughs> bounced once, and really put on a show. <laughs> yeah. I really think that Richie kind of missed his calling. He, he really needs to have a jockey school for how to sell a, sell a foul. Uh, I remember getting put up once years ago for a lot of money when a horse, it was borderline at best, but my man, the MIG, he understood what he needed to do to have a chance to get put up. And listen, it's part of the game. If a jockey can find a way to sell it, all the better for him. The problem is you don't want to overdo it and cost yourself a placing in doing so. In this case, it didn't matter. Good that they're looking at it. Don't blame Javi for claiming. Very unlikely this horse will come down. Yeah, I agree with you 100% on this. I think it should not take too long, but you never know around here. Richie, I don't want a big finder's fee when you start the Migliori School, but after you make your first million, I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I, I'll definitely cut you in. You know, listen, guys, it's a jockey's responsibility, whether it's the, the rider that is trying to sell the foul or the rider that's, you know, letting a horse drift a little bit, to give 100% and more 
to their connections and to the people wagering on the horses. It, you, you have to do everything you can. And if there's a little loophole or a little place you could take advantage, it's incumbent upon you to do so. You can never get mad at a rider for taking a shot and claim and foul. In this particular case, I really feel like the winner was clear. I, I think we're all on the same page here. And I couldn't agree more, Paul, with that situation. If a steward falls for a jockey selling it, that's on the steward. That's not on the jockey. The jockey's job is to try to find a way to get a win for the betters, for the connections as well. Yeah, I mean, I just think at the end of the day, when, when you look at this race and you look at what panned out, he was clear, and despite the fact that there was a little bit of acting going on with... I, I, I told you it would all it would take too long. This is ridiculous. Yeah, this is, They're spending this much time looking at it, to be yeah, honest with you. This is the way it's been going. No, we had a, a non situation the first race yesterday they must have looked at for at least five minutes i'm not exactly sure what they think is going to change it's the right thing to claim you see javi he's selling it to jimmy bond but jimmy bond's <laughs> listening and going javi i've been around a long time i appreciate you claiming buddy but we're not getting put up yeah, i think he's smart enough to know by now <laughs> he's happy to have a little yeah, extra yeah, juice little here and a little time. bit of a chance uh, and i think that uh, rusi ran fairly well because we said this was not a race that really came back the no. Speed did well here. Yeah, despite what the fractions say on the board, speed did well. And well, the, fra the fractions, it's not that. Those are not no, particularly yeah, fast saying, fractions. Fast. And it looks like we have no change. We have no change. Um, we, we have no change. But there is going to be a change here on the set, for better or worse, and probably for better. <laughs> <laughs> Both Acacia Clement <laughs> and Sarah Abad, we will be replacing Paul and I, but we've enjoyed the first yeah. five races, enjoyed this week as well. A lot more action to come, though. Just going to be a new team here at Aqueduct as America's Day at the Races continues. You're watching America's Day at the Races on FS2. Glad to have you with us as, uh, yes, there has been a little bit of change up here on the set. Acacia Colon, Sarah El Badwi taking over for the rest of the way. Sarah, we just had the first of the turf races of the day and uh, great to have turf sprinting back in action as well. The Phillies sadly off the turf yesterday, but great to see the boys sprinting on the grass today. Yeah, absolutely. And a nice win by Icy Flavor, a horse that has mainly been on the lead in the past, was able to show that he could rate a little bit today, able to get the victory. 
Jose Lascano in the saddle. There was that objection. Stewart's taking some time to look at the stretch, deciding no change in the order of finish. So Icy Flavor over the number six, Rusi, there in race number five. And Icy Flavor was this horse, Sarah, that as you mentioned, it used his speed prior and looked like he was going to be very exciting when he first came here to the East Coast and running a New York bread company moving to John Kimmel's barn. And then he switched to the dirt and he just never really kind of took that step forward. And it looks like getting back to the turf was really what he was waiting for all along. Yeah, absolutely. This one I have to uh, not far now, a horse who had shown a lot of speed and success on the grass. And he actually didn't run that badly on dirt, but it seems as though turf is really his calling. It'll be exciting to see where they point him after this. 11, 6, 2, 5. Tough trip along the rail for your favorite for the prankster turning on to race number six. We stay with the New York Reds. This one on the main track sprinting for the Phillies going seven for longs and the number two calling an audible your favorite at five to two and look she's been close she's run good figures she's just not a winning type. No, and it, there's more upside with some of the other entrants in this race, and I think you could go in a different direction than her, especially at a short price. If you're going to try to go against the favorite, could bode well. If you're playing the cross-country pick five sequence, it kicks off here in the six at Aqueduct, this maiden special weight. There are two maiden special weights in the sequence, in fact, from the big A races six and eight, and three races taking place at Oaklawn Park in that sequence. I hope you'll play it. It's always a lot of fun when you can have some excitement, different racetracks, all in one wager altogether. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great wager to be a part of. I like that we've had them more consistently with Oaklawn being a part of it. Get a little Keeneland mixed in there as yeah. well sometimes. It's been fun. We saw some nice stakes action yesterday at Oaklawn Park in the Oaklawn Handicap Important Race for older horses. And the big question coming in is, could Skippy Longstocking pair back-to-back -back victories together? He had an outer post for Safi Joseph Jr. and Jose Ortiz, but Jose did such a good job, Sarah, in getting him to, to run up nicely into his hands and to settle in that perfect stocking spot. Really did, and it was kind of a surprise that he was tracking his own stable mate who ended up taking the lead early on in this race, but he kicked on very nicely in here. He earned a career best 107 buyer speed figure. And we talked about it yesterday, a horse that didn't cost quite that much already winning so much for his connections and really finally putting those two wins together back to back and having that success be a little bit more consistent now going forward. A big effort from him pulling away to get the victory over a beautifully bred um, horse for Brad Cox in there too. And Highland Falls still lightly raced, but he's still figuring things out. But it was Skippy Longstocking, the five-year-old son of Exaggerator. He cost 37000 and has banked... Well, he was 1.6 million coming into this race, so he has definitely made a lot of it, uh, a lot for his connections and a lot of excitement, a lot of fun as well. Taking the Oakland handicap, a 1.25 million dollar grade two, uh, and look, it's pretty wide open as far as the older horses are concerned. My question with Skippy Longstocking was. Is he kind of a cut below some of the better older horses? Maybe he is stepping forward at the right time. Well, maybe a, he, he was a cut below some of the horses that are now off to the breeding right. shed. And he was the one that had really faced the tougher company in the past and run okay, sort of behind the top contenders in those divisions. But now maybe with some of them retiring, he can sort of take up that mantle. Skippy Long stocking with a nice win yesterday as we head back over to our Oakland set. Paul and Rajiv with us. Guys, I know, uh, oh, thankfully it's a little bit warmer for you today, but despite the cold <laughs> weather, what a great day at Oakland yesterday. Yeah, thanks, Acacia. Thanks, Sarah. It was an absolutely beautiful day yesterday, at least come to the racing side. And it actually warmed up when we got towards, layered to the, uh, towards the card and Skippy Long stocking put on a show, Rajiv. Yeah, he delivered. I mean, he came in with some question marks because he had had that one bad race in the Pegasus World Cup. He bounced back in the Challenger with an improved effort. But yesterday we saw probably the best version of Skippy. He was really um, a powerful, convincing victory. And I think very satisfying for Mr. Saf is Safi Joseph. So let's get to the post parade here in race number five. This will start your late pick five here. And we do got a couple scratches. Late scratch of the eight here, Sharp Attack, who had some issues in the pack. Now this is a post parade a little bit on, on, on delay. So you got a couple minutes to get to your Naira Betts account to get your wagers in. Right now the two, Tory Street is your favorite here for Penny McPeak as they turn around. Here's Safe Cracker Sue. 
Yeah, safe car Kasu, six at this level last time, but top connections in his corner. Here's the favorite here, Raj. Yeah, Le Julian Leperu looking for back-to-back -back victories on the card. Well, Cherokee, Rocco Bowen, and Timmy Martin. Yeah, this long shot definitely is going to be a pace factor, at least. Scratch the four. He's Here's the five. She's a shenanigan. I think this is the one Philly that might be closing late. Yeah, if, uh, stretch runner closed up to be fourth at this level. Got beat seven lengths last time. Well, John Horan pulls off another big upset, and this horse is getting bet a little bit, 13-1, to 1, Texas Hottie. Yeah, Hattie. first off to claim. Didn't show much in two lifetime side, but switches hands to John Horan. Dixie Rag for Kenny Jansen. Yeah, Dixie Rag's a big long shot in here. Got beat 29 lengths at this level going long last time. Like I said, the eight was a late scratch. The nine, the big Calhoun are now getting bet here. Yeah, horse that Paulie likes and looks good out on the track. This one is taking a big drop from 50 down to 20. Yeah, it's going to be very interesting whether the, the nine can out quit. As you see the 11, the 12 on the outside, Red Volta. We've seen Kelsey Har aggressive earlier in the day, Rajiv. Yeah, Carlos Barbosa has to be aggressive if she wants to get in at least get in front of uh, Kelsey here in Red Volta. Yeah, and Kelsey put Red Volta on the lead last time, and it, the horse was an improved effort, just missing at this level by a neck, getting um, caught in deep stretch. As you can see, the horses are roaming around again. You still got a couple minutes as the pick five pool is getting upwards towards $85,000. Then we got to go to Mr. Jonathan Kinchin to get some little tips in this race. JK, who would you use to get out of this race to start your pick five? Yeah, I, mean, I think you probably need the two, but I'm going to look for a little bit of a better price. I'm going to go with the nine, the big Calhouna. When you're looking at this kind of lower level, one of the things that I like to try to find is a horse that's shown at least a little bit of talent. And to me, you can equate talent to speed, early speed, tactical speed, and the nine has that. Now, the nine likes to stop as well and doesn't have much speed at the end of the races. I'm hoping a little bit of more class relief, a little bit more seasoning for this horse could potentially help this one find himself – uh, herself, excuse me, at the wire. I don't love her. I just like her price significantly more than the two. And like I said, I'm looking for a horse that can just be forward in here. And it feels like the nine is one of those types of horses, the 12, the two. Uh, the three horses that are being bet in here all make the most sense. I'll go with the nine. Yeah, I can see where he's going. Listen, I changed my pick from the nine to the, to the five because I didn't want to jinx the nine in here. But when you look at the big Calhuna, Rajiv, here's the horse that got left two times in her first in her first two starts in the mud she solved that last couple times and she's shown some speed now she's been behind miss shipman's dance lady moscato she's been behind some nice fillies yeah she's uh, getting a much needed class relief here <laughs> and sometimes that drop in class will make you last a bit longer in the stretch which has been her biggest trouble she's been um fading in this in the stretch but those against tougher competition yeah um now it's it's going to be a, a softer pace uh, compared to what she's been running against with the class drop and um, you get also a seven pound weight allowance with an apprentice riding. So there's a lot of things in, in favorable for her, but man, she is getting hammered at the windows. Yeah, she, she is. At 10 to one on the morning line is down to four to one. And if you're looking for a price in this race, because th there's nothing fancy about any of the top contenders. I think a, a sneaky long shot to put in your bets is the number 11, Amaru, because this filly has never gotten a fair shot sprinting on this level. She was last away and bothered pretty badly in her most recent start. And two starts back, she ran going long. Her debut wasn't that bad, and it was against a much higher competition. So if this race were to collapse with a speed duel between the 9 and potentially the 12, Red Volta, number 11, Amaru, could be a horse that could capitalize on that. You got a hot jockey, too, with Nick Juarez, who got his 1,000th win the other day and had a hat trick. Let's go to Matt Dinnerman. Good luck if you're alive in the early pick five and starting the late pick five. And uh, we're off. The big Calhouna put into play early. Texas Hottie joins her and Red Volta from the far outside, not far off. The big Calhouna in front by three quarters of a length. Red Volta is second and Texas Hottie is third, easing off the top pair down the back stretch. Wild Cherokee joins her from the inside. A gap of two to a line of four. Moro is there. She's a shenanigan. Tory Street and Safe Cracker Sue. Dixie Rag in another zip code. Well behind the rest of the field as they go into the turn. Match race on the lead. The big Calhouna inside. 
Red Volta outside. The big Calhuna with a half length edge on Red Volta, who's still right there sticking to her. A big gap of seven back to Amoro sent along with She's a Shenanigan. Texas Hottie has lost position, needs to turn it around. Tory Street is trying to mount a rally in the four pass. She is moving at the top of the lane, but has plenty of ground to make up. The big Calhuna putting away Red Volta at the top of the lane and opens up the lead to three. Now it's four. The big Calhuna well ahead. Red Volta second. Tory Street picking up pieces on the outside. But the big Calhuna coming to the 16th pole still is a big lead. It's six lengths, maybe even seven. And the big Calhuna with a big effort. The big Calhuna strolling in under Carlos Barboza. Tory Street was second. Photo for the show, though. Texas Hottie and Red Volta. Well, good job by you and JK. By the way, you're on fire today, my friend. Um, 10 to 1 down to 2 to 1, and this horse jogged. And Carlos Barbosa did the right thing. He committed to the front end, and the race was over. Yeah, the price wasn't as appealing at the end, down to 2 to 1 from a 10 to 1 morning line, but she won like a 6 to 5 shot. Yeah. Um, she, Carlos Barbosa took it to them early, used the speed, and, and he has a lightweight, 7 pound weight allowance. And that was a great formula for success today as she just dominates this race. I got to give credit to my man, Carlos Santa Maria. He's one of the best dressed cowboys that comes in here all the time. One of the nicest trainers you'll ever meet. Gets his first win on the meet in Philly by Maximus Mischief. This is a big Calhuna. We'll start your late pick five and end your late pick five. But when we come back, we have the cross country and we have two pretty ladies to bring us back to America's Day at the races. in front as they pass the 16th pole. Volatil, victorious in the Vanderbilt. One by two legs. Tremendous amount of talent uh, with his win in the Vanderbilt, as well as a couple of his wins at Churchill Downs. Ran unbelievably fast. Uh, you know, very special family to me. Perfect star for two-year-old sales. Just a gorgeous horse and throwing very athletic horses that I think will run. Victorious in the Vanderbilt. He's a running son of a gun. Papa Cap now has the advantage. A graded stakes winning two year old. Grade one Breeders' Cup juvenile runner up at two. Multiple grade one placings at three. Finished in the top four in 11 out of 12 starts. And from here on in, it's just a matter of how far Papa Cap, an easy winner of the best pal. Papa Cap, standing at Walmack. Racetrack Television Network brings you every race, every race from every track, every track on every screen, every, screen, every, day. every day. With monthly packages starting as low as $5, RTN gives you great value and access to more live HD streaming and race replays than anyone. Visit RTN.TV today to sign up and watch on almost any device, including Roku and Amazon Fire. RTN has packages that start at $5 per month. We're back on America's Day at the Races. Horses on the track for race number six. New York Bed Maiden Special Weight. And there is Aunt Yola. She's the horse to be based on what she's done so far in her first two starts. But finishing second last time out at a shorter price, I don't know. I don't really trust her. You say aunt or aunt? Aunt. Oh, see, I have always said aunt. Aunt. Here's calling an audible. <laughs> we'll have to ask her what she prefers. Yeah. Um, look, she's had her chances, but you could say that maybe she's been the most consistent of anybody else in this field. Five of her seven races in the money finishes. Here's Equinox. A horse that really was out of it early last time out, far back and did steady towards the inside. I just wonder if she's that good overall. Not the smoothest trip in that last start. Here's five to two for Linda Rice. Another one that has been consistent, just kind of consistently average overall. She's at least hit the board in most mm -hmm. of her starts. 
was behind calling an audible last time. There's she's a natural. This is one that's wheeling back on short rest. This one's cutting back slightly, but 0 for 22 maidens aren't usually for me. First time starter, Purpose. Not a barn that generally cranks their horses up to run first time out, but in this field could be a little bit interesting. Getting a big warm up from Javier Castellano and their second time starter, Margot Treasure. Kind of a question mark what to do with the number she earned first time out at Gulfstream Park as she now gets in with the state breads. A couple horses came out of that race and regressed in their mm -hmm. next start. And it does seem the winner of that race, Sedona, given her pedigree, $2 million curlin filly, already kind of christened as a future star. So we'll see what Margot Treasure does in her second start. There is aunt, aunt, whatever you'd like to call her, Yola, a daughter of Run Happy. She did improve in her second start. The third place finisher, Peony, came back to win in her next race with a 66 buyer speed figure. We're taking in a quick pause to welcome in some more viewers. Welcome to our viewers on SNY. You're watching America's Day at the races just in time. We're about five minutes away from race six here at Aqueduct. Acacia come on alongside Sarah El -Bad. We have We have Richard Migliori with us here in New York and the rest of our team out at Oakland as well. Sarah, New York Red Maiden special weight for the Phillies coming up in this sixth race. And there's Aunt Yola who really took a step forward in her second start. She did. I mean, she showed that forward progression from her debut to her second start on March 22nd, fourth first time out after taking back at the start. But here she sat a little bit closer, even though she broke a little bit slowly yet again. She was more mid-pack in this race and didn't lose as much position early on, rallying to finish in second, and ends up running well in here, taking that step up from a 51 buyer on debut to a 60 in her second start. So you love seeing that forward move from a horse, and maybe it's indicative that she could make another forward move. I just don't love that she hasn't broken out of the gate all that quickly in either start. She was kind of grinding along last time. The winner had a bit more of a turn of foot in the stretch. We'll see what the favorite can do in her third start. For more, let's welcome in champion jockey Richard Migliori. Richie, what are your thoughts on the favorite here? Yeah, listen, I, I like everything I saw from the favorite Aunt Yola. I mean, just really nice, free moving, galloped off nicely, uh, handling everything well. Should be primed for her best in her third. But I do think the rail and her propensity to break just a little bit slow could be problematic. She's going to have to work out a trip. If she was drawn outside, that's probably where I would land it. The fact that she has the rail, I am gravitating to the outside runners. The seven uh, purpose, this is a long elegant filly out of commissioner beautiful swinging gate to her really like what it so she's dappled out um, i think she looks like a very classy individual that i do think we'll be hearing from the eight margot treasure i went back and forth between the seven and the eight margot treasure but the fact that margot treasure has a run under her belt gets the far outside post which i feel is an advantage going the seven furlongs uh i i think that you know also the fact that she ran in open company last time got a good buyer speed figure now you think there's twenty thousand foals roughly born in north america every year there are about a thousand that are new york breds so it considerably cuts down the gene pool that she's going to run against and i think the fact that she ran so well in open company at gulfstream has a race under a belt particularly at the seven eights distance i'm going to go with margot treasure but i do think that the one if she breaks a little better works out a trip is obviously the horse to beat and the seven purpose really good looking first time starter from jimmy bond Warming up well on the track. Richie, thank you, as we'll see what that first-time starter can do in this field. But you do have a couple other lightly raced fillies, like Margot Treasure, who Richie did land on. And Sarah, you brought up the point in that wondering how that figure from Gulfstream first time out stacks up against Sedona, the winner, the uh, curlin filly out of America that sold for a lot of money and has very high hopes. And this filly broke very slow and she was, she was really far back. I think even more so than it looks like on the chart and um, just on her left lead, very green in that effort as well. So there, there is reason to expect her to improve today. Absolutely. And that was open company. Now mm -hmm. she gets in with the New York breads, but 
But when you look at the number that she earned first time out, there weren't many dirt races on the card that day. So it's tough for figure makers to really evaluate how the courses were playing in those kinds of situations. You had the second, third, and fourth place finishers all regress in their next starts. She was hopelessly last for the majority of that race, and this could be a softer field that she's facing, but I don't think you can take her number first time out and believe that she's necessarily going to duplicate it here, or if she did, if it would be enough to win. See what she does in her second career start. Where did you land, Sarah? Um, I went to Equinox. I don't know how good this horse is, and the answer is probably not very good. But the ride that she got <laughs> last time was just, she had no opportunity. Nothing like being optimistic. Yeah, I know, right? Yeah, it's full of, full of good things to say about her. But look, she was just so compromised last time in that race where she was over a sloppy sealed surface. She was far back early on. She had to steady going into the first, the into the turn where she was behind horses. She doesn't get off the rail until the very late stages of that race and mm -hmm. does a little bit of running to pick up some pieces. And so I think that that last race was better from her than it might seem on paper. I don't know what her ceiling is. It's probably not very high, but I think that you're getting a really nice price on a horse that did have some legitimate excuses last time. Yeah, she is a generous price at the moment at 11 to one and definitely a player getting back onto a fast track. She was against the track two starts back um, in September on that day and just very green in her first couple of starts prior to that. So maybe finding herself in the right spot. Calling an audible to two, it's kind of, we know what she is at this point. She's had seven starts. Five of those have been in the money finishes. Multiple races where she's been beaten a nose ahead, very slim margin. Can she break through in here? Well, you look at her and you say, okay, maybe she's had her opportunities, but only one of them dirt sprinting, which was her last start. However, that was a day where the rail was really good and she was glued right to the rail for the entirety of that race. So I don't want to say that this was some great performance of hers. She's just had uh, plenty of opportunities and there's others with more upside. Lightly raced horses taking most of the attention in race six, New York bred maiden special weight as they load in graduation day for one of these young ladies here. We'll send it up to Chris Griffin for the call race six live at Aqueduct. Margot Treasure, last to load to the outside. And in. All set. And they're off. Five to two breaks very well from in between horses at the rail. Here comes Aunt Yola to be in that early mix and now assumes the command. It's Aunt Yola, the eight to five favorite is a neck in front. Five to two is stalking right here for a second. Three wide is purpose is now patiently ridden here is just stalking the two pace setters. Calling an audible is at the rail is in fourth. Then in behind that comes Margot Treasure at the back. It's Equinox with, she's a natural. They're the two trailers, 23. And three for the opening quarter mile at Yola is just doling out the fractions, just cruising along here for Trevor McCarthy. It's an easy lead so far. Mild pressure here towards the outside as Jose Lescano now gives the hurry up to five to two, and that's going to make at Yola pick up the pace up front as they're well into the far turn now and still a half length between the top two. Calling an audible is in hand, is right in behind. The battling duo under drive is purpose there from third. Margo's trying to make up some running room. It's Margo Treasure up on the outside here from fifth. Also trying to rally on. She's a natural equinox. Is about five off the lead. They reach the top of the stretch. 47 and three, the half mile time. And here comes the challenge towards the outside from five to two. Not going away is Aunt Yola. And here comes calling an audible is just trying to make up that margin. Five to two has got the lead. Aunt Yola comes right back, calling an audible, trying to catch them both inside the final 16th. Five to two, Aunt Yola. Five to two, Aunt Yola. Five to two gets the victory at nine to two. Aunt Yola there second, then came calling an audible. In one minute, 24. And four. Five to two. She had a similar look of calling an audible where she's been right there and been close in her starts, but not able to seal the deal. Today, though, she was able to outgame the favorite. And this was a race that was really dominated forward as no one was making up much ground from the back. And this was a situation where you had a couple of horses that had had their opportunities, but some of those new faces are the ones with a lot of upside. They didn't really show up. So then you're left with horses that we know who they are. And apparently that's enough to get the job done today.
Yeah, disappointing effort from the number eight, Margot Treasure, just never really kicked in late. And the first time starter, Purpose ran on a little bit, probably, as you heard from Richie, needed the race and from a barn that's not typically with them cranked up, ready to roll at first asking. As far as the favorite, Chris Griffin said Aunt Yola, so we'll go with that. Aunt Yola, she, she, had, she had things her own way on the front end. <laughs> no, she really did. And I mean, she broke so much better today than she had in her two prior starts, which was a really good sign since that she was going to be out of the one hole. And here, Trevor did everything right. Put her right forward, gave her that opportunity to be successful. Uh, she just got run down by another horse. Five, one, two, and seven, five, nine to two on the number five. Five to two, it's a little confusing with the name. Philly by Honor Code getting the win for Linda Rice. We'll bring you prices and more when we come back. Stay with us on America's Day at the Races. You're watching America's Day at the races as Jose Lascano, very familiar sight, goes into the winner's circle for a Linda Rice trainee, five to two, winning race six. That's two wins today for Jose. Yeah, we've seen this movie before, mm -hmm. and he was able to keep this horse in good position early on in this race, one that had been fairly consistent in the majority of her starts so far. And with some of those new faces that look to have some potential upside just didn't really show up today, it was the consistent types that were able to round out your trifecta with what we'd seen from them so far. Five to two, who'd been close, similar to calling an audible. She finished behind calling an audible last time out, able to turn the tables on that one today, calling an audible, picking up yet another in the money finish. Your favorite, Aunt Yola, having to settle for second. Five, one, two, seven. Time for some stakes action here at Aqueduct. The plenty of grace, unfortunate with some scratches. Silver skillet going to an allowance on Thursday. So we have a compact field in here and marvelous mod, no surprise the heavy favorite New York bred making her first start of her six year old season but she has been very consistent throughout her career she has maybe a little bit concerning that she only ran once in mm -hmm. 2023 and is now coming back for her 2024 debut but she has been that consistent type in state bread company and even against open company as well absolutely we'll talk a little bit more about the field with the plenty of grace in a moment but as we touched on earlier in the show an important day going on today for the permanently disabled jockeys fund the telethon going 
going on, you can call, contribute. There's the number, 1-844-884-PDJF. Over $205,000 raised so far. A big thank you to everybody who has called in and contributed. And you could have an opportunity to talk to some current and former jockeys uh, throughout the afternoon. As Richie, we bring you in for this conversation. The work that the PDJF is so important uh, to our riders who have been injured on the track in what is a very tough game and often without enough support. Yeah, absolutely. I was talking with Nancy LaSala, who works tirelessly on behalf of the PDJF, uh, the uh, wife of former rider Jerry LaSala. And with the lack of a mechanism that creates a steady uh, flow of money to help support these men and women that have had life-altering injuries, not just career-ending injuries, but life-altering injuries, and they have battles they have to face every day, challenges they have to overcome every day, it would be really nice anybody that has the ability or the means and the wherewithal to you know donate uh, to the PDJF and maybe get an opportunity to speak to a Hall of Fame rider or somebody so when you call you know find out who you're talking to and uh, again just an integral part of uh, taking care of roughly 60 riders that uh, the Permanently Disabled Jockey Fund uh, cares for on a monthly basis. And hopefully at some stage there will be that mechanism created that will create a flow of income uh, to, to help these riders. And we won't have to rely as much on charitable donations. But I would ask anybody that can, please give. It would be greatly appreciated. So well said, Richie, a permanently disabled jockeys fund does such great work supporting uh, our riders who, who have been injured. And as Richie said, you know, we will never tell anybody how to give Sarah, but if you are able, please do consider calling in or donating. I think calling in is fun because like Richie said, you could have the opportunity to be speaking to a Hall of Fame rider. Yeah, you never know who's gonna be on the line over there. Of course, if you're able, we'd really appreciate if you could chip in for that because it's such a good cause we have all these jockeys that are giving their basically livelihoods over to uh, the racetrack and for our entertainment for the sport and of course they love doing it as well but nice to see that we have something in place as an opportunity for them we're a dysfunctional family but a family <laughs> nonetheless here in racing and have to support our own so please do consider supporting the pdjf today as the telethon continues live racing also continues from oaklawn park race number Six coming up next. We'll talk a little bit more about it. The late pick four kicking off from Hot Springs after this. Stay with us on America's Day at the Races. Number one is Mo Donegal by Uncle Mo. And they're off in the Remsen. As they come out for the finish, and it's going to be tight here in the Remsen. Mo Donegal. Mo Donegal bearing down on the outside. It's Mo Donegal and early voting, and it is Mo Donegal to win the Wood Memorial. And it will be Mo Donegal to win the test of the champion, the Belmont Stakes. Midlandic made two-year-olds in training. With a catalog of top juveniles by the nation's top sires, this sale has consistently produced graded stakes winners from around the world and on all surfaces, including Kentucky Derby winner Mage, plus 2024 graded stakes winners Kinza, Linda's Gift, Mendelssohn Bay, and Olivia Darling. The phasing Tipton Midlantic May two-year-olds in training sale, May 20th and 21st in Timonium, Maryland. Where will you be? second Nashville dropping out of it and then collusion illusion what a spectacular return for charlatan who will romp in the run happy malibu stakes by four and a half emphatic lengths charlatan ultra impressive it's a new day for a new king Breeding in New York State just got a whole lot greener. Starting in 2026 with two-year-olds and expanding in 2027 to include three-year-olds and up, New York Reds on the Naira circuit will be offered purses matching the race's open company counterpart. That's a nearly 20% increase per race compared to 2023. Bowling season is in full swing. There's still time to take advantage of New York's better-than-ever state bred incentives. Visit naira.com slash nybreds for more info.
Welcome back to Oaklawn Park and America's Day at the Races. Rajiv Miraz along with Paula Duca here. Lafi Pinkai will be back in the driver's seat after this race, and I'll head out to evaluate the horses, and you guys will have a three-man team. But to start the late pick four, we'll start with the one. Scratch the 1A in here. Caballo Feliz, happy horse. City of Clouds goes through for Brad Cox. Yeah, it blinkers off and drops in class after a fifth place finish at a higher level last time. We saw Carl Broberg win one earlier. Heir to Greatness getting a little money. Yeah, Heir to Greatness for the Carl Broberg, a hot trainer, win one earlier. There's the three dog red. Now, Jade Cunningham, she's had a really solid meet. Well, we were saying the four scratch. I like the five a little bit in here. I think this horse can clear. What do you think, Rajiv? Yeah, he's always showed speed. He got in a speed duel last time. Maybe he's looking to get a clear lead up front and settle out there. Here's um, Nicky Juarez. Again, got his thousands win earlier yesterday. Um, big price. Here's Deep State at 25 to 1. Yeah, deep State is a deep closer. Will be looking to make his best running in the stretch. You a ro roller coaster kind of guy? Not, no, not a roller coaster. <laughs> That's <laughs> six to one for Christian Torres. Yeah, this son of curling was fourth last time for twenty thousand. Drops in today for the twelve five tag. Chelsea Dagger goes through an acclaim for Dan Ward, who's very dangerous off the claim. Yeah, and he steps this one up after losing at a lower level in three consecutive races. He bumps him up to the twelve five level. That's a very good point. Julestown off the claim too. Yeah, off the claim for twenty. Didn't do much that day, but drops in big today for twelve five. Here's legendary lore for the Asperson team trying to catch up to. State and Flurry in the owner standings. Yeah, this one it doesn't have much speed early. He'll be looking to save some ground in the first turn and come with a big late run. And Prince was placed first last time via his qualification. Um, you know, but Go Cats did come back to win impressively. You get an eight to one on the outside runner. Yeah, and he's a deep, deep closer. One that, um, but always always comes with a big stretch run. Well. As we look at the gates going up right now for the mile in the 16th race, we're going to go to JK right now. JK, I know you like the 12 a little bit in here, unstable Prince, and horse had a trip last time, but this horse does have some nice kick late in the race. Yeah, and, and look, if you listen to the show, you know I'm not crazy about horses that come from out of it in dirt races. A lot of bad things can happen. But I will say this. I think Unstable Prince deserves to be a shorter price, but being drawn towards the far outside, I think a lot of times people feel like he's going to end up getting another wide trip in here, but I'm fine with him getting a wide trip. I just want him to be able to tuck in on that first turn and save ground. And the fact that he breaks a little bit slow, typically, or has, doesn't have a lot of early speed early, You'd like to think that he'll break away from there, tuck to the rail, save ground on the first turn. Hopefully horses will run in front of him. And at that point, if that thing happens early in the race, I do feel like the 8-1 to one is a bargain on the 12. I'm going to go with the 12 in here and hope he can tuck in in the first turn and that they go very, very fast on the front end. Yeah, I can see it. Listen, this horse has gotten some bad, bad draws. 11 out of 11, 11 out of 12, 11 out of 11. Now draws 12 out of 12 but there's you know one scratch in here so one post in but jk's right this horse has got some um ability um but just needs to save ground now let's get to the favorite the one the straight one in here obviously the one a's out city of clouds blinkers coming off brad cox does not claim a ton of horses but he's been doing it for the flurry stables who are leading right now 21 to 18 over steve asperson and this horse obviously is a player in here right yeah and here's the reason why i picked this horse as my top pick um I think that there is not a lot of speed in there. And other than the number five, Prodigus Bay, I think City of Clouds is going to be sitting just off that speed because he's, even though he's taking the blinkers off, which usually sometimes tames a horse's early speed, he's a sprinter stretching out. He, he was only a length off the lead last time going six furlongs. He, he stretches out to a mile and a 16 today, and I think he's going to be sitting that perfect stalking trip just outside of Prodigus Bay. This race is filled with deep closers. It is. And, um, and I, I feel like the dynamics is going to suit horses that are running on the lead or close to the lead. You, you make such a great point. The two launches from way out of it. The six launches. The seven launches from way out of it. The eight has shown some speed in the past. Um, the nine launches from way out of it you make just a really good point even the 11 and the 12 are two horses 80, that launch 80 percent of wow. this field are deep closers there and there's one clear-cut front runner which is prodigus bay 
Prodigus Bay is likely going to have an easy lead. Um, and while City of Cloud hasn't really done much running on the lead, most of his races sitting just off the lead, those races were sprinting. Yeah. So he has natural speed that, that's going to put him just off the lead. And I know you picked the number five Prodigus Bay and it, it, because he's the lone speed and he has the weight off. And I can see some scenarios where he just gets an easy lead and takes him gate well, to when I, when I looked at this race, you, you could tell the board, right? It was, this is a difficult race. You could probably run this race maybe five, six, seven times and you're going to get a different result. But my thought process was, okay, I know that the five was in for very cheap for 75 non three, probably one of the cheapest horses in here. But then I got to go to, okay, who has the advantage? And I think he's got the pace advantage. Is he good enough to beat this field? I don't know. I just know that I'm going to be in front and I'll take my chances at nine to one. Yeah, every scenario running this race is going to say it's going to be a slow early pace. Yeah. And that's definitely going to impact or hinder the deep closers. I, I can't, there, there's no version of this race that has a pace meltdown. So, um, yeah, I, I, I can see where Prodigus Bay has that advantage. Plus, in addition to that, you're getting way pounds, seven pounds lighter than most of it, the rivals in here. So, um, yeah, I, I can I can definitely agree with you uh, picking that horse. Well, it worked in the last race, right, with, with the nine horse going to the front end with the weight. But the horse ended up being the best, the big Calhuna. You just got to see if Prodigious Bay is the best. Now, let's go to the two in here for Broberg. He won with the first time starter. That was one of your picks. This is a horse that had a bad slot last time, the 11 old 10 hole now draws to the inside. I, I thought this horse was kind of dangerous to two. Yeah, and if I'm Francisco Arrieta here, I'm having to think that there's not a lot of speed in this race. And this horse broke slow last time and put him behind the eight ball. I would be very, very focused on getting a good start because he has the number one position, um, inside yeah, he position. He has inside post. So he, if he can get this horse, bro break sharp out, out the gate, put him in position, probably sitting third behind the, the aforementioned two horses that we spoke about, this horse could be sitting a great trip, saving ground, and, and having first run at the front runners and the jump on the deep closers. So, it, you know, Francisco has to be focused on getting this horse a break better than he did last time. It's almost like, isn't that what Rajiv is, is talking about? Since the 1A was scratched and you have an entry, they'll sometimes move the one. So the one is starting in the middle of the field. So this is going to start two, three, five, six, seven, eight, and then the one. So the one does not have the rail. That's what Rajiv was talking about. Now, you get to some of the other horses as they're going in the gate. Are you going to stick with? Yeah, uh, the C City of Clouds is the horse that I think is going to get the perfect ideal setup. The ball is in the court of Martin Ch Chan. I think he, he's going to be able to dictate how fast Prodigus Bay goes on the front end and when to, to pick up the pressure. And I think that is going to put him in a spot to win this race. Okay, let's go with a 1 5 12 exacta box. You, myself, and JK. Let's go to Matt Dinnerman. I have this late pick five. This starts your late pick four as well. Good luck. Deep state the gray. They've loaded legendary lore one back. Unstable prince to the outside. Here's unstable prince. We're ready to go. And uh, Laroff, Prodigious Bay going towards the lead. He's naturally quickest from the group with Dog Red, who's hustled along. Now he's on a hold here, but Dog Red keen to go on, takes the lead with Prodigious Bay. These two hook up as they hit the clubhouse, turn City of Clouds, Jules Town. They're side by side. Back gate red on the rail. Legendary Lord just passed him to run in the fifth position. Six off the pace, a gap of two to a line of three. Chelsea Dagger, a roller coaster ride, and heir to greatness. Two more to the gray. Deep state, unstable prince at the back of the field with him. Approaching the back stretch from the top pair 
go at it, set a contentious tempo here. Prodigious Bay on a snug hold is a half-length lead on Deep Red, who's asked to concede his speed. He's in the inside there, right there, matching the front runner, Prodigious Bay. And now Deep Red and Prodigious Bay once again are even down the back stretch. A length and a half to Julestown. Gets the garden trip in third. City of Clouds right behind him with legendary lore. Then Chelsea Dagger, a roller coaster ride. A roller coaster ride loses a length on Chelsea Dagger. Comes back at him into the turn, but has nine lengths to gain as they're strong out. Air to greatness along the rail saving ground. Needs to pick it up. And then comes back gate red who's plummeted back with deep state and unstable prints. Around the far turn, Jules Town catches the eye out of the top three. He's moving up nicely, three wide. On the inside, Dog Red has had enough. Prodigious Bay tries to hang around, but there's a wall of horses coming on. Jules Town gets the jump on the rest of the closers. Chelsea Dagger is there. Legendary Lore, he's got a lot of run. He's going to try to split horses. Legendary Lore couldn't get through. He's going to get back to the outside, and far outside is Air to Greatness. Air to Greatness, Legendary Lore's going to have to steady again. It's been a rough trip for him, and Air to Greatness goes on. Air to Greatness got the clear path and runs on to win. Beats Jules Town and Legendary Lore. Chelsea Dagger was fourth. Well, an eventful stretch run, but Carl Boberg with a double on the day here. Air to Greatness, we talked about this horse. Pace developed, and here in the deep stretch in here, there was a little crowding going on. The 11 got the worst of it, but no doubt about the winner of the two. I think the 10 was the one that kind of came out and caused a little bit of friction there between the 11 trying to split horses. Yeah, there was a lot going on. Number 11, legendary loves. Um, Keith Asmussen, he was looking for a way through on the inside. He couldn't get it when the 10 shifted in front of him. Then he tried to angle out and the, the, the 10 shifted paths in front of him again. So we're definitely gonna have an inquiry here. But in the meantime, Francisco Herrera just pointed here to greatness in the clear and he didn't have a straw in his path. And that momentum that he had going forward just propelled him to victory. Yeah, so we got an inquiry here. We'll get you all the news, Acacia Harry, in a little bit. And speaking of propellers, is Andy Serling on that thing? Is he on that the helicopter, Acacia? It, it looks like it's arriving, Paul, and I, I feel like Andy's leaving, so that must be Maggie coming back from Oakland. Oh, it must be. It must be. That's the yes. only logical conclusion. <laughs> Lafitte's probably on there, too. Lafitte is probably <laughs> about to jump on. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's the only logical conclusion I can think of. <laughs> well, somebody's arriving. Uh, of course, In Aqueduct, style. right next door to JFK. <laughs> um, I would like to get on there for my flight down to Florida. Down, back home. We'll meet the field for the Plenty of Grace Stakes Company coming up here uh, for this mile midnight mile. We'll start things off for one of two for Chad Brown. Here's Sunset Louise trying the turf. I mean, the hope is that this horse is going gate to wire in here. I'm not convinced she can run well off Lasix. Here's Spirit and Glory. Stakes win two back. Ran well in that fresh race coming in from Fairgrounds. A little disappointing last time, though. And the number six, New York Red, Marvelous Maud. We haven't seen her in a little while. We only saw her once in 2023, but she is a consistent type, and she has won against Open Company before. That's the fee for the Plenty of Grace compact group of fillies. For more, let's check in Trackset with Richie. Yeah, it's a short but select field, if you will, here for the Plenty of Grace. And honestly, I think the path to the winner's circle is through the Chad Brown runners. The one midnight mile could not look any better. And, and we've seen this consistently. Chad Brown runners off of layoffs, not in need of a race. It's just so good at getting horses fit. I, I like the inside draw. She's my top selection. You, know, you can go back to her Breeders' Cup in 2022, uh, you know, as a two-year-old. And that pointed out, you know, that she was, uh, you know, a filly that was quality. She's run good races in Europe. I think probably one of the reasons she came here to the States looking for firm ground and we saw earlier in the day they ran three quarters in 107 and change so even though we had some rain a few days ago uh, I would say that this turf definitely playing on the quick side uh, midnight mile will be my top selection you have to say though the six marvelous mod she ran once last year obviously something went awry she's by slumber six-year-old mare her dapples have dapples. I mean, she could not look any better. She comes out of Payson Park with that Florida tan, looks outstanding. Uh, I, I would have no surprise that she would win. And, you know, Chad Brown's got Midnight Mile, Eminem, Marvelous Mod, Eminem. So I think it could be a sweet exacta. Can we get some peanut Eminems in there? 
That's oh, there's favorite. some downstairs. Maybe Ooh. someone wants to bring them up. <laughs> Is that on Sam's desk? <laughs> yes. Well, we're going to find some peanut m ms <laughs> Everybody knows that's how uh, how to, to make me happy. Uh, as far as the Chad Brown runners do go, Marvelous Mod, as Richie mentioned, she only raced once. And, yes, she won the Mount Vernon in May. I know she's a New York bred turf horse, and we're expecting – her to come off a layoff here. It's just, we have not seen her since May. She missed all the Saratoga turf races for New York Reds. She missed the fall races. And she's a six-year-old now. Obviously, Chad's not going to bring her back unless she's ready and she has ability still. But I do think in a race where she could be pace compromised, it's worth a conversation. Absolutely, especially at a short price. And that's the thing with her, that she doesn't have to be so far out of things early, but she is not going to get the same kind of fractions that she did when she was able to win her last start a year ago. There was a horse in there that went 22 to the uh, quarter in that race, and I just don't really see that happening in the small compact field. For more on the other Chad Brown runner, let's check in with JK. Thanks, Keisha. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go with the one midnight mile as well. Uh, you guys mentioned uh, her run at Keeneland in that grade one uh, that Meditate won. She got a 79 buyer that day, and that was a two-year-old. Now she shows up here in a race where, you know, based on her age, she's supposed to improve a little bit. They like to say we, in, from a two- to three-year-old, you can expect maybe 10 to 12 points. Well, what can you expect from a two- to a four-year-old? 15, 20 points? If she improves to that level, and she's right there uh, with what's probably necessary to win this race, you know, a high 80, low 90 buyer speed figure. You'd like to think that she's going to take a step forward uh, in Chad's barn, and, and I'm looking forward to her running well here. i got nothing against the six. I'm just going to go with the longer priced of the two Chad Brown runners. Jonathan, thank you. Midnight Mile, she's making her first start since September. Um, and Jonathan brings up an interesting point about how she did run so well as a two-year-old, and often you expect progression um sometimes though if horses are very precocious her form as a three-year-old in europe she did not really face the best quality there so there is a question as to how she'll stack up here but that's what she pointed out she will get firmer ground she will i mean when you look at her race where she was facing some of the better european horses warm heart winning one of those she was 40 to 1 in that race she and, was not yeah. really given any sort of shot and she didn't really show up in that race either so i don't really know what to do with her there's only four horses in here i won't be surprised if she runs well but she wasn't for me top pick i went to the number three in here i'm hoping that she can rebound after that last race spirit and glory because that race too back it was pretty good. Mm -hmm. She ran very well, maybe regressed a little bit last time out. Can Sunset Louise potentially wire the field in her turf debut? It's time for the Plenty of Grace. The Phillies and Mayors loading in. Get their spotlight moment here on the turf. Chris Griffin has the call. Is it all set? And they're off in the Plenty of Grace. Spirit and Glory gets the first call right out to the front. It's Spirit and Glory, who's got the lead. Sunset Louise gets over to the rail, is now going to stalk from second. It's just going to let this pace setter press on as they pass that wire the first time. It's going to be Spirit and Glory to take him into that first turn. Jose Lescano and Spirit and Glory, they're in front. Right there now moving towards the outside is Sunset Louise. At the rail is Midnight Mile and Marvelous Maud is the trailer tightly bunched as they get set to work to the back stretch. And on the front end, they went 24.49 for that opening quarter mile. And in front, there's Spirit and Glory. Spirit and Glory is still up by about three quarters of a length. Now moving towards the outside comes Sunset Louise. It's just stalking this pace setter still with Marvelous Maud, who's picked up a placing, is now in third. At the rail is Midnight Mile as they continue to be comfortable enough with their positioning. 48 and 4. That half mile time, Spirit and Glory going to try and take them all the way. Spirit and Glory still there by three quarters of a length. And here comes the move from Sunset Louise. Starts to turn up the pressure. Just took an awkward step there. Marvelous Maud is going to be three wide. And here comes the ground saving trip for Midnight Mile, who's now taken second. It's moving into the two path. Can Spirit and Glory now run them off their feet? And look at Spirit and Glory immediately open up that margin. She reached the top of the stretch, and Spirit and Glory is quickly put up about four lengths on the rest of the field. Midnight Mile is all in. They're approaching the 16th, and no doubt the plenty of grace is going to go to Spirit and Glory to win it with style. Spirit and Glory wins at Midnight Mile. Marvelous Maud and Sunset Louise in 1 minute 34 and 4. 
Spirit and Glory takes the plenty of grace, and she was best in here, Sarah, but also a decisive move from Jose Lascano to put her on the lead. Absolutely, and when you have these races that have these more compact fields, we do see more of this rider's race. And once Sunset Louise was not hustled to the front, this race was gifted, basically, to Spirit and Glory, a horse that was able to set very comfortable fractions, Jose Lascano being the one to be willing to be aggressive with a horse that he knew could at least have some forward position. And when nobody else really wanted to go, he said, okay, I'm gonna just do it. And nobody really made up significant ground in here whatsoever. Distant second to Midnight Mile. Um, we talked about Marvelous Maud being pace compromised and she just was never really able to pick up her feet. No, she just really never had anything to offer. And I know this was a race that was dominated forwards, but we didn't really see any move from right. her whatsoever. Three, one, six, two in the Plenty of Grace. No doubt about the winner, number three, Spirit and Glory coming in from Fairgrounds back to New York. And she gets the win and she has some class. I know that she has been maybe a little bit of a question mark as to how good she is, but she did win uh, the Al Albert Amstall Memorial two back at Fairgrounds and a nice wire to wire score here. Yeah, she's a horse that when she has that forward position, she can be dangerous, but she doesn't absolutely need that to be successful. So deciding to see where she goes from here and obviously going forwards if you're going to be in these kinds of races and we see these situations with the scratches you want to take advantage especially <laughs> with a short field oftentimes there's not a lot of pace dynamics going on in the group race seven plenty of grace at spirit and glory takes them wide wire to wire back at oaklawn park paul and raj we had a little bit of drama what took place with that inquiry well, we did have a takedown here at Oakland for the second third place finishers. Raji, take us through this right here. Yeah, so as you can see here the, on the inside, the number 10 in the white cap, Jewelstown, was going out and denied the pad of the number 11, Legendary Lore. Jewelstown ended up finishing second. Legendary Lore was third. They flipped and made that change and made um, disqualified Jewelstown. Now the Legendary Lord moves up to second. Big long shot. Yeah, Eric Greatness is a horse by Lemon Drop Kid, a wildcat hair mirror. Um, Worldly Heiress gets the job done, three for 12 lifetime. I think that they made the right call because Legendary Lord just lost second by a nose. But here's your cross country pick five follow along, $61,000 in the pool. And listen, anytime you get double digit winners, you're going right. So you got Oakland race number seven, Aqueduct race number eight, and then the feature race here at Oakland. So three more races to close that out. Hope. Wow. Impressive. Philly there at Aqua with Jose Lascano aboard. We'll be back in a little bit. Lafitte will be in the driver's seat in America's Day at the Races.
America's Day at the Race. This is brought to you in part by Naira Bets. You can bet any track, anywhere, anytime. Get started at NairaBets.com or download the app today. For the plenty of grace, spirit, and glory takes them gate to wire. This winter circle lead and is brought to you by the Phasic Tipton Mid-Atlantic May two-year-old in training sale after the Preakness on May 20th and 21st in Timonium, Maryland. Where will you be? Well, we know where Spirit and Glory is right now into the winner's circle, $6.30 winner, trained by Rob Falcone, who's standing by with Richie. Thanks, Acacia. Rob, this was some performance here. Spirit and Glory was a, a filly that early in her career had trouble breaking from the gate, but as she's matured, she breaks well and puts herself in a good spot. Were you surprised you were on the lead? In this race, we kind of plan on being second, we thought. We thought, uh, you know, the inside horse would show a little bit more speed and probably be on the lead and we'd have to sit second. But, um, you know, I left off to Jose and trust in the jock. So, he, you know, he made a good decision. He made a split second decision to go for her when she broke so well and he did a good job, worked out good. Now with her turn of foot, because she has a serious turn of foot, when she was going that easy in front, you had to think that she was going to explode to the stretch the way she did. I was hoping so, but you know, you're never really sure, especially when they're used to, um, you know, besides today, she was never on the lead ever, you know? So you never really know if they kind of get lost out there, wonder a little bit. Um, but, you know, she, she didn't do that today. Last eighth and 11 and change. I mean, that, that's racehorse time and the way she finished. Where do you think you go from here with her? I'm not really sure yet. You know, we have plenty of options for at least on the turf going long. So we kind of pick and choose. Um, but we see how she comes back. And, you know, she's been shipped around a little bit. So now she's going to be based back here. So, uh, you know, we see how she comes out of it and discuss a few spots. Well, enjoy this win. Uh, good job. And, uh, and I'm sure we'll be seeing her in bigger and better races going forward. This was a really strong performance. Nice effort from Spirit and Glory. Richie, thank you. Jose Lascano, uh, I liked what Rob said. He left it up to Jose. He made the split second decision and it proved to be the right one. Being aggressive often is. Absolutely. And uh, they also thought that they were going to be sitting in mm -hmm. second to the horse that was trying the turf for the first time in Sunset Louise. But trusting your rider to be able to call those audibles and go on with it and giving them that free reign to be able to make their own decisions, it pays off. Jose Lascano with three wins today. So obviously he's making a lot of the right decisions on the track here at Aqueduct. That's the plenty of grace. One more race still to come here at Aqueduct today. And it is on the turf as well. Nice maiden special weight for the night. Cap three year olds and up going a mile in a 16th. And uh, right now, five to two on the number eight. Kick a buck, second time starter for Chad Brown. And we'll talk a little bit more about this in a moment, Sarah. But this is a horse who, yes, had some trouble in this race, but maybe might be meeting some interesting and competitive company here. Absolutely, lost to a short price favorite first time out, little bit of a trip, but I think that this is an interesting race overall. Maybe you don't want to go with such a short price. Could be a race with some talented uh, horses with a little bit of an exciting future in there as well. We'll talk more about the field for the nightcap, made it special weight on the turf at the Big A. Horses in the paddock getting tacked up though for race seven at Oaklawn Park. We'll talk more about it when we come back here from our team over in Hot Springs. All that more on America's Day at the Races. Nobody catching society. Red Root One Cybernite has won the Haskell over Tama and Tana in the Forgo. Sierra Leone wins the Toyota Bluegrass. Two million three hundred thousand. Experience the adrenaline pumping, suspense filled action of the sport of kings no matter where you are with Naira Vets. It's fast, easy, and secure. Download the app today and start winning with our lucrative weekly promotions thrilling handicapping contest and a one-of-a-kind VIP rewards program. Don't just watch horse racing, be a part of the action with Naira Vets. Twirling candy, proving lanes ends, stallion making tradition. Twirling candy has seen success on the track and sales rate, siring multiple grade one winners and millionaires, including Exalted. Beyond Brilliant, Gear Jockey, and reaching seven-figure yearling and two-year-old sales. 
by the legendary Candy Ride. Twirling Candy, a leader of his generation. Racetrack Television Network brings you every race from every track on every screen every day. With monthly packages starting as low as $5, RTN gives you great value and access to more live HD streaming and race replays than anyone. Visit RTN.TV today to sign up and watch on almost any device, including Roku and Amazon Fire. RTN has packages that start at $5 per month. America's Day at the Races, welcome back. Coverage continuing on Fox Sports 2, Telethon 6 Eastern, supporting the Permanently Disabled Jockeys Fund. Give him a call, maybe a Hall of Famer picks up. Donate what you can. Raj, such an important cause, and to this point, nearly, nearly having raised a quarter million. Uh, it's really cool to see this uh, is going well. And as the MIG alluded to earlier, the, uh, the PDJF doesn't have a guaranteed source of revenue. They don't have a constant flow. These events that they that that, that is put on by the PDJF is, is what it's how they raise money to to fund this and, and help provide for the 60 jockeys that depend on this. You love to see how it is popular of an event this has become and, and the unity and and throughout the entire racing industry supporting the, the PDJF. Yeah, the community comes together for a, a great cause. Um, these jockeys have been injured, you know, putting on a show and uh, like life altering injuries, not just career ending injuries. And, um, you know, it's just uh, can't s stress it enough how much of a great cause it is. Because in this industry, like we, we don't agree on a lot of things. <laughs> right? right. It's nice to see everyone supporting this cause, the PDJF. You still have time. Six Eastern, the telethon continues out at Santa Anita. Did you miss me? Mm, I missed you, but I had fun with Paulie. So you, you could have just stopped it. I missed you. <laughs> you could have stopped right there. I, did, you, did you pick any winners? I, I pick, I, yeah, we we'll picked some yeah. winners so far. All right, well yeah. done. Well done. Riders well, up. Going well. We're going well. Who do you like, who do you like in the seventh? It's a good race. Yeah, this is a good race, and it's a co-feature. Um, today, the allowance, optional two other than allowance, uh, the seventh and eighth race are the co-features. But in this race, I picked number 10, Squire Creek. All right. The Brad Cox trainee, second off a long he layoff. He should get a great trip. That tactical speed, the outside box, and this three-quarter of a mile sprint. Those are the, the reasons why I picked him. I think he's, he's set up to get a great trip here, um, just tracking the front runners, which, which has been like a, a very good um, setup at this track. Mm -hmm. Most of the winners are, are coming just off the pace. Fast Colt to his outside, uh, Bohemian Bow, number 11. You'll have a chance to see him up close and personal as they make the turn. We'll have the post break. Good allowance race, $75,000 allowance. Optional claimer, older horses, $141,000 purse. There's ultimate first half of the claim, Doug O'Neill. Yes, it takes a big step up uh, first off the claim to this optional allowance level. Chip off the old block, uh, Indiana homebred, number three, Zambezi, who just galloped in his latest. Yeah, that was a very impressive race. And if he were to duplicate this race today, he's going to make a major presence. For that reason, the favorite, then Macron, who scratched out of a race Friday to run here. Yeah, I've been fading in the stretch, um, hoping to probably save a little bit more in the tank. For the Radical stretch. right claim from Norm Cassie by Ron McQuet. Yeah, and comes off a win off that claim where he just got up by a head. Mr. Iceman, Ricardo Santana won a grade one four-star Dave in those colors for Gary Barber. Yeah, this horse drops out of the Eclipse Stakes, which is a much tougher level than he's running today. Black Powder. Unraced since last year's Iowa Derby, followed by Our Last Chance. The Iowa Bread has won 305, 3 of 5. Yeah, this Iowa Bread has a lot of speed. They kind of rated him last time. I think they'll probably revert back to showing that speed today. Mo wins another Indiana Bread. It's switching from the turf to the dirt and cutting back in distance. Ah, your uh, Colt is on his toes there. Squire Creek ready oh. to rock and roll. Yeah, he looks pretty geared up today for his second race off a long layoff. Um, expecting him to be just talking the leaders and taking over in the stretch. Uh, Bohemian Bo representing outside speed. 
outside speed, the speed of the speed here. Uh, I expect this horse to be on the lead, and he's going to try to take them gate to wire. Good race. Exciting sprint brewing post time in five minutes. Let's circle back to the favorite in Zambezi. Take a look at his most recent. Last month right here, he's a 7-5 to five favorite. Raj in Zambezi is prominent throughout. Gets his cue, and he is gone. Yeah, never in doubt. He made seven to five look like a bargain mm -hmm. here. Uh, and it, this horse is on an upward, upward trend, upward trajectory. His numbers are saying that. He ran a career high 98 speed figure last time. And he did that without even um, Asmus and even uncocking the crop. Never felt the crop. Well within himself. And um, it's a horse that's this $200,000 son of Candy Ride is finding his best strides. Paulie, can we expect to see more of the same from Zambezi for the Asmussens? Yeah, I think he's going to be a handful in here. It just seems like whenever Steve's horses get really sharp, they get sharp. And when you look at Zambezi, I was not a big fan of this horse earlier in this meet. But now you start looking back at his record and you go, well, he likes Oaklawn Park. It's just that he's had five races here. Both of his wins have come here. His best races come here. That was his last race. He, he beat Plosby Deniable, who's a nice little horse. Uh, he's got two third-place finishes. His one sloppy race was, you know, three back. And, you know, last time he went to the front end. And the way he finished up, guys, he finished up in 12 flat in a canter. So he's finishing up his races. And, and I don't know if he really needs the lead because you guys make a good point. The speed from the outside the 10 and the 11. The 11 is fast, and this horse is a fast gate horse, too. So I would think he pops out of there along with the Brad Cox runner, Squire Creek, to try to get position because they're going to have to. It's going to be very interesting where Keith lands Zambezi early. Does he push forward like last time or just let him break out of there knowing that he can pass horses? I just think he's going to be a handful in here. We've seen this a lot where Steve's horses, like Raji said, when they get good, especially sprinting, and they like the racetrack, he strikes while the iron's hot. And I think Zambezi's going to be very tough in here at 9 to 5. I do think if I was going to use another horse for a bomb in here, um, you know, the 6 is a horse by Mr. Bar owned by Gary Barber, who usually likes to bet. And when I see 9 to 1, I kind of go away. I do think the 8 in here, the other speed, has got a little bit of giddy up. But I'm going to throw in a bomb for you here. The 9 in here, Mowins. I, this horse has got some backlash just to get into the number. But like I said, I think the 3 at 8 to 5 now, it's getting a little bit towards the point where do you really want to bet him at that short of a price. But 8 to 5, 9 to 5, I can live with that because I think he's going to be really tough. Favorite, strong on paper, that big win. Paul says, look out for an outsider. Mo wins a second of two. Lauer, Indiana bred homebreds. And your top selection, Rajan, Squire Creek pictured. Yeah, and it, like Squire Creek, he won his first two career starts. So as, as the favorite in his second start. And this horse was like expected to become a good stake horse. And he was a favorite in the stake. And then all of a sudden, he goes on this layoff. But he comes back with a good performance. His, his most recent race was his first race in eight months. And it was a good third place finish. He made a move at the leaders as if he was going to win the mm -hmm. race in, into a fast pace. And then he kind of faded in the stretch. Naturally, the fitness gained from this race is expected to propel him forward. And he doesn't even need to step forward much to win this race. Saw Martin Schwann in those twin creek colors. Destin comes to mind, a Tampa Bay Derby winner, trained up to the Kentucky Derby, ran fifth, just defeated a nose in the Belmont Stakes, was Destin by Creator in, when it was a Creator? Yes. I think it was, was it? one of the best rides you'll ever see in a Belmont Stakes from Arad Ortiz. Yes, it was. A, that was a close finish, the narrowest of defeats. Um, but, you know, this race is shaping up that it's, it's going to be a throwdown in the stretch because the top three contenders, the, the number three, the number 10, and the number 11, are expected to be the three horses that are within close proximity early. So there's going to be some 
tough decisions and, and key decisions made by these riders going into that turn. You know, when do I start putting the pressure on? Is, is something that Keith Asmussen is going to be, you know, focused on. Do I go after? Do I go after these two horses early? going into the turn or do I wait until the stretch if he waits too long to engage the front runners they might get away from him if who waits too long uh, Keith Asmussen mm -hmm. on the number three Zambezi on the favorite. okay if he waits too long to engage the number 11 Bohemian Bow then Bohemian Bow might give him the slip but if he moves too early at him he might soften himself up for Squire Creek who I believe is going to be sitting just close to him, second or third. If you're Martin Schwann on Squire Creek, are you a little aggravated that, that the fastest horse, at least on paper, Bohemian Bow, is drawn to your outside? Because that post would seemingly put him in a perfect catbird seat otherwise from the 10 hole. Instead, he has Bohemian Bow, the fastest horse on paper to his outside. You make a great point there. Uh, if I was on the Squire Creek, I would have wanted to be drawn outside of Bohemian Bow. However, I, I, what would be in my mind if I'm Martin Chan right now is saying, look, I know Bobby Himbo is going to go to the lead, and I don't want to soften myself up running with him head to head. So I'm going to break and let him go to the lead and clear off in front of me. And when Torres guides over to the rail down the backstretch, I would just tip out and sit right on his outside. Mm -hmm. So I would... Even though I, I'm not drawn outside of him, I would be trying to flip-flop that Still position. Still try to wind up in that same the, position as if you were. At some point down the backstretch, exactly. And I, and I think that's a good spot to be in. If Zambezi runs back to his March 14th effort, that win, is this game, set, match? Not necessarily. It, it's going to make him a, a super tough to beat, but it's not a game, set, match because um, Squire Creek's March 3rd effort is equivalent hmm. to, to that, in, in my opinion. See how it all unfolds. Three to two at post time, Zambezi. The speed towards the outside, Squire Creek, Raj's top selection, and Bohemian Bow. Matt Dinderman with the call, race seven of nine on a Sunday at Oakland, live on Fox Sports 2. Bohemian Bow. The outside post. Here's Bohemian Bo. We're ready to go. And uh, Laroff. Bohemian Bo on the far outside showing his customary front running speed. Squire Creek matches him. Squire Creek with a head lead on Bohemian Bo who takes back to second. Our last chance third in the run up the backside. Chip off the old block and Zambezi are side by side. Macron the gray not far off of them. He's four lengths off the lead on the outside. A gap of two to ultimate. Pushed along already with a half mile to go. Radical right joins him. Two more to Black Powder. Mo wins is dropped back to the second last spot and Mr. Iceman well behind. He's running 12 lengths off the lead as they round the far turn. Squire Creek on top with Bohemian Bow. Macron has made a charge to challenge the front runners. Those three across the track. Bohemian Bow in the middle with a head lead. Squire Creek has to come back. He's lost the lead second on the rail. Macron alongside of him. Three deep at the top of the lane here. Chip off the old block is done. Is dropping back on the inside. One last chance has run very well today. Bohemian Bow. The Arkansas bred has the lead but radical right from from midfield has exploded on the outside to the lead and radical right with a huge effort one last chance in the second then Zambezi radical right radical right wins it under Rafael Bayerado one last chance was second photo finish for the third spot radical right first off the claim for Ron Moquette wins it at 11 to 1 you know, popular at the claim box and right to the winner circle for Moquet. Rafael Bejarano cuts radical right loose, hits another gear, and he is gone. Yeah, he capitalized on a pace collapse. This early pace duel, I was surprised to see Squire Creek being sent out the gate to go duel with Bohemian yep. Bow, and that did them in. And you could see the, the, the closers capitalized, radical right coming up to win. 5-8 photo for third, 11 to 1 over 11 to 1 in the seventh at Oaklawn Park. Uh, we're saying goodbye to our viewers on Fox Sports 2. We'll see you over on Fox Sports 1 for the last two races of the week here at Oaklawn.
Monday edition of America's Day at the Races brought to you by America's Best Racing. For the love of the race, visit americasbestracing.net today. Gorgeous shot of Lady Liberty as we are at New York City's racetrack, Aqueduct Racetrack in South Ozone Park, Queens. Acacia Clement alongside Sarah Albadwe. Sarah, our day kind of winding down a little bit here. Just one more race to go at the Big A and it's on the turf. The turf racing resumed this weekend, which is such a thrill and it means spring is finally here. Exactly. And looking forward to this final race that we have a competitive event for those maidens, different directions to possibly go in in this spot. And of course, trainer Chad Brown has a couple of short priced two that will be in here. More on the nightcap in a moment. But first, today is a very special and important day for looking out for our own in the racing industry. The Permanently Disabled Jockeys Fund, which was, does not have a consistent means of funding, is holding its annual telethon today. Jockeys live in studio at Santa Anita. And Keeneland, I think that's Joaquin Jaime in the front joking around. It looks like him. I know. The back of his head. Causing a little trouble. <laughs> but great to see nearly, I mean, over 245,000 so far, nearly a quarter million. You can call one 844 884 PDJF or go to pdjf.org slash donate. And the fund does such amazing work, Sarah, looking out for riders that have been injured and need some support as well, whether that be medical support, uh, mental support, everything and is such a huge and important resource if you can contribute. Absolutely. They do such great work and it's so nice to be able to promote the telephones that they do have. And when you call, you might get in touch with somebody that is a Hall of Famer. Who knows who's going to pick up that phone over yeah, there? Yeah, uh, then it could be uh, could be fun to have a phone call now in this world of texting as well. The nightcap from Aqueduct coming up next. Second time starter for Chad Brown. Kick a buck, currently the favorite at nine to five, who did have a bit of a troubled trip on debut down at Gulfstream. This is a maiden special weight going a mile and a 16th on the turf as we welcome in the third member of our team here in New York, champion jockey Richard Migliori. Yeah, guys, and, and I have no doubt that the favorite will be tough to beat here, but I'm going to start down on the inside with the one coast along, returning as a gelding uh, for trainer Suge McGay. You get Jose Lascano, and I just don't think anybody is riding any better than Jose Lascano right now. His confidence level is high. He just seems to be making all the right moves. And a good inside draw. I like inside posts and two-turn turf races. Coast along, I think, is a very interesting alternative if you're looking away from the favorite. The two risk tolerance. Ultimately, the other Chad Brown, which I've been picking pretty much every day, the other Chad Brown, and without much success. But I am absolutely a sucker for Kingman's. This is an Irish bred by Kingman. He also gets a good inside draw. And I just really was impressed with how he's conducted himself. Seems like a very classy individual. And your favorite, kick a buck. Um, he's tiny. He is a very, very small horse. Now, that doesn't mean that he can't run. I, obviously, he ran very well on debut. It's more the mechanics of their stride, how efficient they use themselves, and he is a very balanced individual. I just went down towards the inside, and guys, three to one, Rangers, end of the second. <laughs> Leave it to Richie to get a little Rangers plug in. As far as the first time starter risk tolerance, uh, purchased at the Tattersall's October yearling sale, which obviously these stables had a lot of success with. Absolutely. And with uh, offspring of Kingman as well, this one, the dam's a half to the grade two winner, Serve the King. Chad Brown familiar with that horse as well. And you expect big things with connections like this. Top pick for you? I went with the number 10, Prime to Go, getting back to the grass after a uh, turf sprint last time out and making his three-year-old day Debut. Off the layoff for Georgie Duarte, loading in for the last race of the day, Coast Along, who got very headstrong in his last couple of races. Let's see what he can do from the rail coming back off the layoff as a gelding. Graduation day coming up here on the turf track. Announcer Chris Griffin has the call live at Eckbrecht. Goes in. All set. And they're off. Good speed from Black Diamond, first trumpet towards the front and coast along is down towards the inside and now closer to the rail. It's going to be coast along and Jose Lescano to assert that they are bunched up in behind this front runner. Coast along will take him into that turn. Saving ground now risk tolerance is now a challenging second. It's going to take back to third as first trumpet will press on. The leader is now three in front. Outwider's Battle of Britain is now well settled. Tight hold here in the fourth position. At the rail there is Black Diamond who's in fifth. In sixth comes Glint is in the purple silks towards the outside side with Prime to go, who's back there in seventh. 
Then in the eighth position is Party with Smarty, and then Pink Cap comes Triumphant Road in ninth. Then behind them, Kick a Buck is towards the tail end of the field. Be there, and the trailer, Dangerous Driver. They're watching Coast Along. Cruise on the front end went 23 and 4 for that opening quarter mile and 48 and 1 for a half mile time. Coast Along at 5 to 1 is two and a half lengths clear, less than a half mile to go. First trumpet, the big long shot is towards the outside. Battle of Britain wants to go. It's just held in here by Jose Lesca Jose Gomez, three wide. At the rail, that's Risk Tolerance. That's Jose Lescano on Coast Along, and they're in front still. Here comes the move from Risk Tolerance. Is now in the two path. Battle of Britain is called upon, not cutting the margin yet. Black Diamond is now taking that challenging third party with Smarty from the back, but Coast Along is still doing it nicely up top. Risk Tolerance with every chance to run this leader down, and here comes Risk Tolerance, who's well in the clear, has Coast Along in sights. Coast Along is still there. Risk Tolerance is now moving in closer within a half length of the lead. They approach the final 16th, and here's Risk Tolerance to push on by. Risk Tolerance, Coast Along, Risk Tolerance. Wins it. Risk tolerance over Coast Along. Black Diamond and Kick a Buck. Late for fourth. Then one minute 41.40 seconds. First time starter, Risk Tolerance with the win. Another Kingman purchased at Tattersalls that wins over here in America for the Chad Brown Clarovich team. And another example of the other Chad Brown getting the job done, a horse that was making his debut in this spot when the stable bait taking a little bit more money in kick a buck, that one with some experience. But this was a nice trip for this horse, Manny Franco having this one in position all the way around the racetrack to run right on by your front runner, Coast Along. Coast Along, who was much better behaved, by the way, coming back this year, was really tough to handle last summer for his riders. He was very settled, wasn't throwing his head around, but just not quite enough punch late uh, and off the layoff, too. But the, the first time starter, well prepared when it counted. Absolutely. And with Coast Along, they tried the rating experiment last time. They realized it didn't work. So I like that at least they went back to tactics that were a little bit more successful in the past, just not quite enough to hold off this debuting runner. Risk Tolerance, the dam, a group three winner herself in Europe. And she's a sister to serve the king, as you mentioned, who won the Red Smith here stateside. That one was for Peter Brandt and Chad Brown. He also uh, was second in the grade one Joe Hirsch Turf Classic. So they knew in the family that the pedigree said American turf racing is A-OK. -okay. Uh, this one, Risk Tolerance winning on debut. And I would imagine bigger and better things to come. Yeah, you would expect, especially mm -hmm. with connections like this and with this uh, performance first time out that was just very professional and yep. able to sit close to the pace as well. Third place finisher, Black Diamond, a little bit reluctant to, to switch leads, a little bit erratic in the stretch. 2-1-4-8 in race number eight. First time starter, victorious. Second win today for jockey Manny Franco taking the nightcap at Aqueduct. When we come back, it's 13 days away from the Kentucky Derby, and that will be our focus, talking about one of the big ones, Florida Derby winner, Fierceness. He was a champion two-year-old. He has a world of talent. Can he show up when it counts? A little bit of a Jekyll and Hyde type horse. More on Kentucky Derby 150 after this.
We're back on America's Day at the races on FS1. Manny Franco and Risk Tolerance heading into the winner's circle after taking the nightcap, just a professional debut. And these are connections that you have no surprise seeing in the winner's circle with a first time starter, especially now that we have the turf racing back and this one able to sit close to the pace and pounce at the right time. $8.10 winner picking the other Chad Brown finally paid off for Richie. He's standing by with winning jockey Manny Franco. Yeah, with Manny Franco, who has just been riding this turf course so well. Manny, perfect trip again, saving all that ground. I know you had a lot of horse on you and you need the horse, but getting that inside position really makes a big difference. Yeah, I think um, it's a key when you break good and you get your position, you know, before everything, you know, you want to break, get your position, and after that, see if you had the horse under you. But I always want to make sure to get my position first. Risk tolerance was traveling so well in hand, cruised up behind the leader. It almost looked like when he got in the clear, like, like he got a little lost for a few strides. Yeah, I'm agree. Um, he was traveling so nice um, on the bridle the, the whole way. And in, by the 516 pole, I, 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 have, I have so much hurt that I was able to, you know, uh, be on the clear early. So I, he, he kind of lose a little bit of momentum when he, see, when he saw daylight. So I have to work on it and he respond pretty good after that. Well, Manny, you're doing such a great job. Keep it up, all your success. And guys, if, if young riders want to learn how to ride the turf, they just need to watch Manny Franco right now. You can't position horses any better. He's been riding so well, especially on the turf. He had four wins yesterday, as did trainer Chad Brown, but Manny riding so well and delivering for the big outfits. Absolutely, and he's a rider that's always sort of had the ability to be that consistent type for these bigger outfits, and I think just really reestablishing his place within the jockey colony as we wait more of those experienced riders to come back and join us as we go along in the spring. Another good day here in New York, Fort Jockey Manny Franco taking the nightcap with risk tolerance. And while it was the quote unquote other Chad, probably one that you use in the cross country pick five, and it's actually the lowest payout yet. An $8.10 winner. I know, it's been very fruitful so far. He had yeah. to come up with the biggest price in Radical Right down at Oaklawn. Some other decent prices included within that sequence. See how it all shakes out. But those have been so fun to play throughout our time having them with Oaklawn Park. One more race to go. Race eight at Oaklawn in that cross-country pick five sequence as we welcome in our team in Hot Springs, Lafitte Pinkai and Rajiv Mirage. And 13 days away from the Kentucky Derby. Guys, we saw a lot of the important preps taking place at Oakland and I'll have to get around fierceness. So many different roads to the Kentucky Derby, Acacia. Fierceness indeed, the anticipated favorite for the 150th run for the Roses, just 13 days out that first Saturday in May and such an exciting time. Uh, the lead up to the first jewel of the Triple Crown and those prep races Acacia mentioned. We take a look at the leaderboard. This is how horses qualify for the Kentucky Derby and accumulating points and some familiar names including a reigning champion in fierceness last year's two-year-old champion with 136 points sierra leone 155 points they figure to be the shortest price horses come derby day but let's focus in here on fierceness and our kentucky derby spotlight presented by spendthrift fierceness what he did in the florida derby it was literally Historic, Raj, this was the biggest blowout in the history of the Florida Derby fierceness. You look at the stats there and what he's accumulated to this point, 1.7 million in earnings and just three wins in that most recent victory, that aforementioned Florida Derby. No horse in all the decades and decades of history of the Florida Derby has ever won by this wide of a margin. Yeah, and make no doubt that his Florida Derby performance, this Florida the, the performance that we're about to see, was the most dominating performance of any Derby prep. This was the biggest, um, most impressive der um, prep race of all the, all the preps. I mean, he ran not only by the margin that he ran, the 16 length victory, but he also ran the fastest one mile and an eight in 148. And to put that in perspective, Sierra Leone, who is the, the other top gun, he ran a mile and an eight in 150, which is two seconds slower. The jockey, motionless. John Velasquez, a statue 
in the stirrups, the crop uncocked and Fierceness's ears twitching back and forth like asking the jockey, what else do you want me to do? Yeah, John Velasquez is jockey's body language, standing high in the stirrups and just holding on. It, it makes you feel like there's a lot more left in the tank and he's going so fast already. And the story from last year's derby, that's Mike Rapoli, his owner, leading him into the winner's circle. Mike Rapoli owned Forte, another reigning two-year-old champion, another favorite for the Kentucky Derby. Scratched the morning of the race last year with a bruised foot. The opportunity of a lifetime missed. The team that loses the Super Bowl, well, they can always get back to next year's Super Bowl. Not the chance, not the case for a thoroughbred. They're three years old only once, just one chance to run in the Kentucky Derby. So Forte missed that opportunity. The connections though, Rapoli is back and also trained by Todd Pletcher. Yeah, Mike Rapoli, Todd Pletcher, they've been snake bitten at the Derby with favorites. It happened to Uncle Mo, which was one of Mike Rapoli's um, Derby favorites in the prior years. And last year again with Forte. So maybe it's a ter the third time might be the charm for this connection. And the competition might wanna like, Cover your ears. Uh, you don't want to hear what Todd Pletcher had to say about Fierceness's breeze on Friday at Palm Meadows, never mind the time or the distance. Pletcher stating that Fierceness is doing as well as he was going into the Florida Derby, or maybe even better. Yeah, there's no doubt that the horse is in peak form right now. And he, he is the head honcho of the, of the three-year-olds. He's Listen. the reigning champion, and he's a top dog. Just play devil's advocate, though, for one moment. Um, what we look for in, in championship franchises in team sports are teams that can overcome adversity, teams that can still win when things go wrong, right? If there is a blemish regarding fierceness and what we've seen in his five race career, those two losses, when things didn't go his way, when the table wasn't set perfectly, he kind of waved the white flag on, on both occasions. Yeah, he surrendered in, in those two races and didn't show up with his top performance. And that's the one thing that he, it's, it's his blemish so far, like you said, that's his downfall. He has not yet shown that he could overcome some adversity. And there's a lot of potential for adversity in a 20 horse field. We haven't seen the, 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 the post position hasn't been drawn as yet, but that's going to be an important mm -hmm. factor for Fierceness and his, his team to see where they get um, drawn because there could be some problems started with a tough post. You've ridden some very good three-year-olds in the Kentucky Derby. You finished third back in 2011. Mucho Macho Man, describe the level of excitement at this stage, a couple of weeks out knowing you're going to be riding one of the major contenders for a Kentucky Derby. Well, it feels like a few weeks before Christmas and you, <laughs> your gift is on is wrapped onto the tree and you want to open that gift and you're really excited about getting to that gift and that, that's what it feels like a few weeks out to, um, when it comes to the excitement side of it but that it's a double-edged sword because there's also anxiety you're like you hope nothing goes wrong you want to be it's like you want to behave good you don't want your parents to take the gift away you're hoping <laughs> that your horse doesn't get scratched or some you don't get that phone call that dreaded phone call every time your phone rings you jump yeah, up yeah. I hope it is not so something wrong because I've had that happen as well my horse getting scratched the day before the derby and um, I think that's the kind of feeling that Mike Rapoli is feeling with fierceness you know he's excited but he's also anxious he got there with the best horse the favorite the reigning champion the morning of the race Forte defected back this year with fierceness and, and yeah you want him in bubble wrap as the countdown continues to the 150th run for the Roses. Uh, our countdown continues to this eighth race at Oaklawn. We're five minutes out. It's a good one. $75,000 allowance optional. Claimer, older horses, mile and a 16th. The race turned upside down. All those scratches changing the complexion of the race. Koufax, background, the number nine horse, uh, tapsational. All them fast horses speed, they're all out. Yeah, we diluted down to a six horse field, but it's still a competitive field and kept in the, the horse that we're seeing here, number four, um, Ben Franklin, coming off a two-race win streak. <laughs> His father's name, Inventive, Ben Franklin. Uh, Harlow Cap, father and son, the Asmazins working together, and then six, Warren L., the Iowa bred. Yeah, this Iowa bred hasn't shown much speed today. would be trying to hustle up a little earlier. Seven, eight, nine are out. Ten is in. Winnemac Avenue, a non-factor at this level last month. Yeah, got beat five lengths at this level last in his last race. Alejandro claimed from Steve Asmussen by Raymond Ginter Jr. Yeah, this deep closer, don't expect to see him early, but he'll be closing late. 
Five to one. The third choice in the wagering. No question about the favorite in Ben Franklin. Seven to five. Four minutes out. We check in with Paul. Yeah, and he's the one to beat in here, Lafitte, the son of City of Light. He's been very good in his last two starts. It, it, it probably started a couple starts back if you look at it because he lost to a really nice horse in Southern Sunset, and he lost to Alexander Helios before that, who's turned out to be a really nice runner. But this was him, you know, his last time out. And listen, I get it. He was the favorite, but he keeps on getting the job done, and he kind of puts himself in the right spot. He kind of makes that middle move and gets into contention, doesn't leave a ton to do. And he was able to run down Mount Craig two starts ago and then Megan's honor on this day. So, you know, he's the barometer in this race and he's the horse to beat. But like you guys said, with all the scratches in this race, there is not a lot of pace. I, I think that a horse like Ben Franklin, it doesn't matter. He's kind of kind of run his race. But Harlow Cap the five is the beneficiary, right, of all of this because he can go towards the front end, the son of Justify. He did wire, almost wire a field, going a mile and eighth. This is a mile and a sixteenth. Um, you know, where Ben Franklin and the three heroic move, uh, you know, are horses that come from a little bit off the pace. Now, heroic move to three, it's a tough call. We've seen some of these Robertino Diodoro horses leave. They've gone to Michael Hewitt, and they've ran actually okay under Michael's name. Now, this horse is a tricky horse. This horse has been around everywhere. I mean, Robertino Diodoro took this horse to the to the Cinnaboya uh, Derby, the Century Mile Derby, the Canadian Derby. So he's been all over the place. He's a cool little horse. I just don't know if he's, you know, kind of running out of gas. He hasn't had, really had a break in a couple years now. And, you know, I just think I'm against him a little bit where I'm, I'm a little bit 4-5 in here. And then the 11 on the outside, Alejandro, you know, he was getting in good form for Steve Asmussen. Now Raymond Ginter dips in for 75000 for this old pro with 440000 in the bank. He comes from way out of it in a short field, so he's going to need some pace. But I guess with a shorter field, if he can stay compact, maybe he can make that late run. But I'll go with the five Harlow cap. I thought this race was 4-5, four, 5-4 five, five, four Lafitte. I just think that the Harlow cap can maybe be able to control this race. But Ben Franklin's just in way too good form. All right, Paul going with Harlow cap. Raj sticking with Ben Franklin, as is Jonathan Kinchin. Jake, hey, welcome to the broadcast. Ben Franklin, how, how is he going to win this thing with the dynamics of the race being changed? He does his best running from off the pace, several of the faster horses having defected. Yeah, but I think a lot of times when that happens, Lafitte, what happens, they invite the closer into the race. There's no one really out there to take advantage of the fact that there is no a lot of the pace has scratched. There's not a lot of pace in the race. So while most people would think that you don't want to use a closer in a race that doesn't appear to have much pace in it, sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes you can look at it opposite where Ben Franklin's actually going to be a lot more connected, a little bit closer than typical, and not have to deal with, uh, with, with those horses that can find those advantageous forward positions in their natural style. When there's a bunch of kickers, closers, Richie always used to say, you can't out kick the kickers. When there's a bunch of closers in there, he is the best closer, and I think that he'll be connected enough to out kick the rest of the closers. Can't out kick the kicker, you can out kick your coverage. Not a reference towards you, JK, who's <laughs> sticking with Ben Franklin. And if you want to get involved, you want to play the races, and three to five is, that's, that's, that's a tough pill to swallow here, but you can do so. At Naira Bets, get involved, sign up, and when you do so, use that promo code DERBY25. Get a $25 free bet, $200 deposit bonus, just in time for the run for the roses. Bet any track, anywhere, anytime. Sign up, NairaBets.com for your $25 bet and $200 deposit match. Plus, we have the, uh, the inside information. Didn't you have dinner, Raj, with the jockey who's about to ride the favorite, Julian Leperu? Yeah, and, uh, you know, knowing that Ben Franklin was such a major contender today and the horse that I like and I picked him, I, I had to ask him this because there's one flaw that you can really find about Ben Franklin, and that's he has a tendency to hop up at the start. Mm. So I asked Julian, w w why does the horse, what happens, how does he get him to break well? He said, look, no matter what, 
he's going to break a little slow, but he, I have to help him out of there. So Julian said he's going to be focused on getting him out of the gate and getting him going before he relaxes on him. Because if he breaks too passive on him, he's going to break slow and be disconnected. And like Jonathan said, you know, you, you don't want to be disconnected in a race that doesn't have a lot of speed. Um, so based on what Julian told me, I expect to see him break him and hustle him up a little bit, hmm. leaving the gate to ensure that he establishes his position before he starts to put him in neutral and rating him. What other adjustments can you make as a rider preparing to ride a horse that, that just has that very tendency of, of bad things happening when they're trying to get out of the blocks? It's a bit cliche, but sometimes you just have to play the hand you're dealt. And, and that's what it is. You, you, you don't expect him to break fast and you know he's going to break a little slow. The key is so he doesn't break too slow, extremely slow. That, you have to be focused and at least getting him to break decent enough to where he's not disconnected. But expect that he's never going to break fast. Dad's name, City of Light. Mom's inventive. We give you Ben Franklin, the even money favorite, and the eighth of nine at Oakland. Matt Dinnerman standing by with the call. Eighth race live Oakland on Fox Sports 1. And uh, we're off. Uneventful beginning. Ben Franklin afterwards got squeezed and drops to the back of the pack. Warnell on the lead with heroic move. And there goes Winnemac Avenue to stride forward and take the initiative. Winnemac Avenue sets a slow pace in the first quarter mile. Getting over towards the rail is cleared off, crosses over, gets to the fence, and opens up about two lengths. So Winnemac Avenue is the pacemaker. Heroic move now tips off the rail to track in the second position. Harlow cap third with Warnell. They're too clear of Ben Franklin passing Alejandro, who's now the back marker. Seven lengths off the leader, Winnemac Avenue, who leads the way by a length and three quarters from Heroic Move second. Harlow Cap getting a little bit closer into that slow pace. He's a joint second down the back stretch on the rail. Another length and a half to Ben Franklin. He's advancing position, takes fourth with Warren L, and they're three clear of Alejandro, biding his time at the back of the pack. Has no chase, pace to chase here as Winnemac Avenue went the opening quarter in 24 and 1, the half in 49 and 1. Slow tempo set by Winnemac. Mac Avenue has gotten everything his own way on the lead. Opens up a length and three quarters. Heroic move chasing second. Harlow Cap patiently ridden third and rides the rail. Ben Franklin shaken up in the three path attempts to get closer. And then comes Warren L. and Alejandro's getting into the race now. Top of the lane. Winnemac Avenue still in control. Heroic move needs to do more. Ben Franklin on the outside continues a run. Harlow Cap up the inside. Winnemac Avenue is asked to sprint for the finish. Ben Franklin trying to catch him. Harlow Cap on the rail. If he's good enough, there's room for him down on the inside. Winnemac Avenue, 16th to go, a length lead. Ben Franklin continues to run on, but he's still second as Winnemac Avenue won't let him by. Winnemac Avenue steals it over Ben Franklin, Harlow Cap, and Heroic Move. Gutty, determined, stubborn Winnemac Avenue. Avenue fending off all challengers in the stretch. He strikes at five to one with Ricardo Santana. Yeah, and we talked about the pace dynamics of this race, that there wasn't a clear cut front runner. Ricardo Santana and Winnemac Avenue, they took full advantage of that, stealing this race on the front end 24 and change 49, which is a very slow pace at this level. And that's what made the difference here for this horse to hold off the oncoming charge of Ben Franklin. Uh, ben Franklin, you know, broke okay today, but got squeezed after the start. How much did that cost him? Well, when you lose by a length, it's definitely it, it cost more than that. Winnemac Avenue, trained by Jimmy DeVito, standing by with Paul. Yeah, I am with the man, the myth, the legend, Jimmy DeVito here. We always go to DeLucas and hang out, and you were talking about we got an easy lead today, going huh, tonight. Jimmy? Going to DeLucas tonight. Well, are you buying? Winnipeg Avenue? Absolutely. <laughs> no problem. Talk, talk to us about Winnipeg Avenue. With, with all the scratches, were you thinking, let's go to the front end? Yes, yes. He likes to be free, and he likes to be on the outside. He gets hemmed in. If you watch his races, he gets in tight. He, he, he starts checking himself, and he doesn't do well. He got game there towards the end. I mean, you're fighting off some decent horses. And got an easy slow pace, though. The kid did a good job, 49 and change. That helps finish up better, right? It does. You know what's even better? 
when Italians do interviews together. Super. <laughs> We're going to DeLuca's tonight, DeLuca's Lafitte. Tonight. It's on Jimmy. Got it. <laughs> with, a, with a big win to celebrate Can a here. Jamaican join the Italian party? <laughs> or I, uh, am I invited? Can Serbian go to dinner with you guys as well and spend some of that uh, winner's share of $140,000 purse? And for the horse himself, who pretty much was telling the audience how easily he was traveling. And we'll take a look at what he was showing us along the backstretch. But first, go back to the start and what you saw with Ben Franklin. Well, now he's getting ready to enter the winner's circle. But, but back this, at the start, what happened with Ben Franklin? This was where Ben Franklin lost the race. He does his customary hop at the start, but here he gets squeezed and sandwiched between the number three and the number five, and by no fault of his jockey, Julian Le Peru. This is what happens when a horse has a tendency to break slow. Sometimes they break slow and they cause their own problems. Now, on the flip side of it, in the meantime, Winnemac Avenue is getting things his own way on the front end and able to walk the dog. I mean, look at look his at the ears. ears go up. He's in complete throttle, cantering with no pressure up front. And this is the favorite place for any horse to be. Out in the clear, relaxed, breathing right. And by the time Julian got Ben Franklin geared up, he had done too much to get to, to that point. He just couldn't um, catch up. Describe that feeling for a, a jockey midway through the race when you've made the lead, you're in control, and you can feel the horse underneath you doing everything you're asking him to do, essentially. Yeah, and the great Wayne Lucas, one of the trainer, one of the things that he always told me when I was riding for him, just put a smile on the bridle. <laughs> <laughs> and that will give you a smile on your face. And, it, you know, Ricardo Santana had a smile with Winnemac Avenue, just a comfortable hold where the horse was just having a pleasure running. And as the jockey, you feel like you're smiling because you're having everything go your way. Ricardo Santana uh, won a stakes race yesterday, the bathhouse row for three-year-olds, uh, earning a spot in the Preakness starting gate. Uh, won with Skelly in one of the most prestigious sprint races, the Count Fleet here, a couple of weeks back, and he strikes in the eighth. Eight down, one left at Oaklawn. Santana, Winnemac Avenue, they couldn't get by him. Stay tuned. Eclipse champion Blame, standing at Claiborne Farm. The Cross Country Pick 5 combines the best racing from New York with top races from around the country in one bet. Find it in your track menu and play every race day. Races are posted weekly at naira.com slash cross country. General admission tickets are on sale now for the Belmont Stakes Racing Festival at Saratoga, June 6th through 9th. Admission is just $10 on Thursday as well as on Sunday for this historic event. Visit BelmontStakes.com slash tickets today. Drain the clock will win and win by as much as he wants. He'll win by six in the end. It is Drain the Clock who will bound home the winner in the Bay Shore. Drain the Clock, Jackie's Warrior, a terrific finish in the Woody Stevens that goes to Drain the Clock by a head. Midlandic made two year olds in training. With a catalog of top juveniles by the nation's top sires, this sale has consistently produced graded stakes winners from around the world and on all surfaces, including Kentucky Derby winner Mage, plus 2024 graded stakes winners Kinza, Linda's Gift, Mendelssohn Bay, and Olivia Darling. The phasing Tipton Midlantic May two-year-olds in training sale, May 20th and 21st in Timonium, Maryland. Where will you be? watching America's Day at the Races on Fox Sports 1. A determined winner, Winnemac Avenue, Ricardo Santana entering the winner's circle. Four-year-old gelding by former Belmont Stakes winner Taprit. Fourth lifetime win. Second at Oakland, turning for home. And Santana 
has a lot of horse underneath him. Yeah, and, and Santana did a perfect ride, just rationing out that speed, got, got him a comfortable lead, clear, slow pace, and when a horse gets that advantage, they're just so hard to pass. And look, it's one thing, he's talented, he, he, he ran well today, but, but you have to be lucky as well. Everything unfolded beautifully with the defections. There were several other fast horses, other horses that would have applied pressure or been in front of Winnemac Avenue. They scratched, he took advantage and delivered. Yeah, and, and that's what makes horse racing so much fun and, and so much fun to handicap. It's, you know, the best horse on paper doesn't always win because of all the different dynamics and all the variables. And, and today we got to see that because I feel like Ben Franklin um, on a straight line is the best horse, the fastest horse in this race. But he hops at the start, he gets himself, you know, it put himself against the eight ball and, and that's where the race was won. He ran fine. He was, he was unlucky with the, with the defections and the scratches and the poor start for Ben Franklin. How many times did you hit the cross country pick five? I, I, I heard pretty you hit well it about 13,000. Either the Italians are paying for dinner or you're paying for dinner. Well, that that I know. Yeah, if you hit it, donate to the PDJF. But that, that's a great payout. I mean, it, it wasn't an impossible sequence. Some good prices in there. It wasn't any big something out of the ordinary. It's still $13,000 payout. This is so cool. The, the live look in, the telethon continues. It goes on for another hour and 20, 20 minutes. And tw so 20 minutes, that's it. So if you can, if you can, whatever you can spare, uh, donate. It's, it's the Permanently Disabled Jockeys Fund uh, in support of our fallen riders, uh, Raj, for our viewers just joining us. Can you uh, lend perspective to just the, the, the very significance of the PDJF and this particular event? Well, the PDJF is, it supports 60 r riders that were disabled, some of them life-altering injuries, not only just career-ending injuries, and there is no continuous guaranteed funding for the PDJF. The only, the, the only time they have the income is doing events like the Teleton and these events and you know some of these guys were hall of famers or legendary jockeys and obviously it's such a um risky business and a risky industry and people get hurt doing what they love to do and, and putting on a show for the fans so you see the number right there and again there's 20 minutes left in the uh, pdjf telethon and uh, we just have one race left here at oaklawn park with about well that same 20 minutes when we come back the potential stars of tomorrow the two-year-old in training sale obs ocala breeder sale the stars of tomorrow are acquired maybe next year's kentucky derby winner that's next
You're watching America's Day at the Races, brought to you by Naira Bets. You can bet any track, anytime, anywhere, even Times Square. I like how you rearranged that so it would rhyme correctly. Very well done. I, I was excited about it. <laughs> That's my poetic uh, attributes on display. Very good stuff. As always, you can check out NairaBets.com or download the app today. As Lafitte mentioned before the break, at the two-year-old sales, oftentimes you'll see some of the, the biggest buyers, trainers, owners being active, looking for the next future stars. With the OBS April two-year-old sale, it kind of has become, Sarah, the marquee two-year-old sale. It concluded on Friday and some big prices going through. All the horses would go through working an eighth of a mile or a quarter mile. And a horse that worked a quarter going 20 and one, which is absolutely blazing fast for a two-year-old, was a two-year-old filly by Tis the Law, freshman stallion, of course, winner of the Belmont Stakes and the Travers. And she sold for $1.9 million as the sales topper. She did, and I like the, what was said about this one in the Blood Horse article by her connections and her co-signer, that it wasn't about the speed and the time. It was about how professional she was and how effortless it seemed for her to be able to get that time and have that early speed. And watching that workout, it seems like she wasn't even really asked for much. That was an incredibly impressive workout. The dam, the sister to grade one winner, Abel Tasman, plenty of pedigree consigned by Tom McCartney. Crocklin and purchased by agent Donato Lani for Michael Lund Peterson and she was absolute class. I, I looked at her and knew she was not going to be in our budget, but <laughs> it was definitely a treat to get a chance to see her. And there was another Tesla Law that sold for 600000 several throughout the sale that sold really, really well. And for a freshman stallion, it's kind of Tesla Law and Vacoma. There was a Vacoma up there that sold for 800000 of the new stallions that everybody seems to be really excited about. Absolutely. And you look at her, she doesn't even look like a two-year-old. She's a big type Basically of horse. Mature. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, more of that masculine type that looks like she has places to go and certainly seemed that way when she did her work. Out. Very, very fast, Philly. We look forward to getting a chance to see when she hits the racetrack and what the future might hold for her and all of those horses that went through the OBS April two-year-old sale. Maybe get a chance to see a lot of them debuting in Saratoga. That's the hope. <laughs> Absolutely. We'll talk a little bit more about the leading rider at Oakland Park when we come back. Christian Torres on an absolute tear at Oakland Park. He is running away with the jockey's title, and he has a pretty special story of how he got there. Zandon's poetry in motion. Big horse, but light on his feet. And he's always showed up and been consistent and been right there with some of the top horses in training. In the Bluegrass Stakes, he showed his determination and his raw ability. It's over. Zandon wins the Toyota Bluegrass. I feel breeders will be really blown away by what a striking, outstanding looking horse he is. It's America's original sport. And no one covers it better than America's Best Racing.net. From the sport to the lifestyle, the best races, horses, and destination venues, cocktails, gambling, fashion, and more. America's Best Racing.net is a sport for you. Every sire hopes to have a son to follow in his footsteps. An impressive debut. For Munnings, that son is Jack Christopher. Jack Christopher to win the champagne. Unbeaten grade one winner at two. Dual grade one winner at three. And he is pouring it on here. It is Jack Christopher winning the grade one H. Allen Jerkins Memorial. Jack Christopher, standing at Coolmore America.
If you walk around the Oaklawn backstretch, you'll notice that the barns don't have numbers. The barns instead are named in honor of horses significant to Oaklawn's rich history. Here come two champions, side by side. Emily Price to the outside and Tatiana right there. And Zenyatta flies to the lead in the middle of the track. And a Spotty Jones, one step for the Kentucky, and one giant step to five million dollars. It's time to make some money. Barnes, named after 40 important horses, all who helped to contribute to Oakland's rich history in their own way. So many racing greats with compelling storylines and ties to Oaklawn. Whitmore win time, Whitmore! The superstars, the legends, the, the great horses, their names on the barns, Raja, reminding us of the, these legendary type thoroughbreds that have graced these grounds. It was really cool for me the first time coming to Oakland Park, going to the backstretch and seeing this. It was, it felt intimate. It made the racetrack feel intimate. It's the only racetrack that I've ever seen that does that. And it's, it's much nicer than the numbers that yeah. are usually on the barns, right? And um, I, th I think it's a concept that many other tracks should probably put into play. That's why jockeys do what they do, to, to wake up knowing they're going to ride horses that good, potentially that special, horses that can make a jockey's career. Case in point, star jockey Christian Torres here at Oaklawn Park is having another uh, sensational meet. He won the title a season ago, and even though there's a couple weeks left of racing here, he has already wrapped this one up. It's hard to believe that he left the Puerto Rico Jockey School just five years ago, Christian Torres, and in 13 days, he could, could ride in his very first Kentucky Derby. I was that kid that always liked horses. Then my grandfather, back in Puerto Rico, he started taking me to the racetrack, so I just fell in love with it, and I always said that I wanted to be a jockey. It became a dream. We all started in Gulfstream, and my first win, I remember the horse, I remember the race, I remember everything, and like, it was yesterday. After my bug year, the business went a little bit down. I felt that I needed I needed a change. That's why I decided to move up here. I went to Texas and, and I did pretty good. And then I went to Remington. That was the first year that I became a lady rider anywhere. So then I came here and I had a goal to win one greatest stakes in my, in, in my life. And last year I won seven. It's a great feeling to be a, a rider in, in two different tracks. And, and, and now this year, um, thank God I'm, I'm lady rider again here at Oakland and it's just, I'm living my dream. <laughs> Coming into this year after I went to Kentucky, my agent and I, we set up a goal to get a mount in the Kentucky Derby. We started pretty good the season. And back in Churchill, we won the street sense. Liberal arts rocketing past everybody else. Liberal arts. And then we came here and won the Smarty Jones and the Rebel. And Timberlake and Christian Torres win the Rebel by two. Went to Fred Ground the Gun Runner. Toward the inside, it's Track Phantom with Christian Torres. Track Phantom and the Gun Runner. When I started looking back, I already won Kentucky Derby points races with four different horses. Two, three days ago, he called me and he was like, hey, buddy, we got a horse for the Derby. I was like, who it is? I was like, come on the fence. And I was happy about it because I broke his maiden knee at her Oakland. Common defense, native liberty, one, two, and common defense soars to the lead. If I get in that field, I'm going to be in the big stage. 
the best race in America. You know, everybody want to be in the Kentucky Derby. Everybody want to be in that um, 20 horse field and just being there, you know, I just happy with myself, with everything that I've accomplished in these five years that I've been riding and just enjoying the trip. But he's not there yet. Right on the bubble, number 21, common defense, Christian Torres needs one more defection, Raj. Like, how many times a day do you think he's hitting refresh? Like oh. on KentuckyTurvy.com on the leaderboard. Yeah, he's <laughs> definitely spamming refresh. I mean, he's winning races every day at this track at Oakland. But in between races, when he's done right, I can bet that he's looking for that defection, checking his phone, and um, just hoping to get in. We want the best of, best of luck for all the horses to have their opportunity to race. Historically, we've learned that we do see defections in the days and weeks leading up to the Kentucky Derby. That's the colt he would ride, common defense. How good of a colt are we talking about? How does he factor in with some of the best three-year-olds in the nation, in your opinion? Well, his last two races were credible races. He was second in the Rebel at Oakland Park here. And then in his most recent race, he was fifth in the Louisiana Derby. Those races don't make him a major player. He would need to improve, step up off those um, races. But just being a part of the 20 horse field is, is half the battle, just getting into the gate. And we've seen crazier things happen. We've seen Rich Strike get into the race on the day of the race. Last 20 years, Giacomo 50 to one, Mind That Bird 50 to one, Rich Strike, as you mentioned, getting in the day before and winning at 80 to one. Yeah, so, you know, it is not impossible to win the race if he does get in. Um, however, he's not expected to be one of the major contenders based on his current so form. So you're saying there's a chance. Number 21, Paul, common defense, and just for Christian Torres, that, that opportunity. Yes, he's arrived. He's a star jockey here at Oakland, about to capture his second title, but what would be his first chance to ride in the run for the Roses. Yeah, and like Raj said, it'd be something special. I think we all got to remember that Rich Strike wasn't even on the Derby t uh, shirt. He wasn't even in the Derby gate yet until Ethereal Road actually scratched. But to get to Christian Torres, you know, he kind of reminds me a little bit of myself. And, you know, when I talk to him a little bit, you know, I was a late bloomer as a professional athlete. And, you know, I always thought to myself, I should have got to the big leagues at ages 20, 21, 22. I was ready, but was I mentally ready? No, and it took me to age 26, 27, full time in 2001 to become who I was as a player. And I think that Christian getting a late start in his career has learned so quickly. It's tough to do what he has done in such a five year period, but I think him being older and having the success at this age right now, maturity with his wife so close with his kids, got a background that has a support system too that is so giant. I hope he gets into the starting gate because he's put some, some tremendous rides on a lot of horses and some big races. He deserves to get in the gate. I wouldn't be happier for him too as well because he's a kid that is on the rise and he keeps on working harder and harder. Only riding five years. Love that shot of him hugging his daughter in the winner's circle. Christian Torres, his stakes wins this meet alone, doing all kinds of damage in Oakland's most significant races. Raj, what do you see when you watch him? What does he do really well? I think his biggest threat, strength for Christian Torres, his biggest strength is that he can get a horse to relax early. His horses get really, it's really connected with his horse. And as you saw when he won the Rebel with Timberlake, mm -hmm. a horse that is notoriously a headstrong horse, that horse went to sleep for Christian. And it has a lot to do with his upbringing. Before he was a professional jockey, he was in the school in Puerto Rico to be an exercise rider. So exercise riders are a little bit different than jockeys in the way that they're their duty, their job in the mornings is to get the horse to, to relax and canter around the racetrack. Whereas jockeys, they get on the horses and they're supposed to be go, go, go. So Christian has that good fusion of that exercise rider's background and now developing into one of the top jockeys. You know, Alabama, the University of Alabama, like a football factory and how many wind up in the NFL? A Puerto Rican jockey school, there, there, there's a parallel there and star jockeys Arad Ortiz Jose Ortiz the, the brothers 
uh, Manny Franco, who's won 100 races at, at Aqueduct this weekend, and uh, Christian Torres as well, emerging from Puerto Rico and, and going way back to one of the greatest who ever lived in Angel Cordero. Yeah, and Puerto Rico's jockey school has always been a watering hole for top jockeys in America since the Angel Cordero era, many, many years. Um, so it's, it's no surprise that it continues to produce this stream of top jockeys in our country. Top rider Christian Torres, the waiting game continues. We'll see if Common Defense gets in and has a chance to compete in the 150th Kentucky Derby. Uh, the ninth race at Oakland, uh, you can see it at Naira Betts. It'll take place in about two minutes as we say goodbye to our audience. Coming up next here on Fox Sports 1, Major League Soccer headed your way. Charlotte FC taking on Minnesota United. Moments ago, we watched Winnemac Avenue. Tenacious in the stretch, fending off all challengers, wire to wire. Ricardo Santana, the winning pilot. Winnemac Avenue in the feature at Oakland, one left. Thanks for joining us here on Fox Sports 1.